we've deliberately tried to get rid of. Unless it runs dry, we'll never know. Even if we invent lights powerful enough to be able to see, most stuff will be covered in silt. So, even if there are more bodies down there, the divers could swim straight over them and never know. Well, I like to think they won't be that easily fooled, but it always was a long shot, you know that. I do. Dana looked downriver towards Lacey's boat. A couple of times during the last half hour, she'd seen the glint of binoculars. It seemed safe to conclude that Lacey was as nervous as she was. Lacey, though, wouldn't be the one to carry the can when it all went wrong. What are you hoping to see down there? asked Turner, coming up beside Lacey on deck. She'd been leaning against the guardrail, staring down into the depths. River traffic had eased, and the crew had taken a short break. Lacey took the coffee Turner was holding out to her. You look like one of the legendary mariners of old, he told her, under the spell of a mermaid, being lured to a watery grave by the siren sound of her song. He caught her mood and went along with it. I think women were largely immune to the magic of the mermaid. Let's hope so. Lacey straightened up and followed Turner back to the cockpit, just as Buckle was wiping ketchup from his mouth. Another coffee, Sarge? offered Turner. Ah, go on. You two realise you're going to take a whole load of grief if that lot don't find anything today, don't you? The linen matched, said Lacey. The sample we had in storage from a corpse retrieval two months ago was the same as the fabric wrapping the body we pulled out a week ago. That's way beyond coincidence. Neither man looked convinced. The woman we found at South Dock Marina was likely to have been an illegal immigrant, she tried again. The other two exchanged a sceptical look. I don't flatter myself they're doing this to keep me happy. She nodded towards the three boats at the centre of the operation. How much does an operation like this cost? I dread to think, said Buckle. So Mr Cook and D.I. Tullock would never have authorised it if they didn't think we'd find something. It's a massive river, Lacey. We're searching a fraction of it. There could be a dozen down there and we might never find them. What are the chances, realistically? Lacey closed her eyes feeling her face tighten. The chances were low to non-existent. Everyone knew that. She wouldn't officially be held responsible if the search turned up nothing, but it would be pretty clear what everyone thought of her. Chapter 46 Nadia The Cutty Sark, one of the last great British sailing ships, always made Nadia think of a tethered goddess or a magnificent bird with its wings clipped. She liked to close her eyes when she was in its vicinity and imagine it in full sail, cutting through a rising storm, the scantily clad witch at its prow laughing in defiance of the weather. Instead, it was held captive in a dry dock, sails in storage for tourists to crawl over. It was also very close to the river. From the tip of Greenwich Reach, the old ship could see all the way to the city in the west, to the skyscrapers of Canary Wharf directly ahead, and to the Millennium Dome in the east. In the sun, the Thames was gleaming blue. It was nothing more than a mirage, Nadia knew, a sleight of hand, the reflection of the sky. The sun had only to sink behind a cloud, and the water would revert to its normal state of moving, greedy, liquid mud. Fazil was sitting on the edge of one of the concrete flower beds. Nadia pulled her scarf up around her head, hiding the sides of her face. She kept her eyes down until she drew close. Uncle. It was a courtesy title. Fazil was a distant relative, hardly family at all, but older than she. He wasted no time, pushing a folded sheet of paper into her hand. The police are looking for you. What have you done? Nadia opened it to see her own picture. She had to stop herself looking round, as though even here, already, there would be people pointing. We printed it off the police website, Fazil was saying. Your picture is everywhere. I can't protect you from the police. Why are they looking for you? The police would arrest her, send her home, or back to the house on the river. I don't know. I swear. I've done nothing wrong. He leaned closer. He smelled of mint and tobacco. You think they care? Just being here is wrong to them. He was holding out a plastic carrier bag. 
Jamil sent you this, he said. It's not easy for us to help you. Nadia took the bag. I'm very grateful. Did you bring the money? Nadia handed over banknotes. Fazil counted them twice. Not as much this week. I broke a plate. I had to replace it. He nudged the carrier bag, causing the plastic to rustle against his hand. Straight away, he said, pointing to a door some twenty yards away. Or I won't be responsible. I'll be here next week. Nadia said goodbye and walked over to the lady's lavatory. Five minutes later, a burka-clad woman, her face entirely covered, emerged. She passed briefly through the evening crowds and disappeared. Chapter 47 Lacey In her bedroom cabin, Lacey changed into shorts and a t-shirt, then pulled her hair free from its pins. She found sneakers and climbed back up top. Ray was in the yard, chatting to one of the other boat owners. She could hear Eileen clattering about below. Good, she really didn't want to talk. It's not over, Tullock had told her, as the search had finally been called off, and she and the MIT had said their goodbyes. The pregnancy gives us a whole new lead. If she was treated in this country, she's traceable. The water was high, lapping against the hull of Lacey's boat, gleaming an uncharacteristic blue beneath the evening sky. The family of swans sailed elegantly around the theatre arm. The younger ones had just a trace left of the grey plumage of cygnets. Lacey reached into the sealed box where she kept dried bread and biscuits and threw a handful overboard. The woman's pregnancy wouldn't help. The chances of an illegal immigrant seeking medical attention early in her pregnancy were slim to non-existent. And, failed search aside, vulnerable young women were still being smuggled up the Thames, probably before being sold into modern-day slavery. Lacey had met such women in the past, girls who were a very long way from home, who quickly became dependent upon alcohol or drugs, living from one fix to the next, willing to do anything to stave off the beatings, to bring on oblivion. She joined the police force to help such women, and yet, on the brink of a transfer into one of the specialist units set up to deal with victims of rape and abuse, she'd left CID, going back into uniform, knowing that all her colleagues, however sympathetic they might be, thought she'd wimped out. Shit, she had wimped out. She got up, climbed down the steps at the back of her boat, and clambered into the canoe. The swans were still hanging around, and as she pushed away they followed her, like some sort of queenly escort down the water. At the end of the theatre arm, her little flotilla turned left into the creek. Lacey paddled past Skillions, lifting her hand to Madge and Marlene on deck. Madge raised her phone and appeared to be taking a photograph of Lacey and the swans. She'd wimped out. Trouble was, turning up back on the difficult stuff hadn't helped at all. It had just come looking for her again. Women were being brought up the Thames and kept somewhere along its banks somewhere derelict, where no one would think to look. Somewhere without power, water, or comfort of any kind. They'd be locked up, 24 hours a day, hot, starving and terrified. And this misery was probably within a mile of where she was right now. The flow of water was pushing her close to the abandoned dredger on the right bank. She raised the paddle and reached out to fend it off. Touching the cold, slimy hull, she heard something move inside. The water whisked her past before she had time to think. She dug the paddle in and turned on the spot. The old ship had been abandoned years ago, presumably because the cost of moving it outweighed the inconvenience of having it moored alongside the gravel works. No one should be inside it. Somewhere derelict, where no one would think to look. Somewhere without power, water or comfort of any kind. She made for the bank and caught hold of a mooring ring to steady herself in the tidal flow. Tucked away between the dredger's hull and the wall was a small boat, not much bigger than her canoe, but with an engine. Lacey moved closer. The boat seemed to have been used recently. No rainwater in the bottom, no rust on the metal fittings. The engine looked clean, there were even traces of oil. She looked up and saw a boarding ladder that had been hung over the side of the dredger, to allow access to the deck. Someone was on board. For several seconds, 
Lacey sat thinking. Did she call it in and risk being labelled an attention-seeking drama queen, or check it out herself first? Either way was risky. Finding her phone, she tapped out a message to Ray. Checking the old dredger at Enfield Gravel Yard. Call out the cavalry if I don't check in again in 15. She sent it and waited. Not for long. 15 and counting. Be bloody careful. Ray had her back. She tied her canoe alongside the motorboat and climbed up to the empty deck. Around 150 feet long, she assessed quickly, and 30 feet wide. She was at the stern. What was left of the crane was forward of the centre deck. The wheelhouse was at the far end, just behind the bow. Below her feet would be the hold, a vast storage space. If a large number of people were being held together, the hold would be the most convenient, if most uncomfortable, place to keep them. To access it, she'd have to find a way below. She crept forward slowly, her sneakered feet making no sound on the steel deck, an odd feeling of unreality creeping over her. All around her, the evening was so normal. Deepening blue sky, traces of gold light, birds, voices, traffic, and yet below her feet, an unknown environment. Even up top, there were too many hiding places. Several storage crates, behind the crane, inside the wheelhouse. The boat rocked against the enormous tyres that rimmed its hull, and something moved below. Twelve minutes before the cavalry set off. No one hiding behind the crates, nor behind the crane. But discovering nothing unsettled her more. If she had to face someone, better to do so up here, where she had room to move, where escape was relatively simple. Once she went below, it would be another matter entirely. The wheelhouse, too, was empty. The iron steps that led below were to the port side of the cabin. This was where it got tricky. She hadn't even brought a torch. All she had was the minuscule light on her mobile phone. Attention-seeking drama queen or reckless maverick idiot? No-win situation. Lacey crept down the steps. The door at the bottom opened silently, and through it she could see the cabin that served as galley and relaxation room for the crew. Plastic padded seats around a formica table, a blackened range cooker, pans still hanging from hooks on the walls, coke and beer cans on the floor. The cabin smelled of creek mud, of rotting vegetation, of bilges. Most of the interior of the ship, including the hold, lay behind her, towards the stern, but ahead of her, beneath the bow, was a door, and she had no choice but to check that first. Nervously, not liking to move away from her exit, Lacey stepped past rotting charts and logbooks piled high on a table, past a mould-stained pin-up of a topless model with 1980s hair, past a pack of playing cards scattered over the floor. The door was oval-shaped, small and narrow. Lacey pushed at the handle, and it opened noisily. She jumped, spinning on the spot, waiting for an answering sound, a cry for help, investigating footsteps. Her heart beat out the seconds as she waited. Ten minutes before Ray set off. The stench coming from behind the open door, the unmistakable mixture of harsh chemicals and organic material, told her she'd found the heads. She shone the thin light around to make sure. Two cubicles. No one hiding. Letting the door close softly, she moved back through the galley, past the steps and into the narrow, dark corridor that took her, inevitably, towards the hold. The ceiling was lower here. There was a ventilation shaft only inches above her head. Cabins on either side, four in total. She walked forward, glancing to the right, to the left, seeing nothing. Eight minutes before Ray set off. A lot could happen in eight minutes. In the last cabin, something gleamed in the thin torch beam. Torn, clear plastic. The wrapper from a pack of litre-sized bottles of water. Skin prickling with anticipation, she stepped into the cabin. Something about the air in here, whilst not fresh exactly, was different from that of the rest of the ship. 
A sleeping bag lay on the narrow berth. And there was a gym bag in the corner of the room, a huge torch by the bed. And something she recognised on the folded sweatshirt that was serving as a pillow. A pale blue scrunchie. Hers. One of several she used to tie her hair back into a ponytail. Definitely hers. She remembered the way the seam had started to fray. Whoever was camping out here had been on her boat, had helped himself to a very personal souvenir. Two thoughts, fighting for attention. The first, get out now. The second, too late. She spun round to see the dark silhouette of a man in the cabin doorway. A very large man. I'm a police officer. The most aggressive, confident, assertive thing she could think of. No shit, replied Josebury. Chapter 48. Dana. The room into which Dana and Anderson had been shown wasn't quite a laboratory, nor yet an artist's studio, but somewhere in between the two. Several computer monitors were on sleep mode, and each displayed wallpaper that depicted the human head, slowly revolving. Images on the walls were likewise of the human head, some modern, some ancient. There were skulls in display cabinets, skulls on the worktop that ran two lengths of the room. There had even been a human skull on the coffee table in the reception area. Apart from Dana and Anderson, there were three other people in the room. The woman who'd met them at reception, who was also the director of the facility, and two men working at desktop computers. Before we go any further, I'd like to give you some idea of the limitations of the technique, the director began. All too often people are disappointed because I can't say this is it, this is what she looked like. I understand, said Dana, although she wasn't sure she did. She'd committed a significant part of the budget to the facial reconstruction of the body Lacey had found in the river. If it took them no further forward, the other woman looked as though she rather doubted it too. What does work invariably well is when we have a suspected identity. If we have a photograph of someone who could have been the victim... The process of matching it to skeletal remains is relatively straightforward and conclusive, but that's not the case here. It's not, said Anderson. We have absolutely no idea who she was. OK, so what we did with your subject, continued the director, was first of all to carry out a full examination of the skeleton. We needed to be sure in our own minds that the details we'd been given, in terms of sex, age and race, were reasonably accurate. And were you? asked Anderson. As far as age and sex are concerned, yes. Definitely a young female. Race is always a bit tricky, but taking the bone structure and the remaining hair into account, somewhere in the Middle East or South Asia seems the most likely. She reached down and lifted a thermally controlled box from under the worktop. This is your skull. We'll be returning it to you now. There isn't any more it can tell us. Anderson took it and put it down softly by his side. The first thing we do when attempting a reconstruction is to reattach the mandible to the skull, the director went on. Then we clean it and repair any visible damage with wax. We photograph each stage. Here you are. She tapped some buttons on a keyboard. A second later, Dana was looking at the skull on the computer screen, cleaner and neater than she'd seen it previously. At this point, we make a cast that subsequently forms the basis of the reconstruction. The director flicked to a new screen that showed a clay-like substance being smoothed over the skull. We build it up using data based on average tissue thickness for any given age, gender and racial group. In this case, we were particularly lucky that there was already some soft tissue remaining. This gave us much more to work with than we would otherwise have had. This next photograph shows you the pegs in place. The image on the screen was now displaying several dozen small, thin tubes, a little like matchsticks, jutting out from the skull at intervals, several where the lips would be, another at the nub of the chin, one on the tip of the nose, a line along the cheekbone. So then you fill it in, asked Dana. You just smooth clay along the skull until the pegs can't be seen anymore. Good God, no! The director looked shocked. If we did that, the final bill would be a lot less, I promise you. We build the face up muscle by muscle. The thickness and length we make them depends upon the average data we have, 
the actual tissue sample we took, and the small clues on the bones that tell us where muscle tissue was attached. That way, the face builds up slowly, but hopefully accurately. We insert eyes, attach ears, and work on any indication scars or abnormalities. The last thing we do is choose skin colour and attach hair. Are you ready to meet the lady you've been trying to help? We are indeed, said Dana, conscious of a nervous tickle in her stomach. The director took a large blue box from the worktop and carried it to the podium in the centre of the room. She placed it on top and unfastened the lid. The box's sides came away separately and fell down to reveal the modelled head within. The sculpture was of the head and shoulders of a young woman with an emerald green scarf around her black hair. Wow, thought Dana. She was gorgeous, said Anderson. Yes, I think she probably was, said the director. The sculpture's face was oval, widening at the jawline and with a rounded, pronounced chin. Her nose was longer and wider at the tip than would normally be compatible with perfect beauty, but it was balanced by full lips and strong eyebrows. Her eyes were dark, coal-rimmed with thick lashes. Now, you understand that a lot of subjective decisions led us here, said the director. Based on the hair, she could have been Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankan, or coming further west from Turkey, Morocco, even Greece. But something was whispering Persian to me. Modern-day Iran, said Dana. Yes, or possibly Iraq, or one of the stans. For one thing, the lower part of the face is quite pronounced, wider than you might see in India or Pakistan. And whilst the nose is notoriously difficult to reconstruct, there were indications that on this lady, it was longer and wider towards the bottom than is average. Beautiful eyes, said Dana. Not large compared to some of her other features, but lovely all the same. Yes, almond-shaped. You see it a lot in people from the East. And the eyes we can be reasonably confident about, because their shape is largely determined by the shape and slope of the socket. I've given her brown eyes, of course, because that's far and away the most common colour in that part of the world. I feel as though we should give her a name, said Dana. Yes, she rather had that effect on us, too, said the director. We've been calling her Sahar. It's the Persian name for Dawn, because that's when you found her. Chapter 49. Lacey. Lacey stared at the man she loved, would always love, whatever he'd done. There was just enough light coming down the stairs for her to see him. He hadn't shaved in days. His clothes looked as though they'd seen several days of wear. I should arrest you, she told him. Josebury's eyebrow went up. Try it, he countered. Might be fun. Something about the half-twist of his lips hit her harder than anything. After everything he'd done, he could laugh at her. I don't know who you are anymore. You're putting us both at risk by being here, he said. I need you to leave now and not come back. Promise me. So cold. Had she fallen in love with a man who didn't exist? I think you lost the right to extract promises from me when you killed a man. She could never look him in the eyes for long. Even here, when there was barely enough light to see him properly. Even here, where they were little more than a glint in the darkness. When Josby made a noise in the back of his throat, somewhere between a sigh and cough, and stepped towards her, she backed away, almost falling onto the bunk. When I was on the brink of the worst thing that could happen to anyone, he said, you asked me to trust you. Do you remember that? Three months ago, a winter night, a bridge over the river. The man she adored on the point of despair, and he was asking if she remembered. I couldn't think straight. I didn't know how I was going to make it through the next hour, and you asked me to trust you. Josebury, collapsing in front of her, sobbing. Was that the sort of thing she could forget, ever? You gave me no reason, no hope, just demanded unconditional trust. Ringing any bells for you? She snapped at him. Of course I remember. Good. Then you'll also remember that I did. He had, too. 
do you trust me or not, she'd said to him, because if you do, you have to let me go. He'd let her go. I still trust you, so I'm going to tell you what nobody else can know, not even Dana. That pounding noise might be her heart beating. Police Constable Nathan Townsend is as alive as you and me, probably with a much better chance than either of us of staying that way, given the way you're carrying on. She'd heard the words, but the processing of them took a little longer. What? Alive and well. Or rather, alive with a very sore shoulder and seriously pissed off with me. You shot him? Yes, that I do admit. If I hadn't shot him, someone else would have done, and they'd probably have been aiming to do a lot more damage. I shot the daft git to keep him alive, although I doubt he'll see it that way. He's alive? Something in Jonesbury's face softened. Alive and under guard at a convalescent home somewhere in Northumbria. Whilst the people I'm investigating think I'm a cop killer, they're more inclined to believe I'm on their side, and for the time being it's very important they think that. It couldn't be true. She could not let herself hope. I don't believe you. Has there been a funeral? Have you seen his weeping mother on the television? Has there even been anything on the frigging news? You haven't killed anyone. Shit, that was hope, wasn't it? You just couldn't keep it down for long. Josebury sighed. I haven't killed anyone. I'm an undercover police officer on an excruciatingly difficult job and starting to feel a bit sore that the women in my life can give up on me so easily. She sank down, the fabric of his sleeping bag smooth and slippery beneath her bare thighs. At her surrender, something in Josebury's stance seemed to relax. There was a softening, a warming about him. I've imagined you many times in my bedroom, never quite like this. The cabin wasn't much more than six feet long, could he even stretch out his legs? You're actually living here. When he sat down beside her, she took his hand, holding it tight between both of hers. The people I'm dealing with need to believe I'm on the run, he said. On the other hand, I can't leave London and lose the chance of finding out what they're up to. I need to lie low. I thought about this place the other night when I was with you. She could smell sweat on him, unwashed clothes, she thought about the cavernous space all around them, the darkness, the smell. All this time you've been just across the creek. Those turquoise eyes were warm now. Even in the dark of the cabin, she knew it. I creep on deck when it gets dark, he said. Look for the lights on your boat. Something was going to happen. Something she'd dreamed about so many times. Was she ready for it? I should go... That was nerves talking. Leaving was the last thing she wanted to do. You should. He ran a finger up the bare skin of her arm. I'm putting you in danger. From the moment I first laid eyes on you. The finger had reached her neck. His hand cupped the back of her head. Anyone could see my canoe outside. His face was very close now. Disaster, he said. She closed her eyes so many times alone in the dark she'd imagined Josebury's lips on hers. It had never been like this. Who would have thought he'd be so gentle, that his lips would stroke her so softly, brushing against first one and then the other? She'd imagined his hands pushing her roughly against a wall, his body heavy, crushing hers. Never that his fingers would twist round in her hair, pulling her closer or that the tips of his fingernails would feel so smooth running up her back. Lacey! Someone was banging on the hull. Lacey, you in there? Josebury was on his feet, out of the cabin. Needing a second longer to get her head together, Lacey followed him. It's Ray, she whispered. I told him where I was going. Josebury's shoulders dropped as the tension left his body. He adjusted the waistband of his jeans and sighed. Then he shook his head. Better go call off the dogs, he told her. She pushed past him, ran up the stairs and across the deck. Ray was steering his way around the stern of the dredger. Another couple of seconds and he'd see Josebury's boat. I'm fine, she called down. False alarm, sorry. Saying nothing, Ray gave her a wave and turned his boat around. Josebury was on the steps, just out of sight. 
she ducked down to join him. There's something I need to ask you. That night you stayed over. You left a heart on the table. That was you, wasn't it? Josebury's eyes narrowed. I couldn't find a pen. Why, who else? Shh. Did you come back the next day and leave another one? Bewildered was quite a good look for him. He looked younger, rather cute, when he was baffled. I haven't been back since. It's too risky for both of us. What's going on? She stepped down until their faces were level and kissed him, lingering against the skin of his face for just a second longer than felt wise. I have to go. Can I at least phone you? He was holding her again. Phone calls leave a trace. Too risky. She sighed, could almost see her breath wrapping itself around his neck. Any chance this will be over soon? God, I hope so. If she kissed him again, she'd never stop. Lacey turned, ran up the steps and across the deck. As she climbed over the side and back down to her canoe, she looked back. The deck of the old ship was empty. Chapter 50 Lacey As the sun disappeared behind the old mill building and the golden light started to fade, Lacey was sitting on the deck of Madge and Marlene's naval ship at Skillions, thinking about toy boats, shapes made out of pebbles and glass, and whether she'd boxed herself into an untenable corner by not mentioning them sooner. And yet there was no way of telling Tullock about them now without explaining why she'd kept quiet for so long. I'm going to tell you what no one else can know, not even Dana. Three toy boats now. One yellow, one blue, one red. What the hell was all that about? She took another sip of the gin mojito she'd been offered on arrival, which was definitely a lot stronger than she'd been promised. Ahead, she could see the theatre arm, her own boat rocking against its moorings. If she turned her head to the right, which she was trying not to do every couple of seconds, she could see the dredger. And you know what? She was not going to worry about toy boats. She was not going to sweat the small stuff. Not tonight. What are you doing tomorrow, Lacey? Would you like to come and have lunch with Alex and me? Lacey turned to smile at the old lady by her side. Just minutes after she'd got back from the dredger, Thessa had pitched up in her small, pretty motorboat, hammering on the side of Lacey's yacht, insisting they'd both been invited to a party, by the skanky old lesbians, and there was no way she was going alone. When she'd run out of arguments, Lacey had locked up her boat and climbed down. The two of them had motored across, and then Thessa had been hauled aboard by means of a harness and pulley, with every appearance of having done it many times before. Madge and Marlene had even produced a wheelchair for her. The party was small, but noisy. Around two dozen people, all of whom seemed to work in the theatre, and many of whom looked as though they'd come straight from a performance. Also, to Lacey's surprise, Eileen, Ray's wife. There was no sign of Ray. A little further along the deck, a wind-up gramophone was playing Buddy Holly tracks, and a small, thin person of indeterminate sex was swaying to the music. And Thessa had just invited her to lunch. That's really kind, she said, but tomorrow I have to be on a train to Durham. Long trip? I expect that takes most of the day. Or do you stay over? No, I always come back the same day. Four hours there, four hours back. One hour in the visitor's suite. She waited for the question that didn't come. Thessa wasn't entirely lacking in tact. I visit a woman in Durham Prison, the high security wing, Lacey said. She was given a life sentence for murder in January. Someone very close to you? Lacey nodded. Thessa swirled her drink, letting the ice chink against the sides, waiting until it stopped moving. It isn't your fault, you know, what she did. Being with Thessa was like playing paintball with the SAS. You never knew when the next strike was coming, only that it was inevitable and that it would be bang on target. Lacey opened her mouth to say, of course it isn't. I fully understand that. Everyone takes responsibility for their own actions. Well, actually it is she said instead. But I don't go out of guilt or as any sort of self-indulgent penance. I go because seeing her makes me happy. Is she family? Lacey had to remind herself to breathe. Why would you think that? I can see love in your eyes. And tears. 
Ah, now she was on slightly safer ground. I never cry. She half smiled, half glared at Thessa, who did exactly the same thing back. They may not fall, but they're there all the same. Drink up, ladies. Madge had stolen up behind them. You have six hours before the tide goes out and you're trapped here. In spite of the heat, Madge was dressed like a gangster from the Prohibition era, with a wide striped suit, red shirt and black tie. A trilby was perched on her short hair. Please don't give Thessa any more alcohol, said Lacey. She's driving me home, not to mention herself. We're skinny dipping later. Madge was giving Lacey the sort of look she normally only saw on the faces of drunken men in pubs she raided. See if we can catch the mermaid. Thessa snorted. If that's a sexual euphemism, you're wasting your time. Lacey's in love with a man. Madge squeezed herself down on the bench next to Lacey. I can't believe you've lived on the river since the old queen died and you don't know about the mermaid. Her voice was slurred, her eyes not quite focused. I don't know about the mermaid, said Lacey, but didn't the old queen die quite recently? She doesn't mean the queen mother, says Thessa. She means that hairy old drag artist from the Duke on Creek Road. He's practically a local legend. Marlene had crept up without them noticing, as had Eileen. The beautiful dock worker's daughter who fell in love with a pirate. When he was hanged at Neckinger Creek, she threw herself into the water in despair. But such was the power of her love that she lived and grew a tail. And as she's doomed to swim the waters of the creek and the Thames for all eternity, looking for a lost love. Lacey's eyes couldn't help straying to the dredger just yards away from them. She's been seen lots of times, said Marlene. Yes, but it's always a bloke who knew a bloke who'd seen her one night, usually after a few in the bird's nest, said Eileen, as Marlene strode away towards the main cabin, tottering on heels that seemed far too high for the deck of a boat. Don't give me that. Even Ray's seen her. He told me so himself. Madge leaned even closer to Lacey. He was out fishing one night, about twenty years ago. He saw a mermaid sitting on one of those old timber piles near the railway bridge. Eileen laughed cynically. Gazing into a mother pearl mirror and combing her hair. When his boat got closer, she dived into the water and disappeared, added Madge. He was drunk. Ray would never go out on the water drunk, said Lacey. He was drunk when he told the story, insisted Eileen. He saw a seal. Lacey realised that Thessa had fallen quiet. So have you seen her? she asked. Thessa shrugged. I've seen odd things, usually in the creek, sometimes in the main river, very early in the morning or late at night. Just occasionally I see what looks like a face staring at me. For some reason, the story seemed more credible when Thessa, ridiculous old ham that she was, was telling it. The dancing twinkle had completely gone from her eyes. Seals, said Eileen, or an old football bobbing up and down. Thessa smiled. Marlene had come back, carrying a large photograph album. She handed it to Lacey, already open at a page containing press cuttings going back years. Dolphins in the Thames, seals in the Thames, porpoises, even a small whale in the river. At some time over the past few decades, most species that passed close to the Thames estuary had lost their way and found themselves in the heart of the city. Most, sadly, didn't find their way out again. Go down a bit further, Marlene told her. There you are. She was pointing Lacey towards an article from the Illustrated Police News dated 1878. The Mermaid at Westminster Aquarium, said the caption. The story covered the new attraction at the Royal Westminster Aquarium, a manatee. The manatee, Lacey read, was a sea-dwelling animal from the South American continent, believed to have given rise to the legend of the mermaid the beautiful half-human, half-fish creature that lured sailors to their deaths in perilous seas. They're also known as sea cows, said Marlene. They have very long flippers at the front, which could look like arms at a distance, and they have the wide, strong tail that mermaids are supposed to have. Mind you, how anyone could look at one and fall in love is beyond me, even after several months at sea and a bottle or two of the strong stuff. She had a point. The manatee was a large, cumbersome creature 
without even the cute humanoid face of the seal. They're native to South America, said Lacey, and Florida. They couldn't live in the Thames, could they? You wouldn't think so, said Marlene, but Ray used to tell some odd stories. It's no good looking like that, Eileen, you know he did. Odd tracks, massive birds disappearing in split seconds. You get talk of crocodiles every few years. People release their exotic pets into the river all the time. Maybe they don't all die. It's too cold, Eileen scoffed. Maybe they get lucky, said Thessa. Find a drain near warm pipes. Hole up until the cold weather passes. I'd rather believe in the mermaid, said Lacey. It's a nice story. Yeah, woman falls for a bloke. He turns out to be a wrong un. She drowns herself and spends the rest of eternity as a fish, said Madge. Just like a fairy tale. Who needs a top up? Why do you love the river so much, Lacey? asked Thessa, when Madge and the others had wandered away. Every time your thoughts drift, you stare at it. Lacey hadn't been looking at the water at all, but at the hull of the abandoned dredger, wondering if he could hear the music, whether he was watching them right now. Thessa was right about one thing, though. She did love the river. I always loved swimming. I swam in the sea when I was a child. We didn't live too far from the coast. Yes, Shropshire's well known for its beaches. The realisation of her mistake was like a physical shock. Lacey had completely forgotten that she'd already told Thessa she was from Shropshire. It was the first time ever that she'd made such an error. I expect you mean you stayed with relatives who live near the beach, said Thessa. Go on, dear. She had been let off the hook. No choice, really, but to go along with it. Well, I swam competitively at school. It was about the only thing I was really good at. And then about a year ago, I nearly drowned in the Thames. The others had returned, gathering round to listen. Everyone loved a police story. We were pursuing a suspect, Lacey said. This was the early hours in the morning. I chased him onto Vauxhall Bridge, and my colleagues came the other way. We thought we had him trapped, and he grabbed me and pulled us both over the side. It was a surprisingly long way down. Gasps of shock, faces intent with interest. I had surveillance equipment sewn into my clothes, a tracking device, so the marine unit pulled me out, said Lacey. He wasn't so lucky. His body was found several days later. I know it sounds daft, but I like to think the river took care of me. That means you can't ever drown, said Marlene. That's the legend among watermen. If you cheat death in the water... The river loses its power to harm you. Claptrap, said Thessa. Of course you can drown. Don't you dare take silly risks. The story over, some of the others drifted away again. Eileen and Madge stepped towards the rail and looked down into the water. I've been trying to decide what month you were born, Lacey, said Thessa. May is a possibility, like Alex and me, which would make your birth flower the lily of the valley. Lacey smiled. Hmm, I don't think it's as late as August somehow, said Thessa. So I'm going with June or July. July, I think. Larkspur. I was born in December, said Lacey. Thessa screwed up her face. A carnation? I don't think so, dear. I'm sure Lacey knows her own birthday, you daft old trout, Madge called back over her shoulder. Anyone for a skinny dip? Eileen doesn't approve of swimming in the creek said Lacey, smiling at her neighbour. She's pretty much clipped Ray's fins. Only because the silly old sod's too old to cope with the Thames, said Madge. Besides, who do you think got Ray into wild swimming in the first place? Swims like a fish, our Eileen. Saturday, 28th of June. Chapter 51. Lacey. Okay, let me get my head round all this crap, said Toc. You pull the body of a woman out of the Thames and decide she's an illegal immigrant. With reason, said Lacey. Yeah, yeah. You find records of another body pulled out two months ago that may or may not have been an illegal immigrant, no way of knowing. So you decide there's a whole load more of them at the bottom of the Thames and persuade your bosses to mount a multi-operational, massively expensive search that turns up zilch. Lacey, at best they're questioning your judgment. At worst, they're writing you off as a bit of a loon. Way to make me feel better. I'm not trying to make you feel better. 
For police officer living under a fake identity, you're not exactly keeping a low profile. Lacey looked round in alarm. Why don't you just send a memo? I thought the whole point of going back into uniform was to stay clear of the high-profile stuff. Keep your head down. Concentrate on being a good, solid copper. It was. I just can't... Tock was making her, I give up, I just give up face. I know, you never could. OK, let's see what we can work with. Give me that pad. Lacey had brought a notebook and pencil into the room with her. She pushed them across the table. Tock wrote the number one in a bold, heavy hand. First problem, she said. Mass ethnic graveyard at the bottom of the Thames. Glad you're finding this funny. Even if you're right, there's nothing you can do. The search has happened, it found nothing. So unless you're planning to stick on a wetsuit and snorkel and go down yourself, that avenue is closed. Agreed? Lacey had a brief flashback to the seconds she'd spent under the water, looking at a floating corpse. Agreed. Next, you have a gang smuggling young women up the Thames and keeping them somewhere near Deptford Creek, but not on the old dredger, because that has treasure of a different sort entirely in the hold. Far better not to react when Tock was in this mood. Just let her get it out of her system. So is Tullock the terrible looking for this holding place? She's got people on it, said Lacey. But it's a big area, and she doesn't have a lot of manpower. It's going to take time. You might want to tell them you've already checked the old dredger. Christ, I didn't think of that. Lucky you've got me on the case, then. But this is something else you have to leave to Tullock and the team. If they're short on manpower, you're on your own, working when you're off duty. You can't search the South Bank by yourself. You're making me feel like a spare part. Are you going to tell Tullock you've seen Josebury? I can't. I promised I wouldn't tell anyone. I've already broken my promise by telling you. Tock beamed. So, instead of confiding in a trusted senior officer in the Met, you blab to the most notorious serial killer of the 21st century. Love it. Anything else on this list of yours? Tock drew a large, thick number three. Nadia Safi, someone who could shed a whole load of light on the mystery, but who's still missing. Is Tullock looking for her, too? The whole of the Met is looking for her, but she clearly doesn't want to be found. I got a picture somewhere. Lacey reached into her bag and found the photograph of Nadia Safi, taken shortly after her arrest the previous year. Tock peered over. Oh, look at her, said Tock. She's a Pashtun. Chapter 52 Dana Dana's eyes were glued to a computer monitor, not two feet from her head, trying to make sense of the mass of grey matter on the screen. She lay on her back, her knees raised, a pink blanket over her bare legs, horribly uncomfortable. There we are, said the nurse, who'd been guiding the probe inside Dana. We're starting to see the eggs now. I'm not, thought Dana. The nurse pointed to the screen. The round black shapes, she said. I suppose they look like holes more than anything else, if you're not used to seeing them. Oh, that's a good one. I'll just take a measurement. Dana watched, mystified, as the nurse marked the largest of the black holes with two tiny crosses. Yes, that's probably the one, although you can never be sure. I could scan you again tomorrow and the picture could be quite different. The main thing is, everything's as it should be and you should ovulate sometime in the next day or so. Now, you're using clear plan, is that right? On the basis of several packets in her bathroom cabinet, Dana agreed that she was. When you get your FSH, Serge, you need to phone us, the nurse continued. We'll book you in for the following day. It's important you keep that appointment. I know it's difficult for you professional ladies, but the eggs don't wait, and once we've taken the sperm out of storage, we can't put it back. You'll still get charged for it. I understand. You get yourself dressed, then we'll have a chat about it. When Dana emerged from behind the screen, the nurse had a file open on the desk in front of her. Right, the lab have confirmed the donor you chose, you'd be pleased to know. Let's see. Economics graduate, works in finance, quite sporty, keen on rugby, athletics. Always a good sign, I think, when they're active. Is he kind to animals? asked Dana. The nurse blinked. Sorry? 
does have a good sense of humour. The nurse smiled carefully. The donors choose how much information they give us. We know a little about what he looks like. He's just above average height, slim build, dark hair, brown eyes. Is he married? Does he have a family already? Why is he donating his sperm? If he works in finance, it can hardly be about money. This man and I are going to have a child together. How can I not know these things? You know, since anonymity has been taken away from donors, the numbers have dropped considerably, said the nurse. Some months we don't have enough to treat all our ladies. The subtext being, I'm lucky and should behave in a suitably grateful manner, thought Dana. Where's Helen when I need her? Chapter 53 Lacey She's a what? said Lacey, looking at the photograph of Nadia Safi. Pashtun, biggest ethnic group in Afghanistan. Something like 40% of the population. But there are quite a lot of them in the neighbouring countries as well. Afghanistan? Taluk phoned me on the way up, said Lacey. They've had the reconstruction done of the woman I found. They think she might be from Iran. Are those two countries close? They share a border, said Tok, so it's quite likely there'll be Pashtuns in Iran as well. Lacey looked again at the photograph on the table. Is it significant? Could be. The Pashtuns are quite beautiful to Western eyes. Very similar to Europeans in terms of bone structure, but with darker hair and skin colour. Quite often they have blue eyes. Blue-eyed Asians? This girl's a pretty light. Look, a bluey-grey, I'd say. They're certainly not the black you normally expect in people from that part of the world. Lacey turned the photograph round. She hadn't noticed it before, but now it was pointed out, the girl in the photograph did have unusually light eyes. There was a famous photograph of an Afghan girl on the cover of Time magazine about 20 years ago, said Tok. She was only about 15 years old, but she was really quite astonishingly beautiful, mainly because of her striking green eyes. The woman in the Salvation Army hostel I visited talked about Afghanistan, said Lacey. Tok was shaking her head sadly. One of the worst places in the world to be a woman. I've not heard of large numbers of female immigrants from there, but you certainly couldn't blame them. Lacey's knowledge of foreign affairs was confined to what she caught on the late evening news or read in the weekend papers. I thought things got better when the Taliban left, that there was a new constitution, that women had equal rights. Tok shrugged. I think they have improved, but all things are relative. Most women there are still illiterate. Female life expectancy is still the lowest in the world. More women die in pregnancy and childbirth there than almost anywhere else mainly because so many women marry as children. I hadn't realised. People believe what they feel comfortable believing. Tok's voice had got louder. It always did when she felt strongly about something. I'm not saying the government there isn't trying to do the right things, but you can't change society overnight. Most women have no idea of their rights, so they don't know how to complain. And in the unlikely event that they do, they're rarely taken seriously. Half the women in Afghan prisons have been convicted of so-called moral crimes. And a moral crime is what, exactly? Adultery. Promiscuity. Tok gave an incredulous look. I doubt many would dare. More likely running away from an abusive husband or being sexually molested. The women in rural areas suffer the most. They can't travel outside the home without a male escort. Fewer than half go to school. They're usually forced to marry very young often to a man much older. Lacey shook her head, slightly in awe. How do you know all this stuff? I read newspapers, watch TV. Lots of time to kill in here. OK, I'm getting the picture, said Lacey. So we can expect these women to jump at the chance of a better life. It can't be that simple. These women have no money, no passports. Half of them can't read. They're as innocent as children in the ways of the world. It simply isn't possible for them to leave Afghanistan without help. But quite possible that if they were offered help, say passage to a country where they'd be safe, help finding a job and somewhere to live when they get there, then quite a number would be tempted. Yes, Tok agreed. I imagine an awful lot would leap at that. Christ, talk about out of the frying pan. A toddler ran close, careering off their table and on down the room. 
His mother shot past and scooped him up. On her way back to her own table, she paused to glare down at Tok, who returned the foul look with a beaming smile. I want to try and find Nadia Safi, said Lacey. She could really kickstart the investigation. Any thoughts on how I might do that? Tok was leaning back on her chair, looking smug. I'd have thought you were the expert on tracking down young women in London. Her smile widened. You spent eight months looking for me, remember? Very nearly found me as well. Lacey sat back in her chair and smiled back at Tok. I did, didn't I? Chapter 54 Pari The firing was getting closer now. The heavy thud of large guns striking the walls around her home. The breaking of glass. She could see daylight beyond. A few more strikes and the wall would be down. She'd be free. Boom, tinkle, tinkle. Pari woke just in time to hear the splash as something struck the water below her window. She lay still, dreading the nausea that crippled her when she was awake these days. Had there been singing? That old folk song, just before the thudding had made her dream of gunfire. There it was again. The soft thud that had seemed so much louder in her dream, followed by the sharp rattle of metal against glass. Then the splashing again. Curiosity getting the better of her, Pari got out of bed. The room was dark. Only the faintest slivers of moonlight ever found their way inside. She couldn't hear anything, but something told her that the world around her wasn't entirely asleep. Somewhere, not very far away, people were awake. Something was happening. When Pari put her face to the window, the buildings across the creek were almost entirely black. A missile, small, round, was flying up towards her. It hit the wall below and dropped down again. Standing on a chair, she could see something in the water below. Impossible to see exactly what, just shapes and movement. The missile was flying up again, catching on the partially open window directly below hers. It was a set of keys attached to a ball. Pari watched a small hand reach out and close around the keys. She stayed where she was until her back started to hurt then climbed down and sat on the bed, listening and waiting. Traffic from somewhere quite distant. A siren. Shouting, again very distant. The normal sounds of London. Then a door being softly closed. No one moved around at night. It didn't happen. The prison warder, Pari had long stopped thinking of her as anything else, valued her sleep, and that hadn't been an internal door. Pari climbed up again, leaned out of the window once more, and looked down. Vague shapes, pale colours against the black of the water, the gleam of skin, the graceful fall of long hair. Then a gentle, rhythmical splash. A boat was moving away from the building. Someone had left. Pari returned to her bed, lowering her throbbing head carefully. For the first time in many weeks, she felt hope. Someone had got out. Someone was helping them. Chapter 55 Lacey What on earth am I doing, thought Lacey, as she stepped down from the bus. She wasn't a detective anymore. She'd only recently been signed off as fit for duties. And there was no way she'd be allowed to take part in undercover work. Plus, her credibility in the Met had probably hit rock bottom. Maybe that was it. The need to claw something back. She couldn't don a wetsuit and dive the Thames. She couldn't search a five-mile stretch of the South Bank. But she might just be in with a shot at finding Nadia Safi. She took a moment to get her bearings. The Old Kent Road in South London was notorious. There were over a dozen brothels and massage parlours on this section of the street alone, many tucked away below or above fast food outlets. Catching a glimpse of her reflection in a shop window, she pulled the headscarf a little further around her face. Eyes down, submissive body language. She was a scared young woman in a foreign country. Arriving back in London after visiting Tok, 
she'd gone straight to a tanning salon for an all-over bronze look. Before coming out, she'd darkened her hair, avoiding the garish blue-black that would give it away as artificial, settling instead on very dark brown. Her darker skin threw the whites of her eyes and the hazel blue irises into sharp relief. She'd drawn a fine coal rim around her eyes and darkened her lips. In the dark of the street and the artificial lights of the buildings, she knew she had a chance of passing for a Pashtun woman. The first place she went into had a small reception area with whitewashed walls and plastic seats, a dusty plastic palm tree pushed into one corner. On the chipped coffee table were several used plastic cups. Lacey raised her eyes from the floor and met those of the fifty-something white woman behind the counter. Speak slowly, lots of pauses, as though searching for the words. She didn't risk trying to fake an accent. Can you help me, please? I am looking for my sister. The woman shook her head and breathed in through her cigarette. Lacey took the photograph of Nadia Safi out of her bag and put it on the counter. Her name is Nadia. The woman wasn't looking at the picture. She was staring at Lacey. Her mouth twisted into an amused smile. Knowing that a woman would be more likely to spot hair dye in a fake tan, Lacey reached quickly into her bag again. Please. She put the scrap of paper onto the counter and picked up the photograph of Nadia. I have a phone. If you know anyone who might know Nadia, please. As Lacey turned to leave, in the glass of the front door, she saw the woman screw up the scrap of paper and sweep it onto the floor. You win some, you lose a lot more. She'd done this before, spent months of her life searching London for a young woman who didn't want to be found. It was like fishing. Scatter enough worms on the water, and sooner or later one of them would be taken. The second place she tried, on the face of it a massage parlour, had an elderly bloke behind reception, and two women in the waiting area. From the way they were dressed and made up, Lacey assumed they were workers. Go home, love, one of them advised her, when with downcast eyes she showed them the photograph. This is no place to be out at night. Next, a kebab shop. A young Asian man behind the counter. Never seen her, he said, in an accent that told Lacey he was British-born and London-raised. Where are you from? Kunduz. Lacey named a province in the north of Afghanistan, close to the Tajikistan border. She's my sister, she repeated, indicating the photograph. You got papers? Lacey flinched, dropping her eyes. I don't want trouble... I just want to know that she's well. How'd you get here? She backed away, closer to the door. We travelled together. We were separated at Calais. You got a place to stay? The look in his eyes was becoming acquisitive. Time to move on. Lacey took out the scrap of paper with her phone number, scurried to the counter and left it behind. The door chimed behind her as she stepped out onto the street again. You speak very good English for an Afghan woman. I went to school. Lacey kept her eyes on the dust-strewn floor. I was one of the lucky ones. The man leaning against a cheap plastic bar was West Indian, middle-aged and overweight. Do you need a place to stay? He asked her. Any money? It had been the same everywhere. Either they wanted to recruit her, or they did their best to ignore her. I just want to find my sister. Lacey put the card with her phone number down in front of him. He reached out, tried to grab her hand. We're looking for nice girls here. You want a job? Steady work? Lacey stepped back, away from the counter. If you think of anyone who might have seen her, please phone me. By three o'clock in the morning, she'd had enough. Last time she'd done this, she'd been ten years younger, and she'd been looking for someone she cared about. Nadia was just a name, a photograph and a damp memory. Her phone was ringing. Not her own phone, which was back on the boat. This was the cheap, throwaway mobile she'd bought earlier. Her heart was suddenly beating loud and fast, exhaustion forgotten. Hello? I know where she is. The green illuminated sign advertised exotic girls. The red neon beneath it said peep show. More signs 
as if the purpose of the establishment weren't sufficiently clear, advertised pole dancing and striptease. As Lacey approached, three men in business suits, two of them Japanese, the other their British guide, were admitted by the overweight doorman. The voice on the phone had told her to go round the back. She looked quickly in her bag to check that the text message she'd sent to her own phone back at the boat had gone through. she texted exactly where she was going and why. If anything happened to her, sooner or later her phone would be checked. As insurance policies went, it was hardly fully comprehensive, but it was better than nothing. The alley she was expected to walk down was very dark. She could barely see the other end of it. She pulled out her phone again and dialed 999. Emergency services. I just saw a girl being dragged into a strip club on Argyle Street, said Lacey, just off the old Kent Road. There were three men with her. It looked like she was being forced. I think she needs help. Less than a minute later, she was walking down the alley. The average police response time in this part of London at this time of night was 15 to 20 minutes. In a case of possible abduction, the constables responding would tread cautiously. They wouldn't go charging into a strip club without backup. They'd look around, talk to the doorman, wait for reinforcements. It was 17 minutes past three. She had time. At the end of the alley, a dark-skinned, dark-eyed man was waiting for her in an open doorway. Where is Nadia? said Lacey from several feet away. You need to come inside. Fifteen, twenty minutes. Still a big risk. Is she here? She'd be expected to be frightened. Frightened would look convincing. A step closer. Glance into the yard behind the door. She was probably looking very convincing right now. I don't want to go in there. Up to you. Do you want your sister or not? Lacey stepped forward. When she was close enough to reach, the man grasped her shoulder and pushed her inside. The door closed behind them and a bolt was pulled. Shit. The yard was surrounded by high walls on three sides and a narrow three-story house on the other. It smelled of Indian food, of stale beer and even staler urine, of bins that hadn't been emptied in a while. There were lights on in the house. The man pushed her towards the back door. Filthy kitchen. At least a dozen milk bottles showing varying shades of yellow, curdling milk. A recycling box overflowing with beer cans. A stack of pamphlets in Urdu on the worktop. From somewhere inside the building, she could hear the monotonous drone of cheap European pop music. Three more men in the kitchen. Two of them white, one Asian. Check her bag snapped the man who'd met her in the alley. Lacey's bag was pulled from her shoulder, its contents tipped onto the worktop beside her, but she spent enough time with Josebury to know that, when working undercover, you carried nothing that might identify you. In the bag were her phone, an umbrella, a few cheap items of makeup, a bus ticket and a few coins. Who are you? Eyes down. An illegal immigrant would be terrified. The man talking to her, the older of the two white guys stepped forward and thrust a hand under her chin. I said, what's your name? Layla. She tried to drop her eyes again. He held fast. Stay calm. Think back to when you did this before. Layla what? Just Layla. Please, I only want my sister. She turned to the man who'd brought her in. You said you knew where she was. The other Asian man spoke. Muslim women don't wander the streets on their own at this time of night. What are you, some sort of whore? She's my sister. She doesn't have anyone else. Where are you from? Lacey looked at the men in front of her. Two of them could easily be from South Asia. She couldn't panic. There were any number of languages and dialects in that region. They couldn't possibly know them all. They told me not to say, she replied. I don't want to go back. I just want Nadia. What if we told you we do know Nadia, and she's told us she doesn't have a sister? This was the other white guy, the younger of the two, in a brown leather jacket with a tight woolen cap over his dark hair. If she told you that, she's trying to protect me. Is she here? Hold on to her. The older white man turned and left the room. At least ten minutes before help would get to her. Eight minutes before she had to get out of here or risk being taken into custody. Shit, this was not going well. I want to see my sister or I want to leave, 
she told the man who'd brought her in, the one who was now leaning bouncer-style against the back door. He straightened up, not about to let her through without an argument. Bring her upstairs. The boss was back. Two of the others reached out for her. No! Lacey was being backed up against the counter. She could brace herself against it, kick out with both legs. With only one bloke, she'd have a chance. With four, none at all. You think I'm alone? I have a friend who will call the police if I'm not out of here in two minutes. She was grabbed and pushed forward, out of the kitchen, into a narrow corridor. Oh, what the hell had she done? She was alone in a strip club that probably doubled as a brothel, the prisoner of four men, and the music was so loud that she couldn't hear the sirens and no investigating police officer would hear her. The stairs they went up were filthy, the carpet old and worn. The light bulb above them was broken. On the first floor, another man was waiting. He opened a door at the far end of the corridor and pushed Lacey in. The man behind the desk looked to be in his early sixties, with thick, graying hair and a large, hooked nose. His eyes were dark brown. His skin suggested he might be mixed race, or very fond of foreign holidays. The door slammed shut, and the noise of the music faded just to the point where it no longer hurt. The arms holding her fell away, and she was left in the midst of a circle of unfriendly eyes like a captive animal. She had to hold it together. The police would be here. You have thirty seconds to convince me you're from Bongo Bongo land, or I'm making plans for you, said the man with the hooked nose and the cruel eyes. He glanced at the man behind her in the brown jacket. No, Beanie? Lacey was turned to face him. No. Beanie kept his eyes on her as he shook his head. That one I would remember. He let his eyes trail down to her feet and then up again. Could she be one of your lot? Beanie screwed up one side of his mouth. Can't be. No female officer would be allowed round here at night without backup. And if she had a team with her, they'd be in here by now. One of your lot? Beanie was a cop. What the hell had she walked into? One of the men walked to the window and looked outside. If he saw anything to alarm him, he didn't mention it. So if she isn't the filth, who the fuck is she? If you want my best guess, I'd say a P.I., Beanie replied. Maybe that girl she claims to be looking for as a family after all. He turned to the doorman. Have you searched her? Nothing in her bag. I didn't ask about her fucking personal effects. I said, have you searched her? Shake of the head. Then I guess it's your lucky night. Lacey stood, impassive and unconcerned, as if she was going through airport security, as male hands ran along the length of her body, her back, arms, legs, everywhere. Nothing. Hooknose was losing patience. He stood up, leaned over the desk towards her. Okay, enough fucking around. What are you doing here? Probably time to drop the submissive act. Beanie had given her an angle. Maybe she could use it. I'm looking for Nadia Safi, she told him. Does it really matter whether I'm her sister or not? She has people who care about her who'll pay my bill. If you haven't seen her, just say so and I'll leave you in peace. Who do you work for? Myself. Hooknose sat down again. So what do we do with her? Can you dance, darling? Said the white man who'd brought her up here. There's a room for you upstairs, said one of the Asians. Want to try her out first, Rich? The man behind the desk, Rich, seemed to be thinking about it. Beanie had been picking at his nails, feigning complete indifference. He looked up. Sorry, guys, you can't keep her. She won't be working alone, whatever she might tell you. She'll have people who come looking. You don't need that sort of attention right now. What then? Let her go. Just like that? Show her the family album. She looks like a woman who values her face. Rich crinkled his eyes at Lacey for a second, before reaching inside his desk drawer. He brought out a cheap-looking photo album and beckoned her closer. The first page showed a woman whose face and neck had been badly scarred. Her flesh rose in lumps and ridges, like the surface of the moon. Acid, said Rich. She got clumsy, pulled a bottle down on herself when she was trying to run away before we'd done with her. He turned the page. More dreadful injuries. Silly girl set fire to herself, said Rich. You have to be careful with saris, especially the cheap ones. 
All that nylon is very flammable. Another page. Cut off her own nose. Can you believe that? I've got the message, said Lacey. Rich ignored her, turning the page again. A woman whose face had been cut either side of her mouth, creating a scar that was a hideous mockery of a smile. As Lacey closed her eyes, the phone rang. Rich picked it up. There's a police car outside, he said a moment later. Two officers watching the building very closely. I have to be out of here, said Beanie. I'll get rid of her. My car's out back. They hurried from the building, Beanie pulling Lacey along by the hand. Down the stairs, back along the corridor as someone started banging on the front door, out into the yard and then the alley. Beanie led her to a dark saloon car parked a few yards away. He jumped into the driver's seat and was almost moving before Lacey was properly inside. They reached the end of the alley, turned to the main road and sped past the club. Two patrol cars were parked outside, their occupants still discussing the possibilities of admission with the doorman. Driving down the old Kent Road, Lacey watched Beanie's eyes in the rear-view mirror. For a second he looked up, but his expression told her nothing. I'll get rid of her, he'd said. Get rid of her how? The street was getting quieter. They'd left most of the lights behind. They were slowing. Beanie indicated and pulled over. Lacey turned to see where they were. Outside an all-night minicab firm. He was putting her in a cab. Less than a minute later, Lacey was in the back of a car that smelled of cigarettes and cheap air freshener. Beanie leaned in and handed over a twenty-pound note to the driver, whom he'd greeted by name. She'll tell you where she wants to go, he told him. Take her straight home. Then he turned to Lacey. We see you in this neighbourhood again, love. It won't be a minicab we send you home in. Got that? Sunday, 29th of June. Chapter 56. Pari. How did she get out? How the hell are they getting out? Don't look at me. Pari felt too bad to wake up. Sleep was sometimes the only way to push the pain to one side. Even then, it never really went away completely, always invading her dreams, turning them dark. Who else am I supposed to look at? Who else was here all night? What are you saying? That I let them out? They were speaking too quickly for Pari to catch more than a few words, but the fear behind them was clear. The people who looked after this place never normally raised their voices. Well, someone is doing it. He's going to go berserk. Well, then he needs to fix it. What's that supposed to mean? Ask him. It's his call. Pari opened her eyes. It was no longer dark in the room. Morning. Oh, you'll tell him that, will you? Can you tell me how they're getting out? That's nine we've lost now. Nine who've just wandered out by the back door. They're not doing that by themselves. No, they're not, thought Pari. Someone is helping us. Soon it will be my turn. Chapter 57 Lacey The tide was out. The yacht had settled into the mud, and Lacey could no longer see the deck of the old dredger. She really had no idea how long she'd been just sitting here, staring out across the water. She'd slept most of the morning and spent the afternoon trying, and largely failing, to find something useful to do. It was going to be one of those wasted days. The sooner it was over with, the better. God help her if Josebury found out what she'd done last night. At the faintest sound behind her, Lacey realised that she wasn't alone. Eileen had climbed into the cockpit of the next boat and was sitting, watching her. But when Lacey smiled, opening her mouth to say something, she was no longer sure the older woman was looking at her. Eileen's eyes were fixed in her direction, but they weren't actually focused. Eileen seemed lost in thought. Below, a phone was ringing. Lacey got up, swung herself down the steps and stopped. Her usual phone on the table was silent. The ringing was coming from the bag she'd carried along the old Kent Road the previous night. The number was withheld. Hello? Silence on the line. Through a starboard side hatch, Lacey could still see Eileen. There was something different about her this afternoon. She was wearing a dress, the colour of the ocean, and her hair was loose. Her strong face was made up, 
giving her a glamour that hinted at the woman Ray had married all those years ago. In the tight-fitting dress, she didn't seem nearly as big as she usually did. Quite shapely, in fact. Still silence on the line. Then, why are you looking for me? A woman's voice, broken English, heavily accented. Is that Nadia? Lacey turned away, so that the unusual sight of a glamorous Eileen wouldn't distract her. You are not my sister. Why do you tell people you are my sister? What do you want? I'd like to meet you. Can we talk, please? I have nothing to say. So why had she phoned? I'll come alone, Lacey said. I just want to talk. You've nothing to be afraid of, I promise. Silence. Was it even Nadia Safi? It could be anyone. She looked back up through the hatch. Eileen was combing her hair now, that faraway look still on her face. Long hair reaching her shoulders. Grey, but still soft. Not wiry, the way older people's hair often became. Where are you now? Lacey spoke softly, conscious that Eileen could probably hear her. I'll come and find you. Why? I think you can help me. I might be able to help you. Lacey held her breath. Kensington Gardens, by the statue of the little boy, in an hour. Chapter 58 Nadia The park was full. An ice cream van was pumping out far more heat than the product it was selling could hope to soothe. Dogs and children ran. Adults followed as best they could. A juggler looked ready to melt, he was sweating so much. Nadia walked through the Italian gardens at the northern edge of the serpentine. The colours of the flowers muted and dull through the grill she wore over her eyes. The burkas worn at home were pale blue and supposedly bad enough, but nothing could be worse to wear in the heat than this oppressive, suffocating black. She glanced back. Fazil was by the gate, one of his sons further inside the park. Another would be close by. It had been their idea to meet the woman from last night, to find out who she was, what she wanted. Nadia set off along the water's edge. The ground cracked and dry beneath her sandaled feet, her hands wafting the dark folds to allow some air to reach her face. The statue of Peter Pan lay ahead. Several people were near it. A man intent upon his mobile phone. A mother rubbing ice cream from her toddler's shirt. A woman looking west towards the palace. Young, judging by her shape and posture, long dark hair loose down her back. A bicycle lay at her feet, and she was wearing the green and white striped shirt she'd mentioned on the phone. This was the woman who'd walked the length of the old Kent Road, claiming to be Nadia's sister. As if any of Nadia's sisters would dream of doing something so reckless, as if any of them would care enough. She turned, looked directly at Nadia, her face registering nothing. Fazil had been right about meeting here. All around the park, black-clad women walked sat and talked, pushed buggies, only their hands showing a glimpse of the person within. The woman in the striped shirt turned again, spinning a slow, lazy circle. Nadia stepped onto the grass so that her feet made no sound. When she was close enough, she spoke the name she'd been told on the phone. Lacey? The woman turned. Nadia stepped back in alarm. This was a terrible mistake. She had to get out of here. Nadia, is that you? Nadia began to hurry towards the gate. Footsteps behind her told her she was being followed. Then the Englishwoman jumped in front, stopping her from moving forward. I know it's you, she said. You're the police, said Nadia. How could she have been so stupid? How could Fazel not have realised? Lacey held up both hands. I'm alone. No one knows I'm here. Was she telling the truth? Impossible to know. Nadia turned her head cursing the tiny grill that made her vision so limited. She saw Fazil, who would withdraw his protection completely if he knew she was talking to the police. You were on the river, she said, that night last year, when the boat overturned. Lacey nodded. You came in for me, said Nadia. You, not any of the men. They were at the other side of the boat. They didn't see you. You think they would have jumped in the water for someone like me? 
Actually, you'd be surprised. And I was fastened to the boat. I was never in any danger. You were when I tried to stand on your head to get out. The policewoman smiled, showing teeth that were small and the colour of fresh cream. I'd really like to ask you some questions, she was saying now. Can we sit down for a while? Nadia's voice dropped to a whisper. They are watching us. The policewoman didn't look round, didn't react in any way. Who? Who is watching us? I have to go. I cannot know you are police. Lacey was looking directly into Nadia's eyes, as though the grill wasn't there. Come with me now. I can keep you safe. Come and testify. We'll look after you. Did she really think it was that easy? Will you look after my family too, thousands of miles away? Can you keep them safe? Lacey was clearly too honest to make promises she knew she couldn't keep. She stepped back and shook her head, exaggerating the gesture. Tell them you're not who I'm looking for. Tell them I'm a private investigator, they'll know what that means, and that I made a mistake. Tell them I won't be bothering you again. Then call me. We'll talk when you're alone. Slowly, Nadia raised her veil. She kept the edges close to her head, so that only Lacey could see her. The policewoman had dyed her hair since the night last October. Even soaking wet, Nadia knew it hadn't been this dark. Her skin was darker too, as though she'd spent months in the sun. Only her eyes were the same. You would have asked to see me she said, to be sure I'm not who you're looking for. Thank you for saving my life. She dropped the veil again and set off. She didn't look back. Chapter 59 Dana Mom, we lost her. You are kidding me! A woman had come to them of her own volition, had met with one of them, and now they'd lost her. Dana turned on the spot, looked up and down the Bayswater Road. No burka-clad woman had come out of the shopping centre this way. Up the road, at the entrance to the park, she spotted Lacey, who'd followed Nadia at a distance, trusting in her colleagues to keep her in sight. Are you sure? Dana said into her radio. Stenning sounded out of breath. Do you have any idea how many burkas there are in Whiteley's shopping centre at this time of year? Keep looking. With less than an hour's notice, the only members of her team Dana had been able to get across London were Stenning and Misen. They couldn't even cover all the exits. We can't lose her. She's all we've got. As the words came out of Dana's mouth, she knew it was hopeless. Nadia had gone. Chapter 60 Lacey Penny Forum? Lacey jumped. Ray was in the cockpit of his boat, smoking, an open can of beer at his side. From somewhere below, she could hear Eileen humming quietly and tunelessly to herself. The two of them hadn't gone out for the evening after all. She wondered if Eileen was still in her sea-blue dress, and what on earth had possessed the woman to get herself all dressed up with nowhere to go. Didn't see you there skulking in the shadows, said Lacey, as she made her way around the port deck of his boat. He blew smoke up into the air. Too hot to go below. There was practically no breeze on the creek tonight, and the smoke hung above Ray's head, almost as though he were in an enclosed space. She could see Eileen's comb and mirror beside the beer can. You been working? he asked her. Wild goose chase, Lacey admitted. A big black billowing wild goose who'd got clean away. And sometime tomorrow, she'd have to explain to Tullock about her unofficial undercover activities along the old Kent Road. Exhaustion getting the better of her, she wished Ray a good evening, opened the hatch and went below. The cabin was hot, as she'd expected. It was going to be a long, sticky night. She slipped off her shoes and went into her bedroom. The cabin was small enough for her to take in everything from the doorway, and neat enough for her to be able to spot anything out of place. Crabs three of them, on her bed. All alive, two still and glossy brown against the plain white duvet cover, the other moving slowly and gracelessly along her pillow. For a second, Lacey watched them, not quite believing her eyes. There was something almost surreal about the long, spindly legs and oversized claws on her spotless bed linen. 
Then she left the cabin, found a high-sided dish and tongs in the galley, and went back. Crabs, she said to Ray, a second later, when she was back in the cockpit. I can see that, he said. On my bed, she added. He flicked cigarette ash over the side. Not something you see every day? Lacey leaned out over the stern, upturned the dish and watched them disappear. How do they get there? asked Ray, when she'd straightened up again. I have no idea. I left the cabin hatches open, but crabs can't climb a smooth hull, can they? Not to my knowledge. Mitten crabs, were they? Lacey nodded. They were, to her knowledge, the only crab resident in the Thames. Lot of them about, said Ray. Ray, have you been here all evening? He nodded. Nobody came past me. Any more down below? Not that I could see. Maybe I've got holes somewhere and they found their way in. If you've got holes somewhere, you'll find out a high tide. You're right. I'll give you a yell if I need a bailout. Good night. Lacey went below again, unwilling to admit, even to herself, how jumpy she felt. On the scale of one to ten, mitten crabs were hardly disturbing intruders. But it really wasn't that likely they'd found their own way in here. So could she call Tulloch and report three intruders of the crustacean variety? Did she want to be the subject of crab jokes down at Wapping for the next six months? Better to sit tight. Ray and Eileen were within shouting distance. The boat rocked and rolled, with its bumpy, irregular, oddly soothing rhythm. Around the creek, the air was full of sound. Tidal London had remembered that some wind was the norm, and the masts and high buildings were a mass of sighs and whistles. The A2 hummed with the occasional passing car, and a nocturnal bird screeched at the loss of a catch. Inside the cabin, all was quiet. Lacey stirred, not quite asleep, conscious of being overly hot. There was sweat between her breasts and at the nape of her neck. She grabbed the pillow and turned it, then pushed the duvet further down the bed. It was far too hot to sleep with the hatches shut, but after the little surprise of earlier, she hadn't wanted to be open to the elements. She turned again, and the darkness in her head grew deeper. She was riding her bike down a long, dark tunnel, which was part creek, part Greenwich foot tunnel, and part something that belonged entirely to dreams. Crowds of veiled women lined her path. Her head was itching. She reached up, scratched, turned over again. Josebury was staring down at her. He lowered his head, and her eyes closed. She waited for the moment when his lips touched hers. His eyes again, outside the boat, staring in at her through the cabin window. Lacey's own eyes opened, saw the hatch, black and empty, and closed again. She was in the water, swimming fast and going nowhere, in the usual way of dreams. Veiled women were behind her, drawing closer with every stroke, their long scarves floating out across the water, reaching, wrapping, dragging. Those veils, so long and light, so very deadly, running the length of her body, stroking, tickling, tickling her foot. With a sudden sharp awareness, Lacey sat up, crying out in confusion. She kicked hard, and the creature that had been making its way along her foot fell to the floor of the cabin. She could hear it, clatter, 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 along the polished wooden boards. She found the bedside light, then sprang into a ball on the bed, convinced the things were everywhere. They weren't. She ran her hands over her head, her shoulders, knelt on the bed and twisted this way and that. She bundled the duvet into a heap and pushed it against the cabin wall. Only then did she lean over the side of the bed to find the crab she'd knocked to the floor. It was huge, its body a good three inches across and its legs stretching to eight or nine inches. There was weed attached to its right rear leg and one of its claws was much bigger than the other. It had been crawling all over her while she slept. She had to stop shuddering. It was only a crab. Apart from a nasty nip, it couldn't hurt her. Lacey looked round. The hatches, one on each side of the cabin, were closed, as was the larger one above her head. The crab must have arrived with the others earlier, 
hiding out until it could emerge safely under the cover of darkness. God, it was huge, easily the biggest of the four, and she'd searched every square inch of the boat. There was nowhere a creature like that could hide. Then she remembered. The large hatch above her head could not be opened from outside, but the smaller side ones could. Clatter, clatter, clatter. The crab was trying to climb. Ridiculous to be scared. She swam amongst creatures like this all the time. She'd never minded crabs, quite liked their comic, scuttling ways. And yet this one. She risked peering over the edge of the bed again. There was something almost predatory about the way it was making repeated attempts to scale the smooth wood of the bed frame. Jesus, where was the man in her life when she needed him? Before she could change her mind, she swung her legs over the side, picked up the crab and leaned across the bed to open the port hatch. The creature's legs thrashed, its claws reached for her. Lacey thrust her right hand out of the hatch and dropped the crab onto the deck. She closed the hatch and fastened it tight. Lacey. The voice was so soft, so close, that for a second Lacey thought there was someone in the cabin with her. Lacey. There was someone outside. On the boat, almost certainly. They were too close to be anywhere else. She reached out and switched off the light. Clatter, clatter. Tap, tap, tap. The crab was scuttling along the deck. A pause, then a splash. It was back in the water where it belonged. Lacey felt along the shelf that ran around the cabin wall and found her watch. 3.47 in the morning. It would be getting light soon. Not soon enough. Who could be on her boat at nearly four in the morning? She didn't recognise the voice. Couldn't even tell whether it was male or female. It had been low-pitched, croaking. A tapping noise. Not the crab this time. The crab was back in the water, and that had been heavier, more deliberate, like knocking on a door. Tap, tap, tap. Someone was tapping on the side of the hull. Lacey picked up her phone. Ray, the reliable insomniac, answered on the second ring. What's up? He kept his voice low, even though he told her previously that Eileen and he slept in different cabins, his at the stern, hers at the bow. There's someone on my boat. He didn't ask her if she was sure, or suggest she might be dreaming. He told her to give him a minute and hung up. Knowing the cabin was in darkness, that anyone watching from outside would see nothing, Lacey got to her feet, found her sneakers and pulled on a light sweater. She made her way into the main cabin, and when she could hear Ray opening the hatch of his boat, did the same with hers. She stood in the cockpit, looking around, aware of Ray doing exactly the same on his boat. The tapping had been on the porthole, but there was no one on deck, no place to hide either. You been upsetting anyone? asked Ray when she'd filled him in. Where would she start? No one who knows where I live. Never a wise assumption, said Ray. It always surprises me how many folk know where I live. Your bed is under the port side hatch, isn't it? Lacey agreed that it was. If the crab was dropped through the other side, you would have heard it banging on the floor. I guess. That meant the intruder had been on the riverside. Did you feel the boat rocking? Hear any footsteps? No, just the voice and the tapping. Ray was already on her boat. He stepped up onto the port deck and shone his torch in the water. You think they slipped over the side? Lacey was having to look behind her every other second. Ray ran the beam along the length of Lacey's boat from the bow to the stern. We'll see we have a look around, he said. Five minutes later, Lacey crouched in the bow of Ray's motorboat as they made their way around the community of houseboats. Ray hadn't turned on the engine, was relying instead upon muscle power to propel them along. The dripping of water from the oars as they were raised, a gentle splash as they dipped into the river, were the only sounds they made, and these were more than drowned out by the slapping of waves against hulls, the wind keening around the masts, and the distant and occasional hum of a passing car. In spite of the sweatshirt she wore, in spite of the warmth of the night, 
Lacey couldn't stop shivering. She'd been on the river at night many times before, but always within the secure environment of one of the Targa launches. This felt very different. So low in the water, so close to the inky blackness that flowed around them. So much a part of the briny, oily smell that rose like steam from a boiling saucepan, and so vulnerable to whatever was out there. It had been Ray's unquestioning acceptance that she'd been right that had unnerved her the most, and also that he hadn't considered for a moment searching the yard. They'd come straight out onto the river. Quite who or what he was expecting to find was another matter. Not so long ago, Josebury had drawn a heart shape in sugar in her cabin. The next day, someone had copied it using shells and pebbles and had thrown in a linen bag of crabs for good measure. Toy boats had been left for her to find on three separate occasions. Someone was watching her, playing games. Someone who'd come back. Someone who was out there now. They'd reached the point where the creek met the concrete beneath Church Street. Ray steered the boat under the shelter of the bridge, and the gloom deepened. Water drizzled from the steel plates overhead, the dripping unnaturally loud. There was a scurrying on the bank as they disturbed a riverside creature. Then they were out again, gliding smoothly along. There was movement everywhere. Water splashed against the bank, trickling down again to join the river. The breeze stirred leaves and branches. Particles of mud and dust tumbled down. And every so often, a creature, rat, vole, another one of those blessed crabs, scurried from sight into the mud. A sudden sound above them made them both jump. A large bird was passing overhead. Too stocky to be a gull, it flew in low and fast, its wings fanning a current of air over Lacey's face. She'd swung the torch upwards and now lowered it again, letting it sweep across the water in front of them. Eyes staring back at her, not fifteen yards away. Lacey's hands gripped the torch, pinpointing its beam on the small, round shape in the water. A head. Human? Possibly. No doubt about the eyes, though. Large and gleaming reflecting back the light of the torch. A sleek head, which might have hair floating around it, or it could be just a trick of the light on the water. Ray, the boat moved closer with every stroke of the oars. Stop rowing, turn around. He did what she told him. They both watched the head in the water, which didn't move. There was something almost hypnotic about those huge, pale eyes. The bird was back, screeching overhead, breaking the spell. The head disappeared. Lacey leaned forward in the boat, trying to find it again. Steady on. Ray sounded more unnerved than she'd heard him before. We don't want to go in, not now. Ray, where did it? Keep still and keep quiet. Lacey regained her balance and began sweeping the light across the creek, from one wall to the other her heart beating so fast and so hard it seemed to be in danger of rocking the boat. She had to calm down. The torch beam was powerful enough to reach each bank, but they were almost at the main channel now and the flow of water was less predictable and much faster. I think we're done, said Ray. He avoided her eyes as he turned the boat and began rowing towards the marina. It would take them several minutes to get back. Lacey turned once again. There was no way she was turning her back on the creek, not for a second. The Bradbury's boat was twice the size of Lacey's, but, unlike hers, hadn't been designed with comfort in mind. The main cabin was large, but the walls were the bare charcoal grey metal of the hull. It smelled of tobacco and fried onions, and of water left too long in the bilges. Ray was fumbling around inside a freestanding cupboard, None of the furniture she could see had been designed for a boat. It was ordinary household or office furniture. It didn't work somehow, giving the room the look of a floating furniture store. When it straightened up, he put a bottle and two glasses on the table in front of her. Drink this, he told her. Lacey reached out and accepted the glass gratefully. 
She breathed in the fumes and took a sip. Rum. Ray was a waterman. Of course he'd be a rum drinker. Won't we wake Eileen? She asked quietly. End of the world wouldn't wake Eileen. He pulled his own glass closer. The bottle sat between them, like a scene from a pirate movie. You saw it, didn't you? She asked him. Ray didn't take his eyes from hers. Just let his head fall and lift again. He'd seen it. What the hell was it? He flicked the glass up towards his mouth in the manner of someone planning to down it in one. But when it was lowered again on the table, very little seemed to have gone. Lacey copied him, letting the spirit sit on her tongue until it burned. My best guess, he said. A seal. It didn't look like a seal. Lacey put her glass down empty on the table. It looked human. Ray, I've heard the talk about the Creek Mermaid. I just assumed they were drunken fishermen's tales. After tonight, I'm not so sure. There are seals in the estuary, said Ray. Not as many as there used to be, but you do see them occasionally up this far. Lacey reached out and poured herself another measure of rum. Seals have very human faces, Lacey. Big eyes, cute little noses. I doubt a seal could have filled my boat with crabs, or tapped on the side of the hull, or called out Lacey. Ray didn't reply. We have to report it, she said. Ray rolled a cigarette and knocked it lightly on the tabletop. Probably. Well, let's just sleep on it for now. From what I hear, you're not exactly flavour of the month at Wapping right now. How do you think your governors are going to react when you say you saw a mermaid? Lacey finished her second drink. Go on, he said. Get back to bed. I won't sleep any more tonight and I always enjoy a sunrise. I'll make sure nothing bothers you. Chapter 61 The Swimmer In the creek, the swimmer watched the lights on the boat. Through the cabin window was movement, darker shapes against the glow of the lamps. Moving closer, it might be possible to hear what they were saying. Closer, close enough to touch. Between the two boats. Risky, but sometimes. Time was running out. Another girl was going to die soon. Another one of those beautiful, long-limbed, smooth-skinned girls. A raised voice inside the cabin. Lacey. The name was like a flower. Lacey was the most beautiful of them all. They couldn't swim, the other girls. All that flaying, screaming, thrashing. They were easy meat. They screamed as they went under, water pouring into their gullets. And then it was all over. Not Lacey, though. Lacey was strong, fast. She was born to be in the water. Lacey would fight or flee. Either way, Lacey wouldn't be easy. Lacey was the one. Monday, 30th of June. Chapter 62. Lacey. Lacey woke just as dawn was breaking. For a moment she was disorientated, then remembered she'd curled up in the stern cabin because its two tiny portholes were impossible to open from the outside. She'd wrapped the duvet around herself and had overheated, but at least she'd slept. Tap, tap, tap. It was back. Whatever had woken her in the night had come back. She sat up, banging her head on the low roof. The knocking was coming from the main hatch. Lacey? Ray's voice. He was at the hatch, agitated. Lacey, I'm coming in. The hatch started to slide open. Lacey got up on legs that hadn't had nearly enough rest. As she opened the cabin door, she saw Ray's tanned, wrinkled face peering down at her from the cockpit. Every line on it seemed to sink with relief when he saw her. Thank God for that. He held out a hand. Come on, love, let's get you out of here. Still groggy, Lacey looked round. What? What's happened? I need you off the boat, right now. The boat looked normal. It wasn't on fire. She checked the floor quickly. No water. No crabs. I'll just get... No! 
she'd been about to go into her own cabin to get clothes, that half stepped along the floor towards it, and yet she could see now there was something different about the room she usually slept in. Not as much light coming through the bow hatch as there should be. Ray, you're scaring me. Ray made a quick, urgent gesture with both hands, a get up on deck now signal. You're going to stay close to me and we're going to walk across to my boat, he said. It'd be really good if you kept your eyes on your feet. That noise sneaking its way up her throat was a whimper. It's only just become light enough to see, he was saying, as she climbed the steps and stepped out into the cockpit, not taking her eyes from Ray's. I think it must have been there for most of the night, he went on, maybe strung up while we were out on the water. It was behind her, whatever it was that Ray didn't want her to see. There was nothing out of place at the stern. The thing was up at the bow, above the cabin where she usually slept. Try and keep your voice down, Ray was saying as if making a sound of any kind wasn't completely beyond her. The police are on their way. I really don't want people seeing this if we can help it. They'd stepped onto the starboard deck. Ray's boat was a large stride away. The air around them was still cold. The sun hadn't appeared yet. Ray held out his hand. Lacey took it and stepped from one boat to the next. When she was safely on his boat, she turned round. The first thing she noticed was the linen-wrapped corpse dangling from the mast of her yacht. One of her halyards had been hooked onto the twine that was wrapped around its neck, and it had been hoisted aloft. Its feet just brushed the port hatch. Then she saw the crabs, dozens of them, climbing the legs of the corpse, scuttling around her boat, as though it had become their natural home. Chapter 63 Dana We need to find you somewhere else to live for now, Lacey. You can come to me tonight until we sort out something longer term. Silence in the small, eclectically furnished cabin of the Bradbury's boat. Dana braced herself for a fight. You can't stay here. Even you must see that. We've gone way beyond coincidence now. Whoever is killing these women has got you in their sights. God alone knows how you manage it. Lacey sighed, got up from the table and nearly knocked over a coffee cup. She crossed to the porthole and looked out. Over her shoulder, Dana could see the yellow yacht. The body had been removed. Sockos were crawling all over the boat, just as the crabs had done earlier. It would be days, maybe longer, before Lacey could live on it again. And why, why didn't you tell me about those toy boats sooner? This has been going on for well over a week. Over in the galley area, Ray and Eileen were talking quietly. Eileen, still wearing a purple dressing gown, turned to face them. You can stay with us, Lucy. We've got plenty of room. I don't think so, said Dana. It's very good of you to offer, but it's not fair to expect you to be responsible for Lacey's safety. But this swimmer the two of them saw last night is more likely to come back if she's still living here, said Eileen. Another look between Ray and Lacey. What weren't these two telling her? As if the story hadn't been daft enough. Someone tapping on Lacey's boat in the small hours. The two of them going out on the water to investigate. A dark figure in the creek that disappeared as they'd looked at it and might have been a seal. Neither of them were entirely certain. Oh, and crabs. Lots of crabs. That is true, said Lacey. I can be seen on and around my boat during the day once Sockos have finished with it, just sleep here at night. Dana thought about it. She could have a heavy detective presence in and around the yard. The marine unit could increase patrols around the creek. We'll see, she said in the end. Let's see what the post-mortem throws up. Chapter 64 Dana Finally! The river police give me one they haven't buggered about with first. Cates pulled on his gloves and looked around at the six police officers. Pretty sizable crowd for mortuary. Come to find out how it's done, have we? Dana glanced across the room to where David Cook and Lacey stood side by side. Both remained still, staring at the body, oblivious to Cates's banter. She was found this morning on Lacey's boat, said Dana. Given that technically she was found on water, she was taken to Wapping Police Station, where she was weighed, 
measured, photographed, and entered onto the system. I particularly requested that no examination of the body take place until she was brought here. She? Gates pulled at his nose. Know something I don't? It's a woman. Lacey's eyes went briefly to Kate's. From somewhere in the Middle East or South Asia. No disrespect, Dr. Kate's, but we all know that. Close to Lacey, Misen was nodding. Neither Anderson, Stenning, nor Cook showed any sign of disagreeing. Yeah, well, you're probably right, muttered Kate's. Okay, let's all have a good look. Feel free to tell me your thoughts, people, but I want considered opinions, not hysterical assertions. Are you listening, River Police? Once again, Lacey didn't rise, just stepped closer and continued her slow, careful appraisal of the body. Around her, others followed, Dana last of all. The slender form on the gurney was still wrapped in linen. The fabric stained the brown of the river silt. Algae had covered swathes of it, giving it a dull, greenish sheen, and the marine creatures had begun the process of making it their own. Ragged holes gaped around the face and neck, more on the abdomen. Dana felt a surge of excitement. This one hadn't been in the river long. This one would have more to tell them. There would be fingerprints. Her internal organs would all be present. Any wounds would be obvious. They would know whether or not she'd been pregnant. Okay, Kate turned to his colleagues, Max and Jack. Let's have a proper look, shall we? Who's got the scissors? The two lab technicians began the process of removing the linen wrappings. They found the knots at the neck, midriff and feet, and snipped them away first. When everything was loose, Kate's got involved, lifting the head, shoulders, waist and legs, as the technicians unwound the bandages and bagged them carefully. The shroud beneath was a large square piece of fabric, large patches of which were still white. At a nod from Kate's, Max found the loose edge beneath the corpse's left side and raised it. The woman beneath was revealed. She looks like Sahar, said Misen, referring to the woman Lacey had found in the river just over a week earlier. She looks like Nadia, said Lacey. She looked like both, thought Dana. The dead woman's features were strong and regular. A high forehead, strong nose. Her eyes were open large and pale in colour. About twenty years old was Dana's best guess. Her breasts were high and small, her hips narrow and angular, her waist tiny. Her legs were long and a little on the thin side. The dark triangle of pubic hair had been neither trimmed nor shaved. There was fine dark hair on the lower part of her legs and lower arms. The hair on her head was black and very long. She wasn't stabbed or shot, said Stenning. There's barely a mark on her. We still need to turn her, said Kate's, but I'm inclined to think you're right. Jack, can I get a light up here, please? As the powerful light illuminated the woman's head, everyone moved a step or two closer to the top of the gurney. Kate's took out a surgical comb. He began moving it through the woman's hair, gently parting it at inch-wide intervals across her head. No obvious major head injury. Okay, let's turn her. He and his two assistants, with the skill of long practice, slid their hands beneath the woman's body and turned her onto her front. Pete's right, said Anderson. No sign of blunt force trauma at all. She couldn't have drowned, said Lacey. She's practically gift-wrapped. She must have been dead, or at least immobile, before they did that to her. Kate's had found a magnifying glass and was looking through it at something on the woman's neck. Then he walked back down the body until he was directly above her left hand. The skin around her hand looked like a thin glove about to slip off. Kate's frowned and leaned over to check the other hand. Was she strangled? asked Dana, or suffocated in some way. Kate's gave her a small smile. Possibly. Turn her back, please, girls. Look, he said, a few seconds later, when the woman was once again staring up at them. See these marks just above her collarbone? Looks like something was wrapped around her neck, said Anderson. Strangulation, then? Could be, said Kate. 
The mark goes all round to the back of her neck, and it doesn't look like a post-mortem wound to me. And there are marks on both hands that could be defence wounds. We need to be very careful with the hands, girls. We could very well find our perp's DNA tucked away under the fingernails. They're Pashtuns. Lacey had both hands wrapped round a coffee mug, as though she needed the warmth within it. There's no way of knowing now, but I'll bet Sahar had pale eyes. Nadia has. So has this one. Young, beautiful women from Afghanistan or somewhere very close. The team, together with David Cook and Lacey, were back at Lewisham Police Station. The post-mortem would continue for several hours. They'd left Cates and his team to it. We do need to talk to this Nadia Safi, said Dana. Whether she's involved or not, she's all we've got for the moment, which is why you're joining the team again, Lacey. You're our only link with her. Lacey looked sharply at Cook, who nodded his head. I've said it's okay, he said. We can cover your shifts until it's over, which I hope will be soon, by the way. We've got a busy few months ahead. As Dana watched, a gleam lit up Lacey's eyes. For all that she had insisted upon her need to go back into uniform, Lacey wanted to be involved with this case. She wanted to solve it. She was still a detective, however much she might try to pretend otherwise. At that moment, the door swung open, and Misen walked in. Report back from fingerprints, she announced. Three different sets of prints on those toy boats, including yours on the yellow one, ma'am, and Lacey's on all three. More significantly, though, another very distinct print that we also found around the winch on Lacey's boat, one that matches exactly the third set. Dana sat up a little straighter, saw her movements mirrored by those around her. The winch used to haul the body up the mast. The very one. Seems little doubt that our perp has a personal interest in Lacey and has been paying her visits for some time. Unfortunately, as his prints aren't on the system, we're no closer to knowing who he is. What about the latest victim? Misen shook her head. Sorry, boss, her prints aren't on record either. Around the table were collective sighs of frustration. Couldn't be that easy, could it? said Dana. At that moment, her phone started ringing. It was Kate's. He wanted them back. The pathologist steered them towards a small, windowless meeting room that smelled of stale coffee and cleaning fluid. He didn't sit, just took up a position at the far end of the table. She wasn't pregnant. I'd be inclined to say she'd never been pregnant. The uterus was small, just what you'd expect to see in a young woman who's yet to start the whole messy process of sprogging. Dana pulled out a chair and leaned on it. Another lead, gone. Any major organs missing? asked Misen. All present and correct. I made a point of checking the kidneys. And another. Dana sat down. I don't think she was strangled, Cates went on. For one thing, the hyoid bone was intact. We'll have to wait for toxicology reports, but there are no signs of the most common forms of poison. So how did she die? We may never know for certain, but the clever money at the moment says she drowned. That's impossible, said Lacey immediately. Good to see you're keeping an open mind, River Police, said Cates. Open mind or not, I can see Lacey's point, said Anderson, unless she was drugged to immobilise her before they trussed her up. On the contrary, I think she put up a bit of a fight, said Cates. There are wounds on her hands and lower arms, some scratch marks and faint bruises the sort that can develop in minutes, because I think minutes were all she had. There's also a small wound on the skull, just above the back of her neck, and the mark around her neck that you all saw. They all indicate to me that somehow, possibly with some sort of restraint around her throat, she was held under the water until she drowned. There's water in her lungs, asked Stenning. Kate nodded. There is, and it's Thames water. The mixture of fresh and salt water is quite distinctive. Not that that in itself proves anything. If a corpse is underwater for any length of time, water can seep its way into the lungs and stomach. Kate stretched, put both hands behind his head, and arched his back. There was a lecture coming. You know, don't you, that we can usually only suggest drowning as the cause of death, either if someone saw it happen, or we've managed to rule everything else out. If our toxicology reports come back clean, then my conclusion will be that this young woman most likely died 
as a result of being forcibly submerged in the River Thames. After which, she was removed from the river, shrouded, attached to weights, and then dropped back into the Thames, somewhere around Deptford Creek, said Dana. Seems reasonable to me, agreed Cates. Seems seriously weird to me, said Anderson. But what you really all want to know, Cates went on, is whether the woman found this morning, the one River Police pulled out of the Thames last week, and the one found at South Dock Marina two months ago, have enough in common for them to be the subject of a joint investigation. Basically, do we have three unconnected deaths or three linked by common circumstances? Is that fair? Exactly, replied Dana. We already know they were found in roughly the same stretch of river. We know there was a good chance that at least two of them were weighted down, given that their condition was consistent with their not moving around too much. We also know we're covering a time period of less than a year, said Lacey. Cates nodded. Very likely, River Police. Right. All under 30. I'd go as far as to say all under 25, judging by their teeth and bone development. All three had long black hair, suggesting Middle Eastern or Asian origin. None of them showed any sign of sophisticated dentistry. No obvious cause of death, other than what you've just told us, asked Anderson. No sign that any of them were shot, stabbed or hit over the head with a blunt instrument said Kate. Unlikely they were strangled, because the hyoid bone is intact on all of them. The post-mortem reports on the earliest one shows no sign of her having ingested any poisonous substances. I don't like to get ahead of myself, but it looks likely all three were forcibly drowned. The shroud clinches it, though, doesn't it? said Misen. The fact that two, possibly three of them, were shrouded is beyond coincidence. I think so, said Kate. You have a highly unusual serial killer, ladies and gentlemen. One who likes his work wet. Very wet. Chapter 65. Lacey. It's still bonkers, argued Anderson, as he'd been doing for most of the afternoon. We're talking about a major operation. First you've got to find these good-looking Afghan girls with blue eyes, then bribe them to leave their homes and travel thousands of miles with men they don't know, across a major landmass, including the length of Europe, then you have to smuggle them into Britain somehow. Not somehow, Sarge. Lacey was finding it surprisingly easy to be back at her old desk in Lewisham Nick. We know exactly how. They're coming on a ship to Tilbury, being offloaded there, and then brought up the Thames by small boat. Anderson's complexion had been getting steadily redder as the day went on. He sighed. I'll stand corrected. We have some idea of the last couple of miles of a several thousand mile journey. We're positively brimming over with information. I'm starting to wonder how we managed without you, Lacey. But to get back to my point, it all smacks of big business. Nobody goes to all that trouble unless there's money to be made. Nobody's disagreeing with you, Sarge, said Misen. But this money-making venture, either by design or accident, is resulting in some of these women dying. And that's where we go slipping off into the twilight zone, snapped Anderson. Because they're not just being dumped, they're being wrapped up like Egyptian mummies. That suggests something ritualistic to me, something twisted. Because smuggling women across the planet and holding them captive isn't twisted, said Misen. I'm not saying it's nice, just that there's a logical point to it, money. There is no logical point to how these women are being disposed of. And that's before we get on to the old business of Lacey's stalker. It's all seriously weird. Nobody argued. Well, I'm glad we're clear on that, said Stenning. Hush up now, she's on. The others turned to the TV set that had been playing quietly in the background. The early evening news had just begun, and the lead story was of the body that had been found on Lacey's boat earlier that day. A reporter was doing a piece to camera outside New Scotland Yard. The Metropolitan Police have confirmed not only that they are treating the death of the woman found at Deptford Creek this morning as suspicious, but that they believe her death may be linked to two similar cases in London within the last 12 months. The scene switched to the press room inside. D.I. Tullock, Chief Inspector Cook and Detective Superintendent Weaver sat at the top table facing the reporters. We believe these young women are being recruited somewhere in the Middle East. Tullock had changed for the press conference and was wearing a pearl grey suit with a deep pink blouse. We believe they are being tricked into leaving their homes 
possibly with the promise of a new and better life in the West. They're being brought into the country illegally and kept prisoner. Then something terrible is happening to them. We believe three women have died in this way in the last year. There could be many more. There could be more young women at risk even now. If you know anything at all that can help us, please get in touch. She has a natural authority, doesn't she? said Misen to Lacey. She does, agreed Lacey. How much of it is the clothes? They help, but I think it's also about knowing you're always going to be the brightest person in the room. A phone in Lacey's bag was ringing. Both women looked at each other. Then Misen's eyes went to Lacey's usual mobile, still and silent on the desk between them. They'd hoped the press conference would flush out Nadia Safi, encouraging her to make contact again with Lacey. They just hadn't expected it to happen so soon. Conscious of the room around her falling silent, Lacey found her phone. Number withheld, said the display screen, just as it had the last time Nadia had called. Hello? Do you still want to talk to me? Of course, Lacey nodded at her colleagues. You okay? Nadia hesitated, just for a moment. I'm fine. I saw the news just now. Is it true that three women have been killed? At least three. Something terrible is happening to young women just like you. Can you help us? Yes, said Nadia. I think I can. Chapter 66 Lacey Greenwich Park was languid, heavy with the weight of the summer's heat and over five hundred years of history. Flower stems in the ornamental beds seemed barely able to hold up their blooms. In running clothes, because what could be less conspicuous in Greenwich Park than a jogger, Lacey ran up the perimeter hill. As the slope levelled off, she slowed to get her breath and to give what breeze there was the chance to cool her off. Nadia, no longer wearing the burqa but the traditional Muslim shalwar kameez, with a headscarf around her dark hair, was waiting on the steps of the General Wolf statue. She was taller than Lacey remembered. The park below and around them was busy. Everywhere Lacey looked, people walked dogs, played with children, threw balls at each other or just lazed around on blankets. Nadia had told her to come alone and had promised to do the same. But in this wide-open, crowded space, there was no knowing one way or the other. Lacey certainly hadn't kept to her word. That would never have been allowed, and the park was liberally sprinkled with plain-clothed police officers. On the way up, she'd passed Stenning and Misen, sprawled on the grass, sharing a can of Diet Coke. An operations van in a nearby street was listening to every word she said via the wires inside her running vest. Lacey stopped a couple of feet from Nadia and let the drinking flask she'd been carrying drop to the ground. It rolled towards the other woman, who stooped, retrieved it, and handed it back to Lacey. Thanks. Lacey tucked it carefully back into the strap around her shoulders. They now had prints to compare against those already on the system. They would soon know for certain if this were the same woman who'd been arrested last October. As though neither knew how to begin, they turned to look at the view. The medieval deer park, a layer of white stucco regency splendour below, then a sliver of urban river, topped off with 21st century skyscrapers. At least up here it feels like there's some air, Lacey said to the Canary Wharf Tower. Nadia continued to stare ahead. She was older than Lacey remembered, and her skin had the fine lines of a face that had spent much time in the sun. We should keep moving. Nadia turned suddenly and moved away. It will be safer. Feeling a chill that had nothing to do with air movement, Lacey fell in step beside her as they set off east. What to ask first? Back in the van, Tulloch was uncharacteristically silent. The two women passed beneath a short canopy of trees, and suddenly the air around them was filled with sound. Leaves rustling, birds chattering and fighting, even the heavy scampering of a squirrel. Do you need any help? Lacey began. I know you're in this country illegally, but if you're the victim of crime, there are people who can help you. Ask me again later, said Nadia. What do you want to know? Can you tell me where you're from? Silence. 
I think you're from Afghanistan, said Lacey. I think, back home, someone offered to help you travel to the United Kingdom. I think you were probably told there'd be a job waiting for you, that you could earn good money and send it home to your family. If I'm wrong, it'd be really helpful if you told me so. Nadia was looking to her right, away from Lacey, at a tree so wide around the girth as to seem hardly younger than the park itself. Such old trees, she said. What are they? Do you know? Lacey didn't need to check. They're oaks. Most of the trees here are. It's a very old park. In my country, too, we have old trees. Nadia picked up the pace again. Importantly, she hadn't denied being from Afghanistan. I think they chose you because you have pale skin and eyes, and because you're beautiful. I think you're not the first and you won't be the last. But here's the tricky bit. I think some women like you who've been brought into this country have been killed. Lacey waited, giving Nadia time. The path had brought them to the prone form of the oldest tree in the park, and the only one to merit its own protective railing, the empty husk of Queen Elizabeth's oak. Nadia was looking at the sign in front. What does it say? It says that Henry VIII used to meet Anne Boleyn by this tree, said Lacey, before realising that the names would probably mean nothing to this girl. Henry was a very famous king of England. He was married, but fell in love with a young English girl called Anne. He stopped at nothing to make her his queen, but when she didn't give him a son, he turned against her. She was executed when she was just thirty-five years old. Did she have a daughter? Yes, said Lacey. Elizabeth. She became a very great queen. I had three daughters. Where are they? With their father. I haven't seen them for three years. Nadia turned back to the fallen tree. He killed her. She was a queen and he killed her. I thought this country was different. Lacey opened her mouth to point out that Henry and Anne had lived five hundred years ago and realised that to a woman who'd lost three children, half a millennium would be a detail. What happened to you, she said instead. Nadia pulled her scarf higher around her head. I married when I was fifteen, to the eldest son of a government official. It was an important marriage. I was told how lucky I was. I think I even believed it. At fifteen, you don't think much beyond having a good and kind husband. Lots of healthy children, earning the respect of your husband's family, do you? At fifteen, Lacey had thought of stealing cars, of driving them at speed around empty car parks at night, of torching them in the dock area of her hometown of the boys with their gelled hair and hungry eyes, of the lies she could tell her foster families, and very occasionally of what would happen to her when she was too old for local authority care. This woman and she probably weren't going to find much common ground. I guess girls are the same all over the world, she said. My first daughter was born less than a year later. Nadia reached out, without seeming to know what she was doing, tore the head off a tall, daisy-like flower. She began tearing petals off it and throwing them to the ground. Her hands were surprisingly large, calloused and tanned. My second, just over a year after that. My third, nearly two years later. Three beautiful, healthy girls. I was allowed to finish feeding my youngest before he divorced me and sent me back to my family. For having girls, a son's really so important. The remains of the flower were scrunched in Nadia's hand. You have no idea what it's like in my country. A family without sons has no security, no future. A family without sons is nothing. A woman without sons is worse than nothing. But you were young. You couldn't have been much more than twenty. You're obviously capable of producing healthy children. Why didn't you just try again? Nadia set off again quickly. Because my mother-in-law wanted to be rid of me. We have a custom in our land. When a girl is about to be married, her mother gives her a handkerchief, often embroidered, often with lace. It is very special, but I wasn't told what to do with it. That night, after my husband and I had been together, he looked for evidence that I'd been a virgin. Lacey thought for a moment. He looked for blood. Nadia nodded. There wasn't any. The sheets were clean. He was supposed to take the handkerchief, you see, to my family the next day as proof that they'd given him a pure bride. 
I was supposed to put it between my legs to collect the blood, but he couldn't do it, so I was disgraced. My family were broken by the news. My husband's family lost all respect for me. She turned, and for a second there was such fury in her cold, silver eyes that Lacey almost stepped away. I was fifteen. I never left home alone. I'd worn a burqa since my first period started. How could I not be a virgin? Not all women bleed when they lose their virginity, said Lacey. If I'd known what that handkerchief was for, how important it was, I'd have taken a knife into bed with me. I'd have cut myself without him knowing. I'd have made sure there was blood. My whole life depended on it, and my mother didn't even tell me what it was for. But you stayed together, said Lacey. You had children. If I'd had sons, I might have been forgiven. But my mother-in-law saw each girl as a sign that God was cursing me for my impurity. She told my husband he would never have sons while I was his wife, so I was sent back to my family. He took another wife. She gave him a son within the year. And your daughters stayed with him. Children in Islam belong to the father, but they will never be happy. He won't have the best food or new clothes like the children of his new wife. When they're old enough, they'll be married to unimportant men and will have no respect in their husbands' families. No one will love them. Yet here I am, on the other side of the world, and my love is slowly killing me. Finally, Nadia turned to look at Lacey properly. She was a beautiful woman, clearly an intelligent one, all but crushed by the oppressive culture she'd been born into. Just over a week ago, I found the body of a young woman in the Thames, said Lacey sensing an advantage. This morning, we found another woman just like her. We haven't been able to trace either of them, and that makes me think they came into the country illegally. The other night, I was out on patrol and we nearly caught a group of people coming up the Thames in a small, unlit boat, just like you did. The two girls and one of the men got away. I was hoping you might be able to tell me what's going on. As Nadia set off again, Lacey followed. The path was taking them lower, and Lacey caught the scent of roses, of dry earth and warm bark, as though the scents of the park were hovering close to the ground, like early mist. How did you know I was looking for you? Lacey asked. When you contacted me last time, who gave you my number? Nadia said nothing. Was it the men who brought you here? I don't want to put you in danger, Nadia. Look, come with me now. I can keep you safe. Nadia shook her head. I don't know whether they were involved in that or not. They said not. But I can't just disappear. I can't risk them hurting my daughters. Of course. It was how they controlled these women. Threats against the families back home. Whether the threat was real or not didn't matter. It only mattered that the women believed it. A crackling in Lacey's ear told her that D.I. Tullock was running low on patience. Why don't you tell me what you can, said Lacey. Start with what happened when you left the hostel. I was taken to a house, said Nadia. It was a large place, but I only really saw my room. They kept me there for a long time. Several months, I think, but it was hard to keep track. Lacey heard Dana catch her breath. What happened to you in those months? Nothing. They said I had to wait until the paperwork was ready, and until they'd made arrangements for my job. So I waited. I ate the food they gave me, watched television, slept a lot. It was dull. Not what any of them had expected to hear. They didn't hurt you in any way. Make you do anything you didn't want to. Nadia shook her head. I know what can happen to women like me. I know what a risk I took coming here. I'm one of the lucky ones. Were there other women in the house? I think so, but I didn't see any of them. I just heard voices from time to time. Occasionally someone shouting. I'm not sure everyone else was as patient as me. You were kept prisoner there. The other women too. I suppose so. I did ask to leave one day. They said I couldn't. That until the paperwork was sorted out, I'd be sent home. But I wasn't badly treated. When I got ill, they looked after me. I had doctors, nurses, medical treatment. You were ill? Yes, several weeks after I arrived there, they said it would delay my release. That no one would want to employ me unless I was healthy. The earpiece started crackling again, but Lacey was already there. Ill in what way? she asked. Nadia looked puzzled. I'm not sure. 
They said it was quite common for young women from my part of the world, that I just wasn't used to English food and water. English germs? They were right in a way. I did get better, and then I left. Lacey, try and find out where she was kept, Dana Tullock's voice whispered in her ear. It was dark when I was taken there, said Nadia, when Lacey asked her, and the same when I left. All I know is it was somewhere in London. The houses were tall. I couldn't find it again. Did your room have a window? Yes, but the glass was, I'm not sure what you would say, cloudy? Opaque, suggested Lacey. It lets light through, but you can't really see anything. We use it in bathrooms a lot. Yes, exactly, like bathroom glass. I knew there were other buildings close, and also I was quite close to the river. You can tell, can't you, when you're near water? There's a smell in the air, and boats sound different to cars. Did they take you there by water? A shadow appeared on Nadia's face. She let her head fall and rise in confirmation. They did, but if you want me to remember the journey, I really don't think I can. Anything you can tell us, anything at all. I'm sorry, but you have to understand how frightened I became of water after what happened to us. That night you pulled me from the river. I couldn't think about water without feeling as if I was going mad. That's understandable. It was a pretty terrifying experience. But not the first for me. Not the first time I nearly drowned. Lacey waited. Nadia seemed about to say more, then shook her head. It was years ago, she said. The details aren't important, but because of it, water terrified me. I know they took me to that house by water and brought me away by water, but I was so frightened both times I just kept my eyes down and my scarf around my head. Lacey felt a surge of disappointment. It was possible they transported the girls by water to disorientate them, to make it harder for them ever to explain where they'd been. If that was so, it had certainly succeeded in Nadia's case. You didn't look where you were going. Nadia was shaking her head. No, must have seen a few things, but when it was over I tried so hard to forget it all. I understand. Really, I do. But anything you do remember, anything at all, will be very useful to us. There was something else. Something I never really understood. What was that? There was a woman. She was outside, I think. I heard her through the window. A woman doing what? Singing, said Nadia. She used to sing to us. Chapter 67. Dana. Big house in Blackheath, ma'am. Barrett had just got back from tailing Nadia Safi to the place where she lived. In its own grounds with remote-controlled access gates. Okay, these are the options, said Dana. We can bring Nadia in, make her our responsibility, but if there's nothing more she can tell us about the people who brought her here or where she was kept, we could be putting her or her family at risk for no good reason. We can also bring in her current employers, see if we can find out who's supplying their illegal staff. But again, we risk putting the gang on full alert and not necessarily gaining much. Or we keep Nadia as a contact. She's given Lacey her number now, so at least we can get in touch if we need to. I honestly think she's told us all she can for now, said Lacey. Exactly, said Dana. For now. She may see one of the gang at the house. Something else could come up. I'd also really like her to give you a hair sample, Lacey. A hair sample? Yes. I want to find out what medication she was given while she was in the Riverside house. Has anyone here ever heard a real doctor talk about English germs? Silence while everyone thought about that. They could just have been trying to use language a new immigrant would understand, said Misen. Possibly, admitted Dana. But who were these doctors and nurses? Nobody pays house calls these days unless the patient's practically at death's door. And how come they weren't asking questions about these young women under house arrest? Not real doctors, said Lacey. They could have been anyone, giving her anything, said Dana. All the other girls in the house as well. Lacey, can you ask her for a hair sample? She can pop it in the post to us if she's worried about meeting you again. Lacey nodded, as Dana glanced at her phone. That was uniform, she said. The search of Deptford Creek and its surrounds begins at dawn tomorrow. If anyone's hiding out near the creek, we'll find them.
Chapter 68. Lacey. By six in the evening, the sun had lost much of its strength, but the ground seemed to be radiating back the heat it had absorbed during the day. Even Ray and Eileen's boat, with the benefit of the creek's breezes, had been unbearably hot, and it had been a huge relief to get off her bike and step inside the green shade of the Say's Court garden. The circular wrought-iron table she'd been shown to was on a raised deck to one side of the house. The surrounding buildings blocked the view of the river, but Lacey could see the treetops in the orchard across the creek. Tiny apples, pears and plums, as fresh and green as the miniature grapes on the vine growing overhead. Are you ready to tell us what's troubling you? Thessa gave Lacey that odd, sideways glance she liked to use a second after she'd thrown a difficult question her way, like a hand grenade. Tell her to mind her own business. Alex, approaching from the house, was carrying a large tray. You never know, it might work for you. Imagine when you work in the medical profession, other people's business inevitably becomes your own. Lacey smiled at Thessa. It's similar in the police, and then in social situations it becomes a little difficult to switch off. If that's your best attempt at a polite ticking off, it's not going to work. Alex put the tray down on the table. She's far too brazen to be warned off by subtleties. Help yourself. All cold, I'm afraid. We've both been working all day. But the bread is very fresh, and that brie looks like it's about to run off the plate. It looks great, said Lacey. It really was very kind of you to ask me over. And what's this we're drinking? There was an unopened bottle of Chablis on the table, condensation running down it like raindrops on a window. But Thessa had mixed another of her cordials, and given the heat of the evening, they'd started with that. Blackberry, said Thessa, with a few drops of truth serum. Do tuck in, Lacey. Alex passed her a plate, and just ignore her. Although I have to confess to being rather curious about the incident at Deptford Creek today. You saw it on the news? Thessa was out in that paddle boat of hers and saw the police on the river. I'm surprised one of you didn't run her under. She called me and I kept an eye on the local news for the rest of the day. Then you'll know we found a body, said Lacey. Not the first of its kind. There was another just over a week ago, one that I found when I was out swimming. You swim? Alex looked genuinely shocked. In the Thames? I did, admitted Lacey. Haven't since then. I'm thinking of giving it up completely. Yes, please do. No one should be swimming in that river. That's probably what happened to the two poor souls you and your colleagues found. If only. Lacey leaned forward and added bread, cheese and cold chicken to her plate. As she settled back, she caught Thessa glaring. What? Thessa's eyes went pointedly to the mixed salad in a carved wooden bowl. Silly me. Lacey leaned forward again. This is a work of art, Thessa. The salad was sprinkled with flowers, tiny cherry tomatoes, and small, jewel-like fruits and berries. Looks too good to eat. Nevertheless, Thessa watched, lips pursed until Lacey had loaded up her plate and begun the process of putting leaves in her mouth. You'd make a good mum. Lacey was wondering how much of the green stuff she had to force down before she could spread that rich, runny cheese over bread that looked as though it had been baked with walnuts. Of course, you could be already. I shouldn't assume. Silence fell like a shower of summer rain. The breeze from the river seemed to have changed direction. She couldn't hear the usual river sounds of traffic and waterfowl. Instead, there was a soft, almost musical sound, like water flowing. Can I hear a fountain? she asked, when the silence became uncomfortable. Yes, it's coming from Thessa's koi pond at the front, said Alex. There's quite a collection in there. And to answer your question, neither of us have children. Lacey kept the smile steady on her face. I married very briefly, not long after we arrived in the country, he continued. It didn't last long, and I wasn't inclined to try again. There's a bond, you see, between twins, said Thessa, especially identical ones, a closeness that I imagine anyone could find it difficult to break into. Alex's wife always felt like the odd one out, I think. It was on the tip of Lacey's tongue to ask whether they'd all three lived together in this house, and if they had, which of them really, honestly, had thought it would be a good idea. But you can't be identical, she said. 
Identical twins have to be of the same sex. Of course they do. I think my sister was just making a general remark. What about your family, Lacey? Where are they? This was why she didn't have friends. Friends asked questions to which there were no easy answers. Lacey stole a glance at Thessa, who was intent on the contents of her glass, but whose ears were practically flapping. I don't really have any family, she said. Thessa looked up. Everyone has a family, even us, although the chances of our ever laying eyes on any of them again are pretty slim. I was taken into care when I was quite young. When I grew up, I lost touch with my foster family, and I've no idea about my real one. There's just me, I'm afraid. Until you marry and have a family of your own, said Alex, which can't be very far away, I'd imagine. Yes, how is that young man of yours, said Thessa. Behaving himself any better, is he? Lacey smiled patiently. Oh, you'll tell us everything in time. They always do. They? My sister has pet projects, said Alex. Patience, usually. She won't rest until she's worn them down physically and spiritually with her combination of pills, cordials and relentless intrusion into their private lives. I consider myself warned, said Lacey. The young man in question works away a lot. He's away at the moment, and I've been rather surprised by how much I'm missing him. He'll be back, said Alex, unless he's a complete buffoon. Lacey smiled. Alex had fallen into the habit of paying her gentle compliments over the past couple of weeks. Normally, compliments from men meant a sexual interest that she was always very careful to guard against, but she never had that feeling from Alex. His compliments were always respectful. They were almost paternal. Yes, that was the word for it. It was something new in her experience. The unquestioning, unconditional approval of an older man. That's not all, though, is it? said Thessa. The sadness in you goes so much deeper than just missing your man. Lacey glanced at Alex, wondering if he were going to jump in again. But he was unusually silent. I was a detective, said Lacey, up until a couple of months ago. It was all I'd wanted to be since I was young. But this time last summer, I got involved in a very difficult case. I ended up right in the thick of it. After that, I was sent away on the job. It was supposed to be just routine surveillance, but it turned out to be anything but. I nearly died. She looked from Thessa to her brother. Two sets of large, dark blue eyes were unwavering. They were good listeners, these two. Too good. I came back to London on the verge of leaving the police for good, she said. I was a wreck, and the last thing I needed was another bad case, so of course that's exactly what I got. You weren't involved in the South Bank murders, were you? said Alex. Lacey nodded. Dear me, they were particularly distressing. I'll say, agreed Lacey. So I gave up my career as a detective and went back into uniform. I just want to patrol, uphold law and order on the river, help keep London safe. I know that sounds a bit cheesy, but it's all I can manage right now. So what went wrong? asked Alex. I found that body, a week ago, and as luck would have it, it wasn't a suicide or an accident. It was something much worse. Then this morning, another one popped up, practically on my doorstep. You can't be involved, surely, said Thessa. CID or special branch or the flying squad will handle it now. No prizes for guessing who gets her knowledge of police operations from the television, said Alex. The major investigation team at Lewisham are dealing with it, Lacey explained, but they have co-opted me back on the team because, like it or not, I seem to be involved. And that's a problem in itself, said Alex. Lacey nodded. I can't be involved, and I can't not be. As screwed up as that. Sorry to be so self-indulgent, it's really not like me. She looked pointedly at the jug of cordial. You weren't kidding about the truth serum, were you? You're a lot stronger than you think you are, said Thessa, without hesitation. Midsummer babies always are. I was born in December, said Lacey. I'm sure we've had this conversation. Whatever. The important thing is, you're not on your own. Not any more, anyway. You're quite right, you know. I would make a very good mum. Sometimes my sister is beyond ludicrous. Alex was shaking his head. Then he stopped, reached over, 
and gave Lacey's hand a quick, almost furtive pat. And sometimes her instincts are absolutely spot on. Chapter 69. Dana. So, how did it go? Dana looked up. In the reflection of the bedroom window, she and Helen made eye contact. Suddenly, stiflingly hot, Dana reached out and pulled the sash window open. The effort made her robe loosen. She waited for the breeze to cool her skin. It didn't come. Outside, the air was still and heavy. I lay on my back in a small cubicle with my knees in stirrups, and a nurse syringed the sperm of a complete stranger into my uterus, she replied. If I think about it too carefully, I feel the start of physical revulsion. The frown line between Helen's brows had deepened. Even feet away, reflected in the glass, Dana could see it, like a short, vertical scar on her partner's face. Did it hurt? A bit. Not as much as childbirth, I imagine. Helen was moving closer, but slowly, as though nervous of approaching too fast or too suddenly. It was unlike her, this sudden uncertainty. I guess a big case will help take your mind off things over the next couple of weeks. Outside, Dana could see a small brown bird on the lilac tree in the next garden. It started singing, a shrill, sweet sound of summer. Funny that against the background of one of the biggest, busiest cities on earth, against cars revving, horns sounding, people shouting, this tiny bird was the clearest thing she could hear except I can't help thinking this case is about pregnancy, she said. Lacey and the others suspect some twisted branch of the sex trade, but I'm less sure. No trace of that hormone, whatever it was, in the woman you found this morning, Helen reminded her. The bird was a song thrush, smaller than a blackbird, with creamy yellow breast feathers speckled with grey. It seemed to be singing directly at her now. Helen's eyes dropped to the spot just below Dana's waist, where the edges of her robe touched. Want me to bring a drink up? I shouldn't. Dana's hand went instinctively to her belly. Helen raised her eyebrows. Don't you think it's a bit soon to start acting the pregnant woman? Suddenly, inexplicably angry, Dana stepped closer to the window and looked down into the garden. The song thrush had gone. Just the sound of traffic now an aeroplane passing overhead, an argument in the garden next door, nothing out there as loud as the noise in her head. Yes, that wasn't the most sensitive thing to say right now. Helen had moved forward too, was directly behind her. Dana kept her eyes down. It's just not in my dour Scottish nature to count chickens before they're hatched. Helen never wore perfume, and yet somehow the smell of her skin and hair always made Dana think of summer mornings. Are you angry with me? Helen's breath tickled Dana's ear. Yes. Why? Dana took a deep breath. Because I have to spend hundreds of pounds and beg for help from total strangers who couldn't care less about me, not to mention suffering untold humiliation, just to get something that every other woman on the bloody planet takes for granted. I'm angry with you because you don't have balls. Behind her came the sound of a breath being taken and slowly released. I can think of a few guys in Dundee Nick who might take issue with that. Still, Dana didn't, couldn't look up. She'd had no idea how much rage was inside her. Children are supposed to be created out of love. Ours, if we're lucky enough to have any, will be conceived with a pair of stirrups and a syringe. From somewhere, a breeze had arrived. It crept its way inside Dana's robe, stroking her skin. No man ever loved his wife more than I love you, said Helen. I'd say the rest is just detail. As the breeze cooled Dana, she felt herself calming down. It had just been the heat. The heat and the frustration of a case she didn't believe she'd ever solve. She felt the tension in her body give way come tumbling down like the bricks in a child's tower. Either Helen had moved closer, or Dana had leaned back. She could feel the warmth of her partner's body through the cotton of her robe, and it felt good. The cool of the breeze, the warmth of Helen, and somewhere in between, maybe, just maybe, 
the start of something new and incredibly special, whatever unorthodox route it had taken to get here. Do you want to get married? Helen asked, her fingers brushing the side of Dana's neck. Dana held her breath, ran the words over again in her head, making sure they really were what she thought she'd heard, and then a giggle rose in her throat. Are you proposing? Well, someone's got to make an honest woman out of you. The robe was at her feet. Helen's fingers were running slowly up her right arm. Goosebumps responded immediately, turning her arms into a mass of pimples. Helen loved that, she knew, loved the feel of her dark hairs standing to attention. Sometimes she ran her hands over Dana's body, just close enough to touch the hairs. Sometimes she made love to her for long, long minutes before really touching her at all. She was three inches taller than Dana, just tall enough to have to bow her head to kiss the side of her neck. Yes, Dana said, closing her eyes. Let's get married. Chapter 70 Lacey Lacey said goodnight to Alex, and then, accompanied by Thessa, walked round to the front of the house, where a narrow path led through a small, neat garden to the high metal gates and perimeter brick walls. The cooling temperature had intensified the scents of the garden, the rich, heady perfume of old-fashioned roses and the strong sweetness of jasmine. Thessa had been chatting, her usual mix of local gossip, folklore and nonsense, pointing out plants and flowers, when she stopped her chair abruptly, just ahead of Lacey's bike. There! She was pointing towards the back of the flower bed, to the tall, spiked columns that grew against the wall. Blooming in your honour, aren't they beautiful? Lacey looked at the spears of blue, lilac and white flowers, standing proud amidst the mass of greenery and colour. They're delphiniums, aren't they? She smiled at Thessa's quizzical look. I like flowers. I used to hang around the flower market a lot when I lived in Kennington. Thessa looked politely impressed. Do you know their common name? Lacey didn't, but she could hazard a guess. Larkspur, by any chance? Good night, Thessa. Thank you for a lovely evening. She bent to kiss her friend on the cheek, the first time she'd ever done so, but at the last second, Thessa pulled back. I read up on that woman in Durham prison you were telling me about, dear. I didn't mean to pry, but I remembered the case and I was curious. It's all a matter of public record. Lacey straightened up and stepped back from Thessa, conscious of her chest suddenly constricting. It was a sad story, those poor girls. We don't concern ourselves too much with the why. Lacey picked up her bike and switched on both lights, although it wasn't nearly dark enough to need them. She bent to check the tyre pressure, although she'd never known it need attention. We leave that to the defence. And yet, being a why sort of person, I found myself deeply curious as to what would turn a perfectly normal girl into a killer. Thessa moved away, her chair crunching across the gravel. Lacey felt a moment of relief that was soon over. Thessa's wheels stopped turning. There was a particularly insightful feature in one of the Sunday papers. I don't know if you read it. Two sisters, brought up in care, subjected to a horrible attack one night, denied any level of justice. She'd positioned herself directly ahead of Lacey on the path. There was no getting past her. According to the story, the younger sister, Catherine, went completely off the rails, ran away from home, lived on the streets and then died in a river accident. She'd been living in a houseboat on the creek, not so very far from where you are now. Such a coincidence, I thought. Lacey tried to look up, got as far as the blue and lilac pointed columns of flowers. The older one couldn't get over her sister's death. Thessa was relentless. She spent years plotting her revenge. She turned herself into a killer, constructed an elaborate and deadly plan and put it into action. Killed four women. Nearly got a fifth, too, but she was caught. Does that just about sum it up? I knew Victoria Llewellyn a few years ago. Lacey had found her voice at last. We were friends for a while. That's why I was able to track her down. How I persuaded her to give herself up. It's why I've kept in touch. Yes. 
I gathered you were the unnamed young constable instrumental in her arrest. And I'd probably have left it at that if there hadn't been such a clear photograph of her accompanying the article. My dear girl, the resemblance is unmistakable. Lacey watched Thessa's strong brown hand reach out and break off a column of deep blue flowers. Resting her hands back on her lap, she began to twirl the stem in her fingers, and Lacey wondered if she'd ever be able to smell garden flowers again without feeling sick. I simply couldn't understand why nobody else has spotted it. But as Alex is fond of pointing out, not everyone sees what I see. Surprise gave Lacey the ability to make eye contact. You've discussed this with Alex? For a second, the shine in Thessa's eyes grew dull. No. These days, Alex and I have more secrets from each other than I'd have once thought possible. And that's why you dress the way you do, isn't it? Hiding under those ugly baggy clothes. Why you never wear makeup and always keep your hair tied back. Do you wear sunglasses when you go to see her? So that no one will spot that your eyes and hers are identical? She had to get a grip, put a stop to this once and for all. You have quite an imagination, Thessa. And that's a very entertaining theory, but Catherine Clewellyn is dead. Yes, yes, very clever. But someone who swims the way you do would have no problem surviving a river accident. I'm not Catherine Clewellyn. Seeing no alternative, Lacey picked up her bike, stepped into a flower bed, and strode round Thessa. A rose thorn tore into her bare leg. She ignored it, put her bike down, and pushed it along the gravel, making more noise than was necessary. I know you're not, dear. I did a bit more digging, you see. I found the girl's birthdays. Catherine was a Valentine baby, born on 14th of February. Thessa was having to raise her voice now, as Lacey was almost at the gate. Victoria, on the other hand, when do you think she was born? She reached the gate. She pushed it open with one hand. The 9th of July. Thessa's voice came drifting towards her like the tendrils of a poisonous plant. Midsummer, her birth flower is the larkspur. Tuesday, 1st of July. Chapter 71. Lacey and the Swimmer. Josebury was gone. The cabin he'd been sleeping in was empty, with no trace, not even a lingering scent that he'd ever been in it. It was stupid to be disappointed, really better by far that he'd gone. By tomorrow night, Deptford Creek would be crawling with undercover police officers. In the morning, the Met would begin a systematic search of all the creekside properties. Lacey switched off the torch and let the faint light from the stars guide her back up on deck. For a moment, she stood in the shadow of the wheelhouse. Back at the theatre arm, all looked still. There was a uniformed constable in the main cabin of Ray and Eileen's boat, another on Lacey's own boat. It hadn't been easy to creep out of the hatch above her borrowed bunk, cross the boat without making any sound, and climb down to where she'd left her canoe, ready for a quick getaway. There were police officers in the yard, too, but she'd dressed in black and was pretty certain no one had seen her. It had been a risk, just one that had felt worth taking. Except he'd already gone. Suddenly weak, she sank down onto the deck of the dredger and laid her aching head against the cold metal wall of the wheelhouse. She simply hadn't allowed herself to think about how much she'd wanted to see Josebury until she discovered it was impossible. And now the trembling that she'd managed to keep at bay since she'd left Say's court was creeping up on her. For so long she'd thought Josebury would be her nemesis, the one who would drag her secrets to the surface and blow apart her carefully constructed life. How had she not seen the real danger? She had to get back. Lacey pulled herself to her feet and set off towards the stern of the dredger. The creek was different tonight. It had its moods, like the Thames, like any living thing, and the only word Lacey could think of to describe its present one was fractious. The minor currents were odd, for one thing. There were more of them, some seeming to run completely against the tide. At one point on the way over, she'd felt herself being pushed downstream. 
Closer to the bank, there had been small whirlpools and eddies. Light. A sudden flash of a torch beam across the channel, roughly beneath the old power station. Lacey stopped in mid-stride. It could have been a reflection, a light from a boat on the main river bouncing off the steel plating of the creek walls. Somehow, though, it had seemed too bright for that. There it was again. Definitely a torch. The beam probably couldn't reach her here, but even so, Lacey kept very still. It was at water level, probably in a boat. Back in her canoe, Lacey let grumpy little waves smack hard against the hull while she tried to decide what to do. She had a mobile phone, police radio, a camera and binoculars in the small waterproof bag between her shoulder blades. A light on the creek at this hour was worth checking out, surely. Maybe just get a bit closer? She loosened the rope and began paddling, keeping close to the bank. At Dal's Wharf, a small inlet offered shelter and a mooring ring. Holding the canoe still in the water with the paddle, she tied herself up. The walls here were the highest along the creek, rising up yards above her, cutting out all light. On the other hand, they were protecting her from the wind and the rougher waves. The water moved more slowly in here, seeming almost still in comparison with the swift flow in the main channel. It was a good place to lie in wait. The swimmer looked towards the boat. It was close now, too close to risk the torch again. Had Lacey seen the light or not? Surely she had, or she'd have gone back to the marina, not be hiding up in that tiny inlet, barely visible against the dark of the bank. Oh, she was a creature of the river all right, whether swimming or in that little boat of hers. She moved around silently at speed. Nothing more to be done. Lacey would either see the boat or not. If she did, she would follow it. And if she followed it, she wouldn't be the only one. The swimmer started breathing heavily, taking on more and more oxygen, getting closer to the point of hyperventilation, knowing that a fast, hard swim was coming and determined to be ready. All around Lacey there was noise, the incessant drone of London, but after a few seconds it became surprisingly easy to tune out, to hear instead the sounds of the river. The low, constant grumble of water moving between high, hard walls, the swirling, splashing and sucking as the current hit the bricks just in front of her before bouncing away again. The tiny waves that smacked against the hull of her canoe and the scuttling of creatures around her. One such, mistaking the smooth hull of the boat for the river wall, climbed up and started clack clacking towards her. Lacey knocked it back into the water with the paddle. It might be some time before she felt comfortable around mitten crabs. Slowly, she raised her binoculars and immediately saw the boat. Small, wooden framed, with a modest outboard engine. Two, maybe three passengers. No movement of water around the engine. One man at the stern was looking out towards the Thames, another at the bow holding on to the river wall to keep them in place. The third passenger sat in the middle, a scarf wrapped around her head. Hardly daring to move, but knowing she had to, Lacey reached into her shoulder pack and tapped out a message on her phone. Urgent assistance needed. Where are you? Her usual crew would be on duty on the river right now. Finn Turner always kept his phone close, in case one of his numerous girlfriends tried to get in touch. Then a reply came in. Not far from your place. What's up? The small boat was moving. Possible illegal immigrants in Deptford Creek. Two males, one female. Small motorboat heading out to Thames now. Can you intercept? That would have to do. Lacey cast off and began to follow. The boat, about ten yards in front, turned the bend and went out of sight. Lacey paddled hard, and in another second had turned the same bend. The boat had vanished. No sign of her colleagues. Nothing on her phone. Lacey sped towards the mouth of the creek, keeping close to the left bank. She hit the Thames, and in spite of all her experience on the water, had to fight hard not to give way to panic. The full force of the tide swept her up, pushing her on towards the city, and the river seemed so much wider in the dark. She could barely see the north bank. But there was the boat, about fifteen yards in front. Sometimes it was just all about muscle. 
head down and paddle. They were using their engine again, but slowly, hugging the shoreline, slinking in and out of the shadows. They probably weren't going much faster than she, but she'd tire soon. Where the hell were Fred and Finn? Then, almost from nowhere, came the sound of engines so loud she thought she was about to be run over. A large boat was heading straight for her, lights shining out like beacons. Lacey grabbed her own light and switched it on, then began paddling hard out of the way. This is the Metropolitan Police. Stay exactly where you are. The sergeant's voice. The target was almost level. She could see him at the flybridge, the lanky form of Turner on the port side. Another officer in the cockpit. As the boat drew level, Turner's eyes caught hers for a second. Then they'd gone past, gaining on the small motorboat. Cut your engines and wait for us to reach you. Do not attempt to get away. The wash from the Targa's engines reached her, picking her canoe up and spinning it round. She paddled hard to correct it, but the second wave hit her and she almost went over. Her phone fell into the bottom of the canoe. Ahead, the Targa was lighting up the river. They'd picked out the small boat, were gaining on it easily. They'd look for her just as soon as they could, but she wouldn't be their priority. Okay, what were her options? She was more or less opposite the entrance to South Dock Marina. Conscious of getting tired, Knowing it would be a safer place to wait, Lacey paddled over and tucked herself in the lee of the nearest yacht, a 40-foot moody. Then she found her radio. Constable Flint requesting urgent assistance, she managed, a split second before the world turned upside down. This was it, the swimmer knew. This was the moment. Such a chance would not come again. Lacey was below the surface. She had to be found quickly before she had a chance to get her bearings. Speed and courage were needed now. Lacey was strong and fast. The swimmer had to be stronger. Lacey was beneath the surface, trapped inside the canoe. She forced her mouth shut and swung her body to one side. The canoe wasn't moving. She was stuck upside down in the water. What the hell had happened? Again, she swung herself to one side. She had to get out. She was still holding the paddle, Keeping it in her right hand, she pushed herself free with her left. For a second, after breaking the surface, she could do nothing but gulp in air and spit out water. The canoe was just out of reach, still upside down. Lacey looked round quickly. No one in sight. Still clutching the paddle, she began swimming towards the canoe. But as she reached out, the smooth fiberglass hull bounced away. Then something was dragging her down. Lacey went below the surface in an instant, with no breath in her lungs. She kicked down and broke free, but immediately was grabbed around the shoulders. Survival instinct kicked in. Lacey twisted, struck out with the paddle and her free fist. Her buoyancy aid was pulling her towards the surface, the weight clinging to her legs trying to get her down. There was light in the water. The torch had fallen from the canoe, was sinking to the bottom, illuminating the riverbed, which seemed alive with mitten crabs, and the linen-wrapped corpses on the marina floor. She broke the surface again, bracing herself for the next attack. Nothing. No face bearing down on her. No wiry arms reaching out. She was, or appeared to be, completely alone. From out on the main river came the sound of an engine. If one of the marine unit boats was looking for her, they wouldn't think to come in here and she no longer had a phone or radio. The sound was fading again. Without stopping to think... Lacey abandoned her paddle and set off in a fast crawl towards the Thames. Her canoe had disappeared. She just had her buoyancy aid to keep her afloat. But spending another moment near whatever had attacked her was impossible. She would have to take her chances in the river. How long had she been in the water? Five minutes? An hour? She'd cheated the river once, which meant she couldn't ever drown. Claptrap Thessa had said, Of course you can drown. Don't take silly risks. She was getting colder and slowing down. She was no longer sure she could feel her feet and the tips of her fingers were going numb. The buoyancy aid was keeping her head above water, but the waves were bouncing into her face and every few seconds she dipped below the surface again. The massive circular edge of the landing stage that marked the entrance to the creek was in sight, gleaming like a beacon in the moonlight. It had the look of a prehistoric temple, of a wooden henge rising out of the water. Why was it suddenly so much harder to concentrate? Why were her thoughts drifting off in random directions? 
The targa was coming back. Impossible to mistake that high-pitched drone. And this time it was looking for her, no doubt about it. Travelling slowly, but relentlessly, the flashlight in the bow sweeping left and right in the water. The beam settled on her face, blinding her, but getting out of the water was all she could think of right now. The boat drew closer. The buoyancy aid tightened around her chest, and she felt herself being lifted. The water was falling away. She could see it swirling beneath her. A second later, she was on the hard, cold deck of the boat, conscious only that it felt good to breathe freely, and that the man who held her was warm. Look, Sarge, Finn Turner's voice was gleeful. I caught a mermaid. Chapter 72, Dana. The divers are back up, Chief Inspector Cook told Dana as he put the phone down. They're pretty certain there are two bodies, wrapped like the other two we found and weighted down at the neck, waist and ankles. Three hours after the arrest of the two suspected people traffickers and their human cargo of one, two and a half hours after the frantic search to find the body, alive or dead, and frankly either would do, of Constable Bloody Flint, Dana had assembled her team at the station. SCO7, the specialist division that dealt with people trafficking, had been informed and had agreed to her retaining operational control for now. Two more corpses. Together with the two Lacey had found, and the one pulled out of the river weeks ago, she had five dead women. It would be getting light soon. The search of the marina bed had been conducted in darkness, which might now prove to be no bad thing. How secure are they? she asked. What? Cook's heavily lidded eyes seemed sleepier than usual. Are they going anywhere in a hurry? I really don't think I want to know what's on your mind, Cook said. And far be it for me to tell you your job, but shouldn't you be cording off that marina and getting started on the boat-to-boat -boat search? Yes, she probably should. That would be doing it by the book, and if in doubt, one always did it by the book. Except... Dana turned to where Lacey was sitting quietly in the corner of the room. She wore borrowed clothes, and her hair had dried in long, stringy tendrils. She'd managed to get hold of a laptop, and her attention was fixed on the screen. Dana raised her voice. OK, thanks to PC Flint and her unfailing disregard for procedures, we appear to have found the body stash. What we can't necessarily assume is that we've also found the centre of the operation. I'm not following, said Cook, and I hope you realise there's a limit to how long I can leave a couple of corpses bobbing around in South Dock Marina. Dana glanced at the clock again. Time seemed to have speeded up. Dave, the suspects your officers arrested tonight, thanks to PC Flint and her unauthorised stakeout, may not have been heading for the marina. Who hides bodies within yards of where they're being killed? Fred and Rosemary West, said Barrett. Yeah, thanks, Tom. But if you have a yacht, how likely is it that you'll dump a body over the side in the marina? You wouldn't. You'd take it out into the middle of the channel, or closer to the estuary. I'm not sure our gang have any real connections with the marina, other than using it to store bodies. Also, added Lacey, anyone with half a brain would realise there are CCTV cameras around the marina, and all the berth holders will be known and registered. It's just too big a risk. Not everyone's approach to risk is as cautious as I'd like, Lacey, but I take your point. I think they're transporting the bodies around in a small boat, said Lacey. Something that can sneak past the cameras at the riverside entrance. A boat that may have no connection to the South Dock Marina. Well, I suppose that does make some sense, Cook grudgingly admitted. If they're using a small boat, maybe one with a small engine, they won't want to risk motoring out to the centre of the channel. The tide's too strong and there's too big a risk of being mown down in the shipping channel. So, said Cook, if they can't dump the bodies in the middle, which would be the ideal place for them, they need another area of deep water that isn't affected by tides. Lacey sat back. Marinas. Cook rubbed his eyes. Being dragged from his bed in the middle of the night didn't suit him. God help us if we have to search every dock and marina in the city. I don't think we will, sir, said Lacey. Small boat, remember? They're not travelling far. And there's another thing. Look what I found. She turned the laptop round to face the rest of the group. They were looking at the website of one of the natural history publications, 
a feature on Chinese mitten crabs. This was in The Ecologist. It seems they're a particular nuisance around marinas, possibly because edible rubbish thrown from boats encourages the little wriggly things that they eat. Anyway, they're a notorious problem at South Dock Marina. I think the crab business was a bit of a game on the part of my stalker. You know, throwing a clue in our faces and seeing how long it took us to work it out. The toy boats, too. Where'd you find a lot of boats together? A marina? Around Lacey, heads were nodding. I think South Dock Marina is where the bodies are dumped, and the holding facility, whatever it is, will be somewhere nearby, she went on. We're closing in. Which brings us to the problem, said Dana. Once it gets out that we found two more bodies and arrested the three in the boat tonight, the operation will close down or move on. We'll never find who's doing this. Cook sat down heavily. I can't do it, Dana. We'll have been spotted there tonight. People will start asking questions. We'll have the press down there before you know it. And that's before we get on to the fact that Lacey was attacked there and only just escaped with her life. More by sheer luck than operational competence, snapped Dana. Lacey gave her a weak smile. My point is... The door to the meeting room opened and Stenning and Anderson entered. The girl still isn't talking, Anderson said. The interpreters tried both main Afghan languages and a couple of dialects and got nothing out of her. We can try other languages in the morning, but frankly, she could be from anywhere in the Middle East. She's a Pashtun, said Lacey, picking up the photograph again, just like the others. Dana found herself nodding. Even the standard police mugshot couldn't disguise the girl's appeal. She was striking, with fair, almost European skin, bright blue eyes and dark brown hair. She looks quite a lot like you with your Bollywood makeover. Meisen turned the photograph towards her. Neither of the two men are saying anything either yet, said Stenning, although both of them do have some knowledge of English. What's pretty obvious is that they're scared. Will they talk, do you think? asked Cook. Probably, said Stenning, but I can't see them being major players. They can probably tell us where they were going to take the girl, but other than that... That's something in itself, though, said Anderson. We get a warrant, a dawn raid should throw up something, in which case we need to get moving. Once it's known that these guys have been picked up, they'll start covering the tracks. Except if Nadia was telling the truth. Nothing illegal happened to her while she was with these people, said Lacey. She was looked after, given a nice room and plenty of food, medical attention when she got ill, and then the job that she'd been promised. So if we raid the place, wherever it is, and we come up with nothing, that's it, said Dana. We might get some minor convictions for people smuggling. The operation will move somewhere else and we'll never know what was going on. People smuggling is hardly a minor offence, Cook looked offended. It's not murder, though, said Dana. Lacey's right. We're no nearer knowing what they're doing to these women and why some of them are dying. Pity we can't let them go ahead and put a bug on her, said Stenning. Yeah, that'll work. Anderson stifled a yawn. It might. Misen was still looking at the photograph of the girl from the boat. How old would you say she is? Difficult to tell. Stenning leaned over her shoulder. Late teens, early twenties. She's about five foot four, right? Said Misen. Weighs about eight and a half stone. What's on your mind, Gail? Said Dana. Whoever picked her out back in Afghanistan, or wherever, wouldn't have sent a photograph through, would they? Said Misen. They won't want any sort of paper trail. I bet whoever is expecting her was just told it would be a young, good-looking girl. Dark hair, light eyes. If you're suggesting we send someone in undercover, we'll never get it organised in time, said Dana. I can talk to SO10 tonight, but the chances of them having a young Asian officer available are practically non-existent. So you're saying we'll never find a young, dark-haired female officer with light-coloured eyes and experience of working undercover at short notice, said Misen. Suddenly, every eye in the room was on Lacey. Chapter 73 Lacey It felt to Lacey as though she was the only person in the room capable of being still, of remaining silent. Everyone else was fidgeting, talking too fast, too loud, all at the same time. Tullock was on her feet, striding from one side of the room to the other, the way she invariably did when she was stressed. I'm not risking the life of an officer on a half-baked, ill-considered, reckless operation, she announced. We're not discussing it any further. 
No disrespect, ma'am, said Misen, but there's no harm in considering every possibility. Lacey can pass for one of these women. She already has. She's convinced half the occupants of the old Kent Road the other night. If Mr Cook can give us 24 hours before he brings those bodies up, it might just be enough. Enough, thought Lacey. It wasn't enough, then, that she'd had corpses strewn in her way, strung up from her boat. It wasn't enough that someone had wanted her to be the next one. Funny how she hadn't been able to see that until now. Tullock was leaning against the far wall, her arms folded, glowering. Anderson had the floor. I'm not saying I agree with Gail, but presumably SO10 can fit us out with surveillance equipment. We'll know where she is at all times. The minute she's worried, we can pull her out. Cook held up one arm to get attention. I definitely don't agree. Lacey's my officer and my responsibility when all's said and done. But just for the sake of argument, we can put teams on the river in unmarked vessels. We can be seconds away from her all the time she's in there. And not saying I think it's wise, it's too rushed. They were going to let her do it, Lacey realised. This was noise, bluster. They were going through the motions. But when it came to it, they didn't have another option. Exactly, snapped Tullock. And how will we get the two men to play ball? Offer them a deal, said Misen. They make a phone call now to whoever they were due to meet, saying they were held up and they'll try again tomorrow. Tomorrow night, with a close but discreet police escort, they take Lacey and hand her over. Then they come back into custody until the operation is over. In return for their cooperation and for testifying, they get lenient treatment. All they have to do is wink or pass a note and Lacey ends up at the bottom of the Thames, said Tullock. Like she hadn't been there before. Hello, Riverbed. Looks like you won after all. If there's any winking or note passing, we get her out of there, Misen was arguing. We'll practically be camped out on her doorstep. Look, I'm not saying it's ideal, but it might be the best chance we have. And there was that brief moment of silence, as though she'd ordered it. Gail's right, said Lacey. It is our only chance. You all know it. You just don't want to ask me to do it. Do you speak Pashto? said Tullock, eyebrows raised. Or Dari? There are forty languages in Afghanistan, said Lacey. What are the chances of the reception party being fluent in all of them? Not that I'm saying it's a good idea, you understand. Well, I'm glad we're agreed on something, said Tullock. Because even if you idiots can talk me into it, Weaver will never agree. Can I talk to her? The girl we picked up tonight? Can I have some time with her? Why? To work on your cover story. It's not happening, Lacey. I'd like to talk to her without the interpreter and the solicitor. Just her and me. No, that would be highly irregular. Lacey sighed. She hasn't requested a solicitor, ma'am, and she hasn't even acknowledged the interpreter. There's no reason why we shouldn't ask them to leave. Gail can come in with me if you don't want me to be alone. Lacey, I know, ma'am. We all think it's a bad idea, so we need to find out what we can while we can. Oh, do what you bloody well want. I give up. I think you can understand me. Gail was right, Lacey thought. She and the girl across the table did look alike. The other girl was probably younger, but spending more time outdoors in extreme temperatures had coarsened her face. Her hair was long and dark brown, her eyebrows finely drawn, and her eyes the colour of cornflowers, just as their freshness starts to fade. They'd had her move to the family room, a more relaxed space than the interview rooms, a space where they normally interview children or vulnerable people. I think you're from Afghanistan. The girl looked steadily back at Lacey, almost without blinking. And that you were told there would be a job for you here, maybe looking after children or helping a rich Western woman with the housework. You expected to be able to send money home to your family, so you must be able to speak some English or you'd never have considered coming. Lacey waited for any sort of reaction. The other woman's eyes dropped to the untouched mug of coffee on the table. Lacey glanced to one side and got a reassuring nod from Gail. I think your journey here took a long time, she said, that it became uncomfortable, maybe even frightening. I think you began to wonder if you'd made a mistake, but you were told it was too late to change your mind. I think the men who were bringing you here changed. They started to threaten instead of persuade. They told you that you had no choice, that your family would suffer if you made trouble. I think you're probably terrified right now. She waited again, looking for something, anything in those blue eyes. 
Okay, time to step it up a bit. Lacey opened the folder in front of her and turned it so the girl could see the photograph of Nadia Safi. What I need you to understand is that you're actually very lucky. Blue eyes darted down and lost interest. She'd clearly never seen Nadia before. This is Nadia Safi, said Lacey. She was very lucky too. She arrived in England last summer, from Afghanistan like you. She's working with the family in London now. Of course, she could be sent home at any time because she's still here illegally. She's probably little more than a slave, but no one hurts her. She has food, somewhere to live. She's a lucky one. The girl was looking bored now. Lacey opened the folder again and pulled out two more photographs, laying them face down on the desk. She turned the first over. We call this girl Sahar. This is what we think she looked like when she was alive. She turned the other photograph. This is what she looked like when we pulled her out of the river. She wasn't so lucky. The girl had looked quickly at the photographs. The shock on her face had been genuine. The eyes were down now, fixed on the tabletop. I'm sorry to upset you, but you need to understand how serious this is. Lacey took out a photograph taken at the last post-mortem, of the corpse found strung up on Lacey's boat. Then another, taken from the marine unit files, of the woman pulled from near the South Dock Marina two months previously. Three dead women, all your age, all from your country, all brought into the UK just as you were, all exactly like you. So here's where we make a decision. When you leave police custody and go into the United Kingdom's immigration system, the men who brought you here, the men who are doing this, will find you again. They found Nadia and they'll find you. You're too valuable to them to let go. You may be one of the lucky ones, like Nadia, or you may not. Lacey, said Gail, I'm really not sure she understands the word you're saying. Oh, I think she understands just about every word I'm saying. Lacey didn't take her eyes off the girl. But I'll slow down, because this next bit is important. In a few hours, I'm going to take your place. I'm going to wear clothes just like yours. I'm going to let the men who brought you here take me to where they were going to take you. I'm going to pretend to be a young, terrified woman from Afghanistan. Only I won't have to pretend to be terrified. That will be for real. We call it undercover work. I'm going to put myself in danger because I don't want any more girls from your country to die. That's what I'm going to do. How about you? She waited. Girl held eye contact steadily. Lacey could hear Gail breathing at her side. She gathered together the photographs and stood up. Interview terminated at 04.23 hours. She went to switch off the recording equipment. You haven't asked me anything, said a voice from behind her. All you've done is talk at me. If there's something you want to know, ask me. Chapter 74. Dana. Dana pulled the photograph of the three dead women up on the screen of her laptop. We're going to charge you with murder, she told the dark-skinned young man across the table. We have three bodies of illegal immigrants. We have contacts in Afghanistan. We're going to find out who these women were, and we're going to trace them to you. More importantly, we have a woman who was brought in last year who didn't end up at the bottom of the Thames. She can identify you. The man sat stony-faced, not reacting. Beneath the table was a different matter. His left leg was vibrating with nervous energy. It was making the whole side of his body shake. You'll probably serve thirty years, she said. Your friend, on the other hand, will get off lightly, because he's cooperating. Just the hint of a glower beneath those heavy brows. He's talking to my sergeant right now. I wouldn't be surprised if he's already told them where you picked the girl up and where you were heading tonight. She reached out and picked up her phone. The screen was empty, but he couldn't see that. My sergeant wants to see me, she said. I think it must be over. We need someone to help us with an operation, but we only need one of you. It'll be the one we trust the most, the one who's cooperated. She got up and closed her laptop. What do you want to know? asked the man. It isn't happening, Lacey, said Dana when she and the team were once more in the meeting room. You may have taken maverick operations to a whole new level, but I don't take foolish risks with the lives of fellow officers. Your suntan is clearly fake, your hair is obviously dyed, and your skin is classic English rose. And just in case you'd forgotten, whoever is killing these women knows who you are. They tried to drown you earlier. 
All I'd be doing by sending you in is making it easier for them. Here's Lacey. I've gift-wrapped her for you. You know what? I'm actually tempted. If we let this chance go, we'll never get another one, said Lacey. I know that, said Dana. Which is why, against all my better judgment, I'm going to agree. It was as though someone had poured ice-cold water over the girl. Dana watched, half amused. Lacey liked to talk tough. She was exceptionally brave and would do it, no doubt at all. But she'd been badly scared recently. Scratch the bravado, and terror was only just beneath the surface. Dana watched her reach out for a coffee mug that was long since empty with a trembling hand. She drew it back quickly before anyone could see, and Dana was suddenly reminded of why she liked this young woman so much, why her best friend had fallen in love with her. Right, Addison jumped to his feet. He was ashen. He too liked Lacey. We'd better get moving. I've got someone from SO10 coming over to talk us through what to expect. Lacey, you sure about this? Because if you're not, keep your knickers on, Neil, said Dana. Lacey isn't going undercover. I am. Chapter 75 Dana and Lacey They waited for the tide. It had to be high, the two men had explained. Plenty of water, but not flowing too fast. At a little-used jetty on the south bank, just east of Greenwich, Amil climbed into the boat first and stepped to the front. He was the younger of the two men, the muscle. Rashid was at the tiller. Dana stepped in last. Only one member of the marine unit, Sergeant Wilson, wearing jeans and a sweater, had accompanied them down to the jetty. Fred looked as unhappy about the job as everyone else. He'd squeezed Dana's shoulder just before she'd climbed down but as the engine fired up at the second attempt, he couldn't manage more than a tight-lipped smile. They left the bank behind, and Dana turned away from the still figure of Fred on the jetty, knowing that finally, the reality of what she was doing was about to hit home. There had hardly been time to think over the last few hours. Maya, the girl they'd picked up the night before, had given her the rudiments of a cover story. She was twenty-five years old, a childless widow from Takar province, his dead husband's family had refused to care for her. They'd sent her back to her own family, who hadn't been too keen on the idea either. With her future in Afghanistan looking bleak, she'd jumped at the chance of a new life in the West. As a young girl, she'd spent several years in school before the Taliban had clamped down on female education, hence her rudimentary knowledge of English. The clothes Lacey had bought for her trip along the old Kent Road, cotton trousers, tunic and headscarf, had been pronounced perfectly acceptable by Maya. She'd even offered advice on the simple cotton underwear women from Afghanistan favoured. In the canvas bag at Dana's feet were her possessions, based on what Maya had had in her own bag. Lacey had spent the day in Brick Lane, doing her best to replicate them, and had found a change of clothes, some simple toiletries with Eastern labelling, and photographs of Dana's supposed family back home. Dana had also spent time with a detective sergeant from SCD-10, who'd come over to give her some tips on how to behave. He'd set a time limit of 24 hours maximum on the operation, a timescale David Cook had reluctantly agreed to. Any longer, the sergeant had said, would expose her to unnecessary risks. 24 hours hadn't seemed long back at Lewisham, but now, just a few minutes into the operation, it was a different story. She hadn't told Helen. Helen was back in Dundee, and wouldn't necessarily think it odd if she didn't hear from Dana for a day. Helen would have argued that it was foolish, too great a risk, that Dana was neither trained in undercover work nor properly prepared for the operation. She'd have been right. Fighting off a sudden urge to panic, Dana turned to look back over Rashid's shoulder. Fred had disappeared, but somewhere in the gloom of the river was an unmarked rib, staffed by officers from the Marine Unit and an armed sergeant from SO10. In a few hours, they'd be replaced by another identical unit, and then later by a third, each working an eight-hour shift. They were her protection. They wouldn't go more than a hundred metres from her until she was safely back with them. If she pressed her panic button, they'd be the first to respond. It would have been good to be able to see them, just to know they were definitely there, but that was impossible. It was all about trust going undercover, the sergeant had told her. You had to trust your backup was there. She did trust Neil, in charge of the operation in her absence, 
She trusted David Cook and his officers. But how Mark had done this for the last ten years was beyond her. Across the river, close to the north bank, would be the Targa, that was currently the command centre of the operation, although that would move back to Lewisham as the night wore on. Every available craft belonging to the marine unit was out on the river tonight, with a specific instruction to stay well clear of Deptford, but to be ready to respond if necessary. She was as safe as it was possible to be, and it was about time she started feeling that way. Around her neck was a cheap-looking metal locket that appeared to be sealed shut. It was particularly important that no one succeeded in opening it, because it concealed a tracking device. As long as she wore it, her colleagues would know where she was. If the plan went wrong, she had to open the locket and break the device. That would be the signal to get her out. She wasn't wired. They discussed bugging her and it had been considered too risky. Amil and Rashid both were, though, and as long as she was with them, anything she or they said would be heard by the surveillance team. They were passing Greenwich now, hugging the south bank. She couldn't imagine how Maya and the others had felt on this cold, massive river, with no idea of where they were heading or what would be waiting for them, without even the most basic protection of the life jackets that Cook had absolutely insisted that she and the men wear. If I lose you in the river, that's my job and my pension, he told her, when she tried to argue that it might make the reception committee suspicious. This is not negotiable. Dana had taken one look at his face and realised it probably wasn't. Chugging along now, watching waves break over the bow, realising how low in the water she was, she was glad he'd put his foot down. The huge circular structure that marked the entrance to Deptford Creek was getting closer. She could see the differing flow in the river as the creek water hit the Thames. She wrapped the headscarf closer to her head as they went on. They couldn't be too far away now. So far, the two men had done exactly what they'd been told. The tricky part would be when they arrived. She'd watch them closely. Any sign at all that they were trying to alert others to the police surveillance and her instructions had been clear. To break the tracking device, get her head down and wait for rescue. They were slowing down. We go in here, said Rashid behind her. That says Creek said Lacey on the control boat. I know that piece of water. It's very narrow. There's only one turning point, about a quarter of a mile up, near a big house called Say's Court. On the computer monitor, they watched the red dot that was Dana move up the narrow creek. The small boat went the full length, turned outside Say's Court, and then set off back again, Dana still on board. About a hundred yards from the entrance to the Thames, the boat stopped moving. They'd moored up. Thank you, they heard Dana saying over the wires attached to her two escorts. Goodbye. Be quiet, a woman's voice answered. People are asleep. She's going in, said Anderson. Dana was led up the narrow, concrete river steps and inside the building. She heard the boat engine firing up and glanced back. Amil and Rashid were at the entrance to the creek. A second later, she was inside and the door closed behind her. A dimly lit corridor painted a pale beige colour. Two doors on the left. At the end of the corridor, stairs going up. Outside, she'd counted four floors, including one that seemed to be slightly below the waterline. A tall, narrow building. So far, so good. Outside, the crew on the river would already be in touch with their colleagues on land. They'd put an unmarked car in the street outside. They'd use thermal imaging equipment to find out how many people were in the building. They'd think about accessing the building on either side to see if listening devices could be implanted. They were close, even if it didn't feel that way. The woman guiding her along the corridor had spoken to her. She'd stopped, had turned round, was waiting. What is your name? she repeated, enunciating every word, as though used to people whose grasp of English was weak. Maya, said Dana. The woman looked at Dana. Then she let her eyes run up and down, taking in her face, clothes, even shoes. Earlier in the day, Dana had run cooking oil through her hair to make it look as though it hadn't been washed recently. Before getting into the boat, she'd rubbed dirt into her hands and fingernails. 
Her appearance was convincing. She had black hair, coffee-colored skin, even the light green eyes that were common among Pashtun women. It would be her voice if anything that let her down. Dana spoke Hindi and Arabic and could adopt a regional accent that would fool most Westerners. Native Afghans, on the other hand, would be a different story. Say as little as possible, the SO-10 sergeant had told her. Act dumb. When you do speak, keep it short, simple sentences, and pitch your voice low. Finally, the woman seemed satisfied. Follow me, she said. Dana was shown into a room on the top floor that her sense of direction told her would face the creek. May I take your bag? The woman was holding out her hand. Dana hesitated. She had expected this. They would be bound to check what she'd brought with her, but no one would willingly hand over every possession they had in the world, would they? You'll get everything back, said the woman, but we do need to know what you have with you. Dana held out her bag. The woman put it behind her against the door. She took a step closer to Dana and held her arms out by her sides. Telling herself that getting bolshy would hardly be convincing, Dana submitted to being patted down, airport security style. The woman found the money belt in seconds. She slid her hands under Dana's tunic, unfastened the belt and looked inside. The team had reproduced exactly what Maya's money belt had been carrying, a mixture of Afghan notes, euros and sterling. The woman peered into each of the three pockets, zipped them back up and returned the belt to Dana. Not interested in money then. You should shower and change, said the woman. I'll take your clothes for laundry and I'll get you something to eat. Dana watched her guide leave the room. She was a woman in her fifties, about five foot seven and well built, wearing what looked like medical scrubs. Her hair was short and iron grey, her face sallow and coarse, but relatively unlined. Dana would know her again, would be able to identify her if necessary. The door closed and was locked on the outside. The team are in place outside, said Detective Superintendent Weaver, when Lacey and Detective Sergeant Anderson arrived back at Lewisham. East Street, built in the late 17th century, originally warehouses and offices for shipping companies. Some of the properties are offices now, a couple are residential. Do we know who owns the building? asked Anderson. Registered to a company with an overseas head office, replied Weaver. It will take time to track them down. Lacey watched the small red dot on the screen that was D.I. Tullock. They had the bodies. They had the place where the women were being taken. They had at least some of the people involved in the operation. It wasn't enough. Unable to stop herself, Donna ran to the door and pulled the handle. She was locked in. But honestly, what had she expected? She'd learned a lot already. Already the risk had been worth taking. And nothing bad had happened. She still had the lifeline round her neck. She just had to do her job, and that meant finding out as much as she could about where she was. A room, roughly ten feet by eight, resembling nothing so much as a private hospital room, although it would be difficult to say exactly why. There was no medical equipment. A single bed had a simple wooden headboard rather than a metal frame, and yet there was something about the tiled floor, the absence of pictures or ornamentation of any kind, that looked institutional. There was another door that led to a small bathroom, with basin, loo and shower. A few rough white towels, a thin robe and some surprisingly nice toiletries. She was expected to be clean and presentable. Back in the bedroom were a table and chair, a cabinet beside the bed, a TV on a cupboard and a tall chipboard wardrobe. In the cupboard were magazines and a few books aimed at students of the English language. Also some English language DVDs. The occupants of this room were expected to improve their English while they were here, which rather suggested they had a future beyond it, didn't it? There were clothes in the wardrobe. Leggings, T-shirts, long cardigans, long loose skirts, underwear and pyjamas, all in plain dull blues and browns none of them even remotely alluring. These were simple, modest clothes. They were all cleaned and ironed, but none had the crisp newness of clothes that had just been taken out of their packaging. Someone else had worn these clothes. 
Dana took out pajamas and a thin cotton robe, conscious that she was almost certainly being watched. Surveillance technology was extremely sophisticated and readily available, she'd been told earlier by Mark's colleague. Cameras could be plastered into walls and ceilings, their lenses concealed as something as innocuous as large screw heads. Until she left this place, she had to assume that everything she did, everything she said, could be overheard or seen, and that meant she had to behave as though she had nothing to hide. She walked to the window, because that seemed like the most natural thing to do. And yet the world beyond the opaque glass was black. This must be the creek side of the building. On the street side, there would be more lights, more of a sense of space beyond the window. She'd been told to shower and change, to have her own clothes ready for laundry. Maya would probably have done that, so she had to as well. The water was hot, and the shampoo they'd provided had a heady scent of musk roses that reminded Dana of Turkish delight. They'd included conditioner, too, and body moisturiser. Whatever plans were in store for these girls, they were being looked after. So far, Nadia's account had been accurate. When she'd rinsed her hair, Dana dressed quickly and went back into the bedroom. She wasn't wearing a watch, Maya hadn't been, but estimated it was close to midnight. She should be tired. She was tired, but to sleep in this strange place with no idea why she was here or what would happen to her, was that possible? Footsteps outside. She backed up against the bed, her hand going to the locket around her throat. Break the chain, drop the locket on the floor and stamp down hard. Not yet. Not yet. It might be nothing. The door opened and the smell of food wafted in. The woman who'd met her carried a small casserole dish on a tray. There was also a half-litre bottle of water, an apple and a banana. The woman put the tray down, picked up the dirty clothes Don had left on the chair, and half smiled at her. Wait! The woman turned back in the doorway, her smile already gone. What will happen? said Donna. Eat and sleep. Tomorrow you'll see the doctor. Then, as though wanting to be away before any more questions could be hurled at her, she strode out and locked the door again. Tomorrow she'd see the doctor. Why did that send a chill around her heart? That woman, Nadia Safi, I want her bringing in, first thing in the morning said Weaver. Is that wise, Gov? said Anderson. Last thing we want to do is draw attention to the operation. She's been where Dana is now. She can tell us exactly what's happening to her. She's in a room on the top floor. Lacey was sitting with the technician at the monitor. There are four other people in the building. Two of them haven't moved in the last hour, so I'm guessing they're asleep. One of them seems to be in the room next to D.I. Tullock's, the other on the floor below. The third person is doing most of the moving around. It could be the woman who met the boss at the door. The other seems to be confined to the ground floor, but is moving, so not asleep. What's Dana doing now? said Weaver. Very little. She's been moving quite a bit, you know, wandering to the window, maybe going to the bathroom. She's been still for about four minutes now, so she may be trying to get some sleep. Which is exactly what we should do, said Anderson. Nobody got much kip last night and this could go on for another 24 hours. The sergeant was right. The surveillance equipment would be monitored all night. If anything happened, they'd know about it. Nobody moved. She isn't moving. She's asleep, said Anderson. No, the locket isn't moving, said Weaver. She could be anywhere. With respect, sir, that just proves you're too tired to think straight. There's a red and orange glow on the thermal imaging camera that is a warm healthy body in exactly the same spot as the tracker. Not wishing to put too fine a point on it, if that healthy glow starts to look a bit blue, then we can panic. For now, she's fine. Chapter 76 Dana and Lacey When Dana woke in the night, it was with the immediate thought that she hadn't expected to sleep, and yet she felt strangely rested, if a little groggy. Had the food she'd eaten been drugged? If so, it had been with a sleeping draught only. No harm done. She'd heard something. Something had woken her, and yet now there was complete silence, as though around her everyone slept. The room wasn't as dark as she remembered it being when she'd switched off the light. 
and a pale grey glow surrounded the window. She got up and pressed her face against the glass. Yes, definitely getting light out there, and if she listened hard, she might be able to hear early morning traffic on the river. So the day was coming. She'd survived the night. The doctor will see you. Christ, she wanted to see the doctor like she wanted a hole in her head. The table and chair she'd pushed against the door before getting into bed were still in place. They'd have made useless barriers, but the sound of them scraping along the floor would have given her a couple of seconds. And there was that noise again. Listening to it properly was definitely the sound that had woken her just an hour or two before her body was ready to be woken. The sound of someone crying nearby. When Lacey woke in the night, it was to the sound of the tide coming in. It sounded different on Ray and Eileen's boat. A soft movement in the main cabin told her that the officer guarding her was still on board. She sat up, opened the hatch above her head, and climbed out. The air around her was heavy with the chill of night, and the moon was a sliver of cheese about to fall below the horizon. High tide would be in about an hour. Her own boat swayed gently on its moorings, rocking and pitching in time with the bigger boat at its side. They looked like two drunk dancers, clinging together on the dance floor at the end of the evening. Lacey crept forward until she could sit on the edge of the cabin roof and look out at the water. She could see quite well. It wouldn't be long till dawn. Sometime during the day, the operation at Say's Creek would come to a head. With luck and a fair wind, they'd get D.I. Tullock out safely and find out what had been going on. They'd make arrests, close the operation down. The bodies bobbing on the riverbed at South Dock Marina would be brought to the surface, identified and eventually laid to rest properly. It would be over. Except why? when the ongoing criminal operation depended upon the bodies not being discovered, had someone been practically hurling them into her path? She'd assumed the killer was playing games, had chosen her as a conduit to the police, as a means of taunting them. But did that really make sense? What little they knew of the setup suggested something big and organised, professional. Generally speaking, professionals with big sums of money at stake didn't play games. It was surprising how quickly one lost track of time on the river. There was something almost hypnotic about the relentless flow of the water, broken only by debris that was big enough to be seen and pale enough to catch the starlight. Sudden movement on the water made Lacey jump as a dozing bird was disturbed and flapped its way to safety. The sky was definitely getting lighter. The sounds of avian panic faded. The ruffles in the water settled for a moment, the incoming tide moved smoothly. Then, about twenty yards from the boat, the rounded shape of a human head emerged. Wednesday, 2nd of July. Chapter 77. Dana and Lacey. Dana was in her bathroom. The crying was coming from the next room. The tone and strength of the sobs suggested a woman. She bent down and saw the pipework beneath the wash basin. Tap, tap, tap. No response. No break in the crying. Dana got up again, ran into the bedroom, and found the spoon from dinner the night before. They hadn't given her a knife. Back in the bathroom, she tapped three times on the pipe. And again. The crying stopped. Three more taps. Silence from the next room. Hello? tried Dana, just as footsteps sounded in the corridor outside. She heard someone enter the next room, a low exchange of conversation, the rattle of crockery, then the door being closed and locked. Dana sat on her bed and waited. Her own door opened, and the woman from last night entered, carrying a breakfast tray. She had Dana's clothes over one arm and her bag over the other. Thank you, Dana risked. Did you sleep well? Dana nodded. In the brighter light, the woman had an Eastern European look about her. Her eyebrows were dark, her skin sallow, her eyes dark and rather deep set. There might also be a trace of accent about the deep voice. You should get dressed, said the woman. 
I'll be back in an hour. A car's just arrived outside the house, Lacey told her two colleagues. Looks like other people are arriving. The marine unit had been on the river since before dawn. Sergeant Buckle, Finn Turner and Lacey, in a small dinghy, hovering near the entrance to Say's Creek. Buckle was at the helm, Turner sat at the bow. Lacey was monitoring the radioactivity. She hadn't gone back to bed after seeing the swimmer again. Before she'd had a chance to call the officers on duty, the head had disappeared. While she'd been staring out at the water, Ray had joined her, and between them, they decided to say nothing for now. Monitoring the situation at Say's Court and keeping D.I. Tullock safe had to take priority for the next few hours. She'd report it once Dana was safe. They're opening the big warehouse doors, she said, the cars driving into the building. In the centre of the river, a passenger ferry went past at speed, one of the first day trips heading towards Greenwich. The wash came towards them, and Buckle turned the dinghy to face it. Two people got out of the car, said Lacey, after a few seconds. That makes seven people in the building, including D.I. Tullock. The woman came back for Dana exactly an hour later. After dressing and eating, Dana had watched the morning news on television. When she heard footsteps, her hand went up to the locket as though clutching at a talisman. But when the door opened, she was standing ready, her breakfast tray in her hands. Go ahead. The woman took the tray from Dana. Down the stairs, next floor down. Dana did what she was told. Next door on your right, said the woman, as Dana arrived at a door that wasn't properly closed. Go straight in. Okay, so the house population has increased by two, Lacey told her colleagues. There are seven people in there now, one on the top floor, one on the ground. D.I. Tullock and her guide are on the first floor, as is someone who might still be asleep because he or she hasn't moved since last night. There are also two in the room that D.I. Tullock seems to be heading for. She paused. There were a few moments of static, then more information. Okay, D.I. Tullock's in the room on the first floor with two others, her guide's left her there and is heading back down the stairs. Turner's eyes dropped. Buckle stared straight ahead. They were picturing the layout of the house, as she was. Seven people, one on the top floor, two on the ground floor, and four on the first, three of whom were now in the same room. Remember that. If they had to go in suddenly, they didn't want any surprises. This could be it, said Anderson over the radio. Stand by, everyone. Hello, Maya said the thin white woman standing behind the desk. Welcome to the United Kingdom. We're so happy to see you here. I'm Dr. Kanash, said the young Asian man by the window. This is Nurse Stafford. The doctor will see you tomorrow. Kanash and Stafford. Real names? Remember everything you can. Kanash is about 35, has a tiny scar just above his upper lip on the left side, and his very dark skin and eyes were making her think Sri Lankan rather than Indian or Pakistani. Stafford is older, maybe early forties, thin hair cut into a bob, mousy brown but with strands of grey. She's wearing a wedding ring. Thank you, said Dana, knowing something was expected of her. Thank you very much. It was okay to look round, wasn't it? Any woman would look round the room nervously. A couch pushed up alongside one wall with a long runway of tissue paper along its length, a height measure and weighing scales, a blood pressure kit on the desk, a box of surgical gloves, some sort of electronic scanning equipment. You had a long trip, I know, Ganache was saying. A very difficult trip, but it's over now. Have some tea. Stafford had moved from behind the desk and was now beside an urn of hot water. We have jasmine or peppermint. They were being nice to her. Should that make her feel better or worse? Please, I am very... I don't know the words. What will happen now? We completely understand, said Kanash, as Stafford gave Dana a smile. Everything is very new, but there's nothing to worry about. We have a very nice job waiting for you. A very nice couple who want someone to look after their house, especially when they're travelling. It's a beautiful house. Not so much to do. You'll be very happy. Thank you. Do I go today? The two exchanged a glance. I'm afraid not, said Stafford. 
There is much to sort out first, lots of paperwork. Work permits and visas and immigration papers. The British need so much paperwork. But while it is being sorted out, you will stay here with us and we will take very good care of you. Thank you, said Dana. Hold still a moment. Stafford had picked up a camera from the desk. As Dana stared at her, she pressed the button. Just for your file, she said, so we don't get you mixed up with one of the other ladies. How are you feeling after your trip? asked Kanash. Any health problems we should know about? Dana shook her head, knowing she looked scared and that it was probably exactly how every other girl in this room had looked. Right, said Kanash, and Dana had a sense he'd got to the end of his stock repertoire of pleasantness. Let's get you on the scales, shall we? She's on the move again, Lacey told the crew. She's being escorted back upstairs. She looked at her watch. Better part of an hour, she said. What was all that about? She hadn't expected an answer. She must know something after that, she said. We could go in now. She's still fine, said Buckle. They said 24 hours. Lacey, you there? Anderson's voice sounded agitated. I can hear you, Sarge, she replied. Has a boat or vessel of any kind gone up Say's Creek in the last 15 minutes? Negative, Sarge. Lacey saw her own puzzlement reflected on the faces of both Buckle and Turner. No one's been in there since we came on shift. Well, there were eight people in the house now and nobody else arrived by car. You sure? Of course I'm bloody sure. The Itala and one other on their way back upstairs. Two in the room she just left, that's four. One more on that floor who hasn't moved since we started surveillance and one in the room next to D.I. Tullock's on the top floor, and two characters on the ground. So how did number eight squeeze in? Teleportation? We didn't see anything, Sarge. Beads of sweat burst on Lacey's temples as she began to scan the water around them. Back in her room, Dana went straight into the shower. She ran the water as hot as she could bear and stood beneath it, telling herself to calm down. They'd done nothing except carry out a perfectly ordinary, if extremely thorough, medical examination. She'd been weighed and measured, against a background conversation of how she was a little on the slim side, but still very attractive. Kanash had listened to her chest and pronounced her heart and lungs perfectly healthy. He'd taken her blood pressure and seemed quite happy with that, too. She'd been sent into a toilet cubicle and asked to provide a urine sample. They tested it there and then, finding no traces of sugar or protein, which was good, apparently, but explained that it would need to be sent away for further testing. Then Stafford took blood, but did it so smoothly and expertly that Dana barely felt the needle go in. Kanash had put headphones on her and asked her to listen out for tiny pinpricks of sound. They'd asked her to read from a card on the wall, a card with pictures on it, for women who couldn't read the Latin alphabet. Boat, Dana had said. Fish. Tree. She'd mimed apple and scissors for good measure. Then she'd been asked to lie on the couch. At this point, Stafford took over, although Kanash remained in the room, hidden from sight behind the drawn curtain. Dana had been asked to undress to her underwear, and when she'd looked reluctant, Stafford had explained that the British government would only issue permits to people who were perfectly healthy. Have you ever had a child? Her fingers had roamed over Dana's stomach pressing and probing. Ever been pregnant? She'd mimed a bump over her stomach, in case Dana hadn't understood. Lie back and bring your heels towards your bottom. The look on her face told Dana that this was the part when it usually got difficult. Gasping, her skin stinging, Dana turned off the shower and let the cold air flood over her. What did it matter if they were watching? It wasn't as if she had anything else left to hide. It had been a cervical examination, that was all. She'd had them before. They were unpleasant, you gritted your teeth, relaxed as best you could and waited for it to be over. They didn't last long and there was absolutely no need to be such a wimp about it, but for the love of God, why had they had to do all that to her? What was going on here? She stepped out of the cubicle and found a towel. She wrapped it around her shoulders and waited to stop shivering. From the next room, came the sound of a lavatory being flushed, then a low-pitched moaning. Chapter 78 Pari and Dana Someone was tapping on the pipes again. 
Pari lowered herself down until she was kneeling on the tiled bathroom floor. Three taps. The sound of the cistern died away. Pari pressed her face against the wall. There had been people in the room next to hers before now, but no one had tried to talk to her before. Hello? she heard in English. She said nothing, waiting to see if the voice would speak again. After a few seconds, it did. I'm Maya. Are you okay? Pari understood okay. It was international language. She started to speak, but the sound that came out was somewhere between a moan and a gasp. What's wrong? Are you ill? It hurts. Finally, Pari was able to talk. Where do you hurt? What happened to you? What's your name? The English words were coming too fast. Pari took a second to process what she'd just heard. I'm sick. In pain. My name is Pari. Silence, as though the woman on the other side of the wall was thinking. Then, have you told the nurse, the woman who brings us food? Crouched over like this, the cramps were too painful. Pari got to her feet. How long have you been ill? I don't know. Many days. How long have you been here? Many days. People in the corridor. Pari heard quick footsteps in the room next to her own, then the other bathroom door being pulled shut. Dana moved quickly back to her bedroom. There was a knock on the door as it began to open. Nurse Stafford was standing outside, together with the woman who brought her food, and a heavy-set, middle-aged man whom Dana hadn't seen before. He too was wearing scrubs, pale blue like the woman's. His right hand was tucked into his trouser pocket. Sorry to disturb you, Maya. Stafford stepped into the room towards her. It's just one more thing. Was there something you forgot to mention downstairs? The other two followed her in and the door closed behind them. Donna's hand flew to her locket as the woman in blue scrubs approached her. The man pulled his hand from his pocket. Donna flinched before realizing he was holding a small glass vial containing red liquid. Her hand hesitated for just a fraction too long. The woman took hold of one arm, the man the other. She could no longer reach the locket. Of course, it's possible you didn't know. Stafford was a couple of feet away, looking steadily into Dana's face. The levels we found were very low, but it does raise an interesting question. How could a woman who spent the last few weeks on the road from Afghanistan, closely guarded and protected every step of the way, be in your condition? Dana shook her head. I don't... It's a very simple test, said Stafford. We do it as a matter of routine. You've just never had a positive result before. But congratulations, Maya, if that's really your name. You're pregnant. Chapter 79. Lacey. Lacey got back to the yard shortly after two in the afternoon. Neither she, Buckle nor Turner had wanted to leave their post by Say's Creek, but Chief Inspector Cook had insisted. If anything happened, they'd be called back, he'd said. But Darna wasn't due to be pulled out until midnight, and there was no way he was going to be involved in a difficult and dangerous rescue operation with a knackered crew. It had been impossible to argue. Out of habit, she looked for the officer who was keeping an eye on the yard. The ice cream van that was his temporary home was empty, nor was there any sign of him wandering around. Her own boat was empty too. She popped back up and went to find Eileen. No plain-clothed presence on her boat, either. Where are the bodyguards? she asked. Eileen pulled a don't-ask-me face. They had a call-out that took priority. They'll be back later. Better hope our neighbourhood psycho needs the cover of darkness, then, muttered Lacey, although privately she was relieved. Being alone for a few hours felt like a good idea. She'd pulled off her sweatshirt when her phone started to ring. Not her usual phone, that had been lost in the river along with her canoe, the one she'd used to contact Nadia. I've remembered something. I thought I should call you straight away. Lacey sat down and pulled a pencil and notepad towards her. Go ahead. I think I can remember the way they took me. When I left the house, said Nadia. Lacey reached across to the chart table and found the Thames pilot book. I've been thinking about it ever since I spoke to you, said Nadia when Lacey asked her to go ahead. I bought a map of the river and tried to work it out, 
I've even been down to the water's edge. Nadia, we know where you were kept. Lacey had found the chart with Say's Creek. It's a house very close to the river. We're watching it at the moment, but anything you can tell me will be useful. I can show you. Lacey looked at her watch. She had to be back at Wapping by ten o'clock. The chances were that the exact details of Nadia's exit from the house weren't that important anymore. On the other hand, it wouldn't hurt. Okay, where are you now? By the water, a place called St. George's Stairs. I remember passing them that night, and the pier just upriver. Lacey looked at the map. St. George's Stairs was an access point to the river, very close to the South Dock Marina. The pier Nadia was referring to was Greenland Pier, a busy mooring point for passenger traffic. Okay, I'll come and pick you up. She looked round for her car keys. It will take me about half an hour to drive round to you, but it will not work in a car. I'm sorry? I've tried to walk the route and it isn't possible. There are places a car can't go. I think you'll find a police warrant card opens a lot of gates. Lacey checked that she had hers. And there was a building. I was taken to it before they said goodbye. I can't find it on land. I've been looking all day, but I think I might be able to in a boat. You want us to go on the water? No. Memories flooding back. The head appearing out of the dark water. Strong hands pulling her under. She did not want to go out on the river. Lacey, I'm still afraid of it, said Nadia. But I think it might be the only way. Chapter 80. Dana. Dana was being marched downstairs again. She was pregnant. How could they tell that quickly? It had been barely more than a day. Christ, she didn't know whether to smile or scream. They'd reached the first floor. The woman nudged her along the corridor. The treatment had worked. The egg she'd seen on the scan had popped out of its follicle. One of the several million donated sperm had found it, and the two of them had decided they might just have a future together. There was a baby growing inside her, and she'd put them both in danger. She couldn't panic. She still had the locket. The team would be watching everyone in the house very closely. They'd be here in minutes. Helen would kill her. Oh, please, God, let her have the chance. They were back at the examination room. The door was pushed open. Someone new was standing just in front of the window, holding up a file to the light. In the top right-hand corner was a small, startled photograph of Dana herself. The man, tall, dark-haired, wearing a well-cut suit, was studying it closely. Then he turned, Alexander Christakos, her fertility consultant. D.I. Tulloch, he said. What an interesting turn of events. Dana's hand shot to the locket. She pulled hard as the three staff members who were still flanking her all pressed in to stop her next move. This is a police operation and you're all under arrest, she said. My colleagues are surrounding the building. Christakos picked up the phone and held it out. In that case, he said, I suggest you invite them in. Detective Sergeant Anderson, a pleasure to meet you, said Christakos several minutes later, as Anderson burst, red-faced and puffing into the room. Actually, I think I've heard quite a lot about you from a young friend of mine but we can get to that. Do have a seat. He sat down behind the desk and gestured to the chair in front of it, exactly as he had in the clinic in town. He was dressed as immaculately, was as smoothly handsome as ever. Anderson ignored him, addressing Dana instead. Some sort of clinic, ma'am. Five people in the building other than ourselves. Mr. Christakos here, three members of staff and a young foreign woman who looks like she could be a patient. They're all in separate rooms, waiting for us to talk to them. Are you okay? Dana nodded. I'm fine, but the woman needs medical attention. She was in a lot of pain earlier this morning. As Anderson stepped to the door and spoke briefly to someone outside, Dana gripped the back of the chair. She desperately wanted to sit down and knew she couldn't do it. She had to look in control. Christakos gave a small, polite smile. His hands were perfectly still on the desk in front of him. I'm not aware of any medical issues on the part of our guest, but thank you for drawing it to my attention. What is this place? said Dana. What happens here? These are my private consulting rooms. Christakos opened his hands as if to say, Take a look, I have nothing to hide. 
This is where I see patients who don't want to attend a busy London clinic. I've only been here for a few months, so we're not quite up to speed. But I hope in time we'll be able to carry out simple procedures here. What sort of procedures? said Anderson from the doorway. Christakos glanced at Dana and let the corner of his mouth turn up in a small, knowing smile. A variety, but largely concerned with assisted pregnancies. A number of our sperm donors come here to donate. It's more convenient than our clinic in town, for those who live south of the river. What are the girls for? said Dana. He blinked again. Girls, Detective Inspector? I don't employ girls. I have a number of women on my staff. There is Nurse Rachel Stafford, for example, and Catherine Markova, who is a sort of office manager, although she too has some medical training. There's a young woman in a room upstairs who I'd put money on being an illegal immigrant, said Dana. From what I could tell this morning, she is seriously ill. I'll ask you again, what are the girls for? Christakos gave a small, sad smile, as though she were missing something important, before standing and turning to the window. The glass in front of him was clear, and Dana could see the building immediately opposite. Five stories high, with rectangular windows, a flat roof, and cast-iron balconies. Christakos had apparently gathered his thoughts. Detective Inspector, many years ago, my sister and I entered this country as immigrants. I won't say illegally, but things weren't as strict back then as they are now. We've done well here, so occasionally we like to help others who need our assistance. What does that mean exactly, said Anderson. Very occasionally, if we hear of young people, not necessarily women, who need help settling into a new country, we sponsor them. We give them a place to stay, assistance in learning English, and eventually we help them find employment. And you inform the authorities when you do this. The UK border agency has been less than helpful in the past, said Christakos. We find we can manage very well without them. There was a knock on the door, and the uniformed sergeant poked his head around it. Moment, ma'am. Behind him, Dana could see Misen's blonde hair. There's a discrepancy, the sergeant said, when she and Anderson joined him in the corridor. The surveillance equipment told us there were eight people in the building, including you. One left by car just before you called us, so we should have been looking for six apart from yourself. Trouble is, what we were seeing on the equipment got very confused. We lost track of where everyone was. We've checked the entire building, top to bottom, and there are just five people. We've been in the basement and up on the roof. Only one young foreign woman, in a room on the ground floor. She's a bit dopey, but she looks fine. Certainly doesn't seem to be ill or injured. There was someone in the room next to mine overnight, said Dana. A girl called Pari, in a lot of pain. Check again. We stopped the car that left here earlier on the approach to London Bridge, said Misen. The driver claims he's called Kanash and is a doctor working at the Thames Clinic. He had a meeting here with Dr Christakos this morning and is on his way back to work. They're taking him to Lewisham. I take it they searched the car, said Dana. Misen nodded. There were two industrial-sized containers in the boot that he says are cryo-storage vessels. He claims they're empty, but that the clinic are waiting for them. Come again, said Anderson. Cryo what? Fertility treatment relies upon preserving gametes and embryos for use in the future, Dana told him. Sperm, eggs and fertilised embryos can be frozen in liquid nitrogen and kept until needed. She turned to Misen. Gail, we should have them delivered, but I want someone to see exactly what's inside them. In fact, can you try and get hold of Mike Cates for me? Misen stepped away down the hall and pulled out her phone. The sergeant resumed his search of the building. Get him brought in, Neil. Dana nodded her head to the room where Christakos waited for them. He's not telling us everything. Chapter 81 Lacey Don't have a good feeling about this, muttered Lacey ten minutes later, as she steered Ray's motorboat out of the entrance to Deptford Creek and turned up river. Lewisham Control had been unable to send support. We're absolutely up to our eyes in it, the dispatcher told Lacey. RTA on Lewisham High Street and an armed hold up in Barclays Bank. Can you hold on till things clear up a bit? Reluctant to call her own colleagues and divert them from the far more important job of keeping an eye on Dana, Lacey had decided to meet Nadia alone. 
If what the Afghan woman had to show her was largely irrelevant, it could wait till she reported in later. If it turned out to be important, she could call it in immediately and insist upon backup. She had a radio, a phone, even a torch, safely tucked inside a waterproof bag in the bottom of the boat. It was broad daylight, and she was in a properly equipped boat. What could possibly go wrong? Let someone know where I've gone if I don't call you in an hour, she told Eileen, who had promised to do exactly that. She steered wide as she neared the entrance to Say's Creek, not wanting to give the surveillance team any reason to worry about her presence on the water. She half expected them to hail the boat and pull it over, even if they didn't recognise her at the helm, but she didn't even see the dinghy close to the wall, and the rib must be further downstream. Past Say's Creek, she steered close to the bank again, and after a few minutes, saw Nadia waiting for her on St George's stairs. That way, Nadia pointed up river once she'd pulled the life jacket over her head and climbed into the boat in front of Lacey. This is the way we went when I left the house. It was dark, but I remembered last night. Lacey set off again, keeping close to the bank, steering up river towards the city. I remember that. Nadia pointed to the entrance to South Dock Marina. I thought we might be about to go in there, but at the last minute we moved on past. Lucky for you, thought Lacey, thinking of the corpses lying weighted on the marina floor. She steered the boat around Greenland Pier, keeping a lookout for the fast vessels that used it to moor up, and then passed the entrance to Greenland Lock. Nadia was intent on the south bank. There, she was pointing at a gap in the wall. They took me in there. That's a sewage outlet. It leads to a room. It looked like a room for machinery, very old but beautiful. There were flowers in the ironwork and huge great columns. Lacey looked at her watch, then down river again. She could still see no activity outside Say's Court, and finally at her police radio in its waterproof bag. Nadia, why didn't you tell me this before? I told you, I never think about that night. I only let myself remember when I realised how important it was to you. I can't take you in there. Lacey looked again at the tunnel entrance. The tide's getting quite low, we could get stuck. Okay, just steer through the wall, said Nadia. There is something you need to see. What? A ring fixed into the side. I think it's what they tie the girls to. They tie them to the rings and then, when the water comes up, they drown the wound around the corpse's neck. It was a detail that had never been made public. Oh, God, that was horrible, to be tied up in a tunnel, watching the water coming closer. How far in is it? There are several of them, but the first is just inside the entrance. Lacey steered the boat the final few yards that took them to the embankment wall and just inside the tunnel entrance. By keeping the engine in gear and the revs low, she was just about able to hold the boat in position. Just here, Nadia was pointing further into the tunnel. A little more in. Ray's boat had a deeper keel than the dinghies the marine unit used to patrol these tunnels. Already they'd moved further in than felt wise. Nadia, I really can't go any further. I need to get you back on shore and then call this in. What? What's the matter? Nadia had stiffened, was sitting bolt upright in the boat, her eyes going from side to side. Lacey, she said in a small voice. I think there's someone here. Instincts kicking in, Lacey put the engine into reverse and looked back over her shoulder to steer out. A sudden screech, the boat rocked. She looked round in time to see Nadia falling backwards into the water. Chapter 82 Dana. I'm sorry, Dana, said Cates, but I think the clinic's clean. They were back at Lewisham Police Station. Three hours had gone by since Dana and her team had left the house in East Street. Christakos had said nothing beyond what he'd told them already, and Cates and a team of detectives had just finished as thorough a search of the Thames Clinic as they could without a court order. We've lost a young woman. Dana was finding it impossible to sit down. There were six of them in that clinic when he allowed me to phone my colleagues, and by the time you arrived, there were five. He knows where she is. He may have even killed her. He's not getting away with it. Of course not, said Gates. 
but his licence from the HFEA clearly permits him to... Sorry, what's the HFEA? Anderson interrupted. Human Fertility Embryology Authority, Kate told him. It's the regulatory body for fertility treatment in the UK. You should check with them, see if there are any complaints or investigations outstanding against Christakos. But to be honest, I'd be surprised. Is it big business, fertility? asked Anderson. God, yes. People would practically bankrupt themselves to have a baby. Mind you, most kids bankrupt their parents in the end, so I suppose it just saves time. So what would a clinic like that turn over in a year? Millions. Take donor insemination for a start. Dana made herself sit down. A woman might pay up to a £1,000 a cycle, he went on. Let's say she takes six cycles to get pregnant, six grand, and what does the sperm cost the clinic? Pin money for some medical student who's not that squeamish about having a wank in a hospital cubicle. Fascinating, said Misen, after the moment's silence that seemed called for. So we can assume Christakos is successful, that he's making money. I'll say, said Cates. The Thames Clinic has an international reputation. It was one of the pioneers of the egg-sharing scheme back in the 1990s, and that's a real money spinner. Do we need to know what egg-sharing is? asked Anderson. Probably not, said Cates. Egg-sharing? Dana started to get up told herself to wait, to be sure. It can't hurt, said Misen. Don't we need to know as much as possible about what he's up to? Well, it's a clever idea, really. Kate settled himself on a desktop. It brings together women who've gone beyond the age of being able to produce viable eggs with couples who can't afford the huge cost of IVF. Basically, the older, richer couple fund IVF treatment for the younger, who in return agree to share the eggs produced. And that's what it was all about. Thank God we sent for you, Mike. Dana was on her feet again. Glad to be of service. Kate's looked flattered, but surprised. There's an acute shortage of donor eggs, isn't there? Kate's nodded. Very much so. Women who are donating eggs have to undergo almost full IVF treatment. They have daily injections, drugs to shove up their noses. Then there's the surgical procedure itself, under general anaesthetic. It's a lot to ask a woman to go through, and usually for the benefit of a perfect stranger. Something lit up behind Kate's eyes. He'd got it. The rest, on the other hand, were getting twitchy. Give me a second, guys. I'm going somewhere with this, said Dana. Mike, in other countries, the USA most typically, egg donors are compensated financially, right? They are here, said Kate's, but only a few hundred pounds. In the US, couples pay thousands of dollars for eggs from a good donor. And what makes a good donor? Young, healthy, intelligent and good-looking, and a physical resemblance to the receiving parent is a decided advantage. What were you two getting at? said Anderson. Dana crossed to a spare computer and typed into the search bar. OK, this is more than I would normally share, but it'll become blindingly obvious soon anyway. The fact is, Helen and I are hoping to start a family. Of the faces around her, only Kate's didn't look surprised. But given our particular circumstances, we're going to need a bit more help than the average couple, she went on. Come and look at this. The others gathered round. Sperm bank, said Stenning, with what sounded like distaste in his voice. Dana stiffened. You know what, Pete, when the time comes for you and some unfortunate young woman to breed, I really hope you can manage it in the time-honoured way. But if you need a bit of medical help, you're going to have to lose some of that squeamishness about bodily functions. Stenning shook his head. No, you've just reminded me that I did it myself a few years ago, when I was at Hendon. A lot of us did, for the money. You were a sperm donor? Misen had taken a step away from him. Me too, said Barrett. Kept me in beer and ciggies for two years. Dana shook her head. That is information I really could have done without just now, but getting back to the point, this is how we choose. Look. She found the screen where the listings of available donors appeared and the little blue, yellow, green and pink icons popped up. So there were umpteen little Stennings and Barretts running round the place, said Misen. Gail, would you focus for a second, said Donna. This is a sort of online catalogue of available sperm with some very basic information about the donors. I wonder if I'm still on it, Barrett leaned closer. Not umpteen, Stenning turned to Misen. There are regulations governing how many families an individual donor can supply. 
And how old are you? Twelve? Stop it, said Dana. This isn't about sperm, it's about eggs. Mike, am I right in thinking there isn't an equivalent site that couples who need donated eggs can go to? Definitely not, said Kate's. We have an acute shortage of egg donors in the UK. For all the reasons you just told us about. So, if a couple have plenty of money but no viable eggs of their own, what do they do? Oh my God, Misen had got it too now. Quite a lot go abroad for their eggs, to countries where the authorities aren't quite so squeamish about paying donors, said Cates. There are international egg banks. Frozen eggs can be shipped over. The best results come from fresh eggs. Typically, that means the recipients will arrange for the donor to travel to them so cycles can be coordinated. You can imagine how bloody expensive that gets. Unless the women are smuggled in through cheaper, less orthodox channels, said Misen and especially if they don't even know their eggs are being taken from them. It took a second for the men to catch up. These women are egg donors, said Anderson. I think they could be, said Dana. They've been smuggled in for something, and we've more or less ruled out the sex trade, so what else do young, attractive women have to offer? Their fertility, said Misen. I think this bastard Christakos is stealing their eggs. When people choose a donor, whether sperm or eggs, they're looking for someone who looks like they do, said Dana. Most couples with the money to spend on egg donation and who are okay with it ethically will be white. They'll be looking for a white donor. But these girls are from Afghanistan, said Stenning. They're Pashtuns, said Dana. Lacey's been banging on about it for days. Light-skinned, pale-eyed Asians. Fertilize one of their eggs with white British sperm and you're going to get a white British-looking baby. Well, not guaranteed, said Kate's but I agree, the chances are pretty fair. And because these girls are being paid nothing, because they don't even know what's going on, the profit margin for Christakos is massive, said Dana. Why else was Nadia talking about medical treatment? She was on an IVF programme without even knowing about it. Zahar wasn't pregnant, she'd had her body pumped full of IVF drugs. So how and why are some of them ending up in the Thames, said Misen. How come Nadia was fine? The woman strung up on Lacey's boat had no trace of IVF drugs in her system, said Cates. Why would Christakos kill his golden geese, said Stenning. The incident room door opened and one of the clerical team looked in. Dear Italic, I'm sorry but we've just had a call from the front desk. Someone has just pranged your car. Dana stared at her. Of all the moments to pick. You're kidding me. Really sorry, ma'am. They need you to go down and swap insurance details. Dana got to her feet. Gail, while I'm out, can you look up egg donation? Get an idea of just how much people are prepared to pay for donated eggs. Neil, I want the Thames Clinic's account seized. I want to know how much money's coming through the books and where it's coming from. Dana's car was at the end of the line. The left tail light had shattered. Pieces of white and red plastic lay around the ground. A green Ford Mondeo with its engine running was parked just a yard or so away. She set off towards the driver's door, but as she drew level with the car, someone grabbed her firmly by the upper arm. At the same time, the rear door opened and she was shoved inside. As Dana twisted round, getting ready to fight and scream, her captor flung himself onto the back seat beside her and the driver stepped on the accelerator. They turned left along Lewisham High Road. Dana fell back against the seat. From what she could see in the rearview mirror, the driver looked vaguely familiar. No doubt at all, though, about the identity of her kidnapper. There are few people in the world she knew better. What the fuck have you done with Lacey? said Josebury. Chapter 83 Pari, Lacey and Dana Touch was the first of Pari's senses to come back to her, and it came wearing a thick red mantle of pain. Her brain seemed to be swelling pressing hard against the bones of a skull that had become as brittle and fragile as China. She was breathing, but every breath felt like ground glass scraping against raw flesh. And she was so hot. Her body was covered in a slick sheen of sweat, and there was no air left in the world. Her throat was burning. No one could feel this bad and live. And yet she did. A second later, she was still alive and a second after that. After many, many seconds, she could start to think beyond the pain. 
She was lying face down. The hard iron surface she could feel against her right temple was causing most of the pain. If she could move a fraction, free her head, it would help. But her brain was sending messages that her limbs couldn't hear. There was so much mud in her head. Her thoughts were weighed down, struggling to form themselves and make sense. Was this real mud? How could it be when she was so hot? Everything lurched. The world surged high into the air and fell again. The ground beneath her was moving. She focused for a few seconds on the rocking, pitching, rolling motion. She was on water. Nadia! No reply. Even the water had stopped moving. Knowing she couldn't risk taking the boat any further into the sewer, Lacey tied it to the mooring ring. Straddling the hull for balance, she stretched up, not quite able to stand upright. Nadia had been wearing a life jacket. She wouldn't just sink. Someone had to be holding her under. Nadia? She reached for the bag that kept her radio and phone dry, knowing she'd screwed up badly, that Nadia could lose her life now. The bag wasn't there. The only explanation could be that Nadia had reached out for it, clutching at anything to avoid being pulled overboard. Trying not to give way to panic, Lacey scrambled out of the boat onto the ledge. No sign of disturbance, just gently moving water. Then a splash, a cry, about twenty yards further in. Nadia! She could get into the boat and go for help. If she did that, Nadia would die. Trying to push away the memory of the creature that had tried to drown her the night before, of the human shape she and Ray had seen in the creek, and without even the benefit of a torch, Lacey set off into the tunnel. I can't believe you're doing this. Screw up your own life if you must, but stay the hell out of mine. Dana turned from Mark to the man at the wheel. And who the hell are you? A man in his late sixties. Thinning hair, thin build, suntanned skin. The only eyebrow she could see in the rearview mirror raised fractionally. Let's just say I'm your driver for the afternoon, he told her. Like hell you are. Take me back right now. In fact, stop the car, I'm getting out. And you'd better be good at quick getaways, because I'm phoning this in the minute I'm out of... Will you fucking well shut up? Mark told her. Back to the man at her side. You pranked my car, you arsehole. Can't believe you did that. And in case it's escaped you, I'm in the middle of something bloody important. Where the hell are we going? Mark sighed. Dana, we're driving around the frigging block. If you'd calm down and stop screaming for a second, you'd spot that for yourself. She stopped shouting, gave herself and him a second. What do you mean, what have I done with Lacey? Mark was close, invading her personal space. He never normally did that. Ray phoned me an hour ago. This is Ray Bradbury, by the way. He nodded towards the driver. He lives on the next boat to Lacey. She came home after her early shift, borrowed Ray's boat, and went out on the water, telling his wife to sound the alarm if she didn't come back in an hour. She's not answering her phone, and Wapping can't get hold of her either. Given everything that's been going on lately, that didn't seem good. And while we're on the subject, I'm in the middle of something bloody important too, so if anyone's career is being screwed up right now, it's mine. It took a moment for Dana to take in what he was saying. But I thought, we all thought... There was no humour in her best friend's face. He was angry with her, disappointed. Yeah, thanks for that. You're not... You haven't... You're still... He nodded, gave her that peculiar half-smile that she'd often thought she could fall in love with, was she remotely that way inclined? Yeah, just about, I think. Chapter 84 Pari, Lacey and Dana When she swam back into consciousness, Pari could hear again. The slow, steady slap of water, gulls screaming, the distant hum and chug of river traffic, a jet engine overhead. The stench around her seemed alive. She could almost feel it, wrapping its damp, slime-ridden folds around her body. Her nostrils were smarting with the acid sting of it, creeping its way inside her head. It jabbed at her stomach like the dull blade of a knife, lay in her mouth like vomit she couldn't spit away. She'd never imagined a smell this bad and wondered for a moment whether it might be the stink of her own rotting body that was surrounding her. And why couldn't she see? Did she still have eyes? Those were gulls she could hear. 
What had the gulls done to her while she'd been lying here? Wait. Wait. She could feel her lashes striking the upper part of her cheeks when she blinked. She still couldn't see anything but blackness. Only now she understood why. She was wrapped in something. Shrouded. Panic gave her the power to move again. She tried to push herself up, but her hands were tied behind her back. She tried kicking, but she was bound hand and foot. That cold slipperiness against her face was black plastic. Kidding her that she was blind, keeping the air from her face, she tried to open her mouth and found that it was taped shut. And then, as though the effort had exhausted her, Pari slipped away again into oblivion. Lacey carried on, past a lantern shelf that offered no promise of light, past a ladder that would take her up to the surface, if being on the surface would help at all, and further still. Ahead of her, the tunnel came to an abrupt T-junction. To take the right-hand fork, she would have to jump into the water, and there was no way she was doing that. She went left, now moving parallel with the river, and after a few minutes heard a squeal, which could have been made by a rodent, but somehow sounded bigger, more human. She opened her mouth to call for Nadia, and found she didn't dare. The light was all but gone, and ahead was blackness, so dense it looked solid. It was solid, a wall. The tunnel curved to the right, and then opened out into a much bigger chamber. There was light in here. Not much, but enough to tell Lacey that she was apparently alone. She followed the ledge, and was surprised to find the light growing. Still very dark, still far too many shadows, but even completely out of reach of the light from the sewer entrance, she could see where she was going. A little further in, she could see the source of the light. Three small tunnels at roughly waist height. Sewage outflow pipes. There would be a pumping station behind them. She might have found the building that Nadia had talked about. She reached the first of the pipes and peered through hardly more than a metre long, and daylight beyond it. Jumping at the chance to get out of the sewer, Lacey climbed into the pipe. A few seconds later, she was in the pumping station. Two stories high, the lower floor was underground. She knew that because the boarded-up windows and the large double door were all much higher in the walls. The light was coming from several skylights. No sign of Nadia, or anyone else for that matter. Running along the opposite wall were three recessed arches. She didn't think anyone was hiding in them, but it was difficult to be sure. Between her and the arches were three iron plinths. Lacey had no great knowledge of engineering, but guessed that they would have held the pumps back when this station had been operational. There were hiding places behind each, and not far from where she was standing, she could count four weights with handles that looked exactly the same as the ones holding down the corpses at South Dock Marina. Something caught her eye, and carefully she crossed the tiled floor. On a shelf, high above the damp stained tiles, were folded sheets, linen sheets. There's someone here. Who? Who had pulled Nadia overboard? Movement behind her. Lacey started to turn. She sensed rather than saw someone loom over her. Then, nothing. Okay, so now we've lost two young women, one of whom should bloody well know better. Dana faced the occupants of the small room at Lewisham. She'd gathered the smallest team she'd dared, the only ones she could trust with the knowledge that Mark was back in the fold. Anderson, Stenning and Misen. Together with Mark himself and his new best mate, Ray Bradbury, they were a group of six. Lacey took a phone call at 2.30 this afternoon, Anderson said. In fairness, she called for assistance, but there was a lot kicking off in the area, and they couldn't get anyone out to her. From Mrs Bradbury on the next boat, we know she then went out on the river, in Mr Bradbury's boat, to meet Nadia Safi, who we are similarly unable to trace. So strictly, ma'am, three young women. It just gets better, said Dana. Oh, and as everybody know, we also have a mermaid at large on the Thames. Come again? Dana gestured impatiently for Ray to fill everyone else in on what he'd told her and Mark in the car that whoever had been stalking Lacey for the past couple of weeks was moving around by water, possibly in a small boat, but swimming at least some of the time. 
He told them about the heart shape in glass and pebbles that Lacey had said nothing about, assuming it to have been left behind by Mark. And he told them about the voice calling Lacey's name, about the tapping on the side of her yacht, about the night they'd both gone out in his boat and seen someone in the water. I'm not saying one way or another, Bradbury was repeating himself now. It was dark. We were both a bit spooked. All I'm saying is that from the neck up, at least, it looked human. Why didn't she say something? asked Misen. Would you? Mark turned to Ray. And she saw it again this morning. The other man nodded. She got up just before dawn. I heard her climb out of our boat, although that dozy bugger in the main cabin didn't. She was on the deck and saw it in the water. Male? Female? What does she see exactly? asked Anderson. Human head, said Ray. Too far away and too dark for her to recognise features. But she did see what she thought was long hair floating around, suggesting a female. It just sank below the surface before she had a chance to raise the alarm. The door opened and David Cook came into the room. His eyes narrowed when he saw Mark, but he said nothing, focusing instead on Ray. We found your boat, Ray. The room fell quiet. It was spotted a few minutes ago down by the barrier. It had obviously overturned. Sorry, mate. He turned to the rest of the room. Sorry, everyone. It's not looking hopeful. Dana closed her eyes. Nope, said Ray. Dana turned to him, probably because she couldn't bring herself to look at Mark. Lacey's a bloody good swimmer, he said. I've not known a woman as strong or with as much stamina since my wife was young. She knows how to handle boats, and she knows the river. Also, according to Eileen, she went off wearing a life jacket. Wherever she is, she didn't have an accident on the water. I hope you're right, Ray, but the most experienced skippers can get taken by surprise, said Cook. I've got as many officers as I can spare looking for her. Is it possible Lacey got a lead on what happened to this other girl? Pari, did you say she was called? said Mark. If she did, she should have called it in, snapped Donna. She bloody well tried, Mark sighed. Let's look for this Pari girl. Maybe she'll lead us to Lacey. And Nadia, said Misen. Donna dropped her head into her hands. Just how many bloody women were they going to be pulling out of the Thames before the day was done? Chapter 85 Pari, Lacey and Dana. When Pari came round again, she knew she was on the big river, the Thames. She also knew she was amongst rubbish. The foul stench hadn't gone. It was the smell of rotting garbage. Coming from a city where there'd been no official refuse collection, Pari found it familiar enough. She could only assume that here, people stored their rubbish on the river. Why was she here? She'd been in her room at the clinic, been talking to a woman on the other side of the wall. There'd been commotion in the next room, and then everything had fallen silent. Not for long. Two of the clinic staff had come back. They'd seemed unusually hurried, anxious. She remembered them coming towards her, then nothing. Maybe a faint memory of being carried down the stairs, and had she felt sun on her face for the first time in weeks. After that, nothing. Pari tried to relax, to concentrate on the rocking, pitching, rolling motion beneath her. The wind seemed to have picked up. The water was rough. The tide was rolling in or out fast. Impossible to tell which. But she couldn't be moving because she would hear an engine. She was on a moored buoy. It was a hiding place and a temporary one at that. It was probably still daytime. At nightfall, they'd come back. She'd got until nightfall to get away. It was the tang of blood in her mouth that brought Lacey back to herself again. That salty, metallic taste, both comforting and terrifying at the same time. She licked her lips, fought back an urge to throw up, and opened her eyes. Nothing was clear. The darkness felt like a friend, softening the impact of the swirling shapes and repeated images. She closed her eyes again and took stock. She was on the silt-covered floor of the sewage tunnel. That much, at least, she was able to take in. There was light, which meant she probably wasn't too far from the pumping station. She didn't need to be able to see to know that she was sitting in several inches of water, 
and probably had been for some time. She was freezing cold and in a great deal of pain. Much of it came from the injury to her head, some from where her arms had been pulled behind her back and tied together. The rest of it came from the rope, fastened tightly around her neck. She tried to lean away from the wall, but the rope stopped her. She turned her head, and her worst fear was confirmed. She was tied, around the neck, to one of the mooring rings in the sewage tunnel wall. She couldn't move far. She probably couldn't stand up. And when the tide came back in, she'd be helpless. Do you recognise this woman? The orderly from the clinic, Catherine Markova, looked down at the photograph. She does. Stenning was watching the interview on the screen. Did you see her? Classic double take. Keep at it, Gail. She will, Dana told him. I think Markova looked surprised, though. Didn't expect to see what she just did. Markova was shaking her head. We call her Sahar. It's a reconstruction, said Mizen in the interview room. She was too badly damaged when we pulled her from the river. But this one wasn't. As Meisen slid the other photograph across the table, there was no doubting the shock on Markova's face. It can't be, she muttered to herself. We found her three days ago, said Meisen. She'd only been in the river a matter of days, so I'm guessing she was with you early last week. Did you look after her, serve her meals, take her down for treatment? Did you kill her? She was fine, said Markova. She was with us for a few days and then she left. Nothing happens to them when they're with us. We look after them. We aren't doing this. Somebody is, said Meisen. Chapter 86 Pari, Dana and Lacey It was working. The sharp metal cleat Pari had found by fumbling around had cut a hole through the bag. It helped enormously, letting in fresh air and reducing the claustrophobia that had been threatening to send her over the edge. Now the same weapon was working its way through the tape around her wrists. The bastards had wrapped it round many times, but she was getting through it. She had to keep going. It didn't matter that she felt like death. She couldn't stop. The problem was, the swell on the river had picked up, and the pontoon was pitching about like a toy boat in a toddler's bath. If she threw up with tape around her mouth, she'd suffocate. So every few seconds, she had to stop, rest, and breathe. I think you'll find that donating eggs is perfectly legal in this country, Detective Inspector, said Christakos. Dana stared back. I think you'll find that taking body parts without consent is illegal in most countries. Murder certainly is. You'd better hope that abduction, imprisonment and assault are the most serious offences you're charged with before the day is out. These women all came willingly into this country. They were free to leave my clinic at any time, and they all signed consent forms. I don't believe that for a moment, said Dana. Christakos looked smug. Where are these forms? Dana realised she'd boxed herself into a corner. In a filing cabinet in my office, along with receipts for money the women were given when they left the clinic, a comparable amount to paying a British donor expenses. No, he was not going to wriggle out of it that way. The trouble is, some of them left via the Thames, said Dana, the underwater route. I know nothing about that, said Christakos. They were all perfectly well when we said goodbye to them. Even if they were forced or tricked into signing something, said Dana, it proves nothing. How many of them can even read English? The procedure and its implications were explained to them very clearly. Most of our guests speak Pashtu or Dari, and I am fluent in both. Do you think they'll say that in court? I doubt this will ever come to court, said Christakos. For one thing, you'll have to show a direct link between eggs or embryos in my clinic and the women you know have spent time with us. And given the extremely sensitive nature of the organic material we store in the clinic, I'll be surprised if any court gives you permission to confiscate and test it. Donated gametes leave a trail. But if, for the sake of argument, gametes were obtained improperly, said Christakos. Then the trail wouldn't be there. I'm sorry, Detective Inspector, but the only charge you can legitimately lay at my door is the one of carrying out medical procedures in an unlicensed building, and that's not even a criminal offence. I'll probably lose my licence. But as I'm less than five years from retirement, 
that hardly seems a major issue. Where is the young woman who was in the room next to mine last night? I have no idea what you mean. Do you have any idea of the whereabouts of Constable Lacey Flint? For a second, he looked shocked. I had no idea Lacey was missing. Dana's phone was ringing. It was Barrett, who was in charge of the search of East Street. She excused herself and left the interview room. We've done this side of the river, ma'am, Barrett told her. I'm just outside a place called Say's Court. Big house, right at the top of the creek. Anyway, turns out Alexander Christakos lives here with his sister. Dana turned to look through the window of the interview room. Christakos had his eyes closed. Does see indeed, she said. As done for years, according to the sister. Nice old duck. We didn't spot the connection immediately, because she owns the house and it's in her name, which is different. Seems Alex Christakos isn't his real name. It's one he adopted when they moved here, because he felt a Greek name would be more acceptable to the medical establishment and patients than one from South Asia. Guess what? They're from Afghanistan. Christakos had dark hair and blue eyes, spoke both Afghan languages. He was a pale-eyed Pashtun, like the women he'd imported. So I guess that explains how he slipped past us to get to the clinic this morning, Barrett was saying. He must have used his sister's boat. Could also be how they got party out, replied Dana, with some sort of heat-concealing cover to fool the surveillance equipment. This lot of people smugglers, remember. More interestingly, said Barrett, both of them know Lacey. I had no idea Lacey was missing. She'd let that one go. Christakos had opened his eyes and was looking directly at her through the window. Dana couldn't help feeling that he knew exactly what she was saying. She turned her back. Knew her how? she asked Barrett. Christakos's sister just said she and her brother are friends of Lacey's, getting quite upset as well. I've got one of the PCs making her tea. Dana looked at her watch. Tom, I'm sending a team over, she said. They obviously got the girl out via the creek and that house. I want it searched. The tide was coming back. Much as she'd have liked to pretend otherwise, Lacey knew she hadn't been as wet half an hour ago. She couldn't see her watch, had no idea of the time, but knew the tide would have been due to turn sometime in the early afternoon. Less than a year ago, she'd been pulled headlong into the river, had come within a frantic gasp of drowning. She remembered all too well the paralysing cold, the swirling, dense blackness, the complete helplessness of being at the mercy of fast-moving water. It was going to happen again. Unless something serious had taken place, the operation in Say's Creek would still be underway. All her colleagues' eyes would be upon it. She wasn't due back on shift until 10pm and wouldn't be missed until then. Her only chance was Eileen. The water in here wouldn't be fast like last time. It would creep towards her, slowly, torturously, knowing she couldn't escape. Her neck was bleeding. She tried pulling at the rope to untie it or even dislodge the mooring ring. She tried turning her head to gnaw at the knot, but whoever tied it knew their knots. It wasn't budging. Twice in the last year, she'd found herself at the mercy of the Thames, the second time by choice. She'd leapt from a marine unit targa in a rash attempt to save the woman she now knew as Nadia Safi. Got you, the rushing water had whispered, as its folds had closed over her head and she'd felt the barnacle-encrusted hand of panic reaching up from the riverbed. She'd beaten it that time, had saved herself and the terrified Afghan woman, had she really, stupidly thought that she in the river had made some sort of truce? And now a rat was paying her more attention than she felt comfortable with. How long before it plucked up the courage to climb down onto her shoulder and get closer to the blood seeping out of the wounds on her neck? You can't ever drown, Marlene had said. That's the legend among watermen. If you cheat death in the water, the river loses its power to harm you. Claptrap. Thessa had snapped back. Of course you can drown. Don't you dare take silly risks. She'd taken an unforgivably stupid risk, coming here, bringing Nadia here. And now, it seemed the only question remaining was which would get to her first, the tide or the rat.
Chapter 87 Dana and Pari Sahara's real name was Anya Fahid, Mizen told the rest of the group. The body we found on Lacey's boat was that of Rabia Khan, both from Afghanistan, both smuggled into the country illegally. Markova's adamant, though, that none of the girls are harmed in any way. When the treatment cycle is over, they're placed with people who are genuinely offering jobs and homes. There's a network of Afghan families in London who help out. She thinks the egg business is a small price to pay for a new life. Is she telling the truth? asked Barrett, who just arrived back. I think she might be, said Misen. She seemed genuinely upset, although I can't help feeling she's not telling us everything. She's very vague about when and how these women leave the clinic. Says she doesn't get involved with that side of things. If Kate's is right, then the treatment they're being subjected to, whilst unpleasant, won't actually kill them, said Mark. It doesn't kill them, said Dana. These women are drowning. There's something else going on. Christakos has no need to kill these women, and plenty of reason to keep them alive. He doesn't want to draw attention to himself, nor does he want to run unnecessary risks. I think he's a people trafficker. I think he's exploiting vulnerable young women and defrauding childless couples. And I think he's an all-round sleazebag, but I don't think he's a killer. So who the hell is, said Anderson? The mermaid? The tape was more than half cut through. Pari tried to tear the rest, but it was too strong. On with the pulling, soaring action. Almost there. Pull again. Backwards and forwards, and she was free. She tore the plastic apart until she could pull it up over her head and breathe fresh air again. Darkness. A darkness with stars and the lights from the city, but darkness all the same. A whole day had passed while she'd been tied up, and they'd be coming back. She pushed herself onto her knees and looked round, not too far from the middle of the river. She was moored fifty yards or so off the north bank, on a rubbish barge, as she'd guessed. There were eight large skips on the barge, and she was in one of them. The skip wasn't full, and anyone passing in daylight, even coming quite close, wouldn't have seen her. Pari twisted round until her ankles were touching the metal cleat and started soaring again. It wasn't so easy with her feet, but she had her hands to guide her, and every few seconds she looked up to see if a craft was approaching. Nothing, though. The water was quiet tonight. Keep soaring. You know who she is, don't you? The woman who's killing these girls. Christakos stared back at Dana with his large, dark blue eyes. Hours in custody were starting to take their toll. His face looked strained, and the lines around his eyes seemed to have deepened. Dana leaned forward, resting her arms on the table between them. The woman who swims as though she was born in the water, the one who's been seen in the river from time to time, by watermen who just assume they're overtired or have had one drink too many. The one who gave rise to the legend of the Creek Mermaid. Christakos raised his eyebrows and gave a little start. He was good, just a fraction too slow for the surprise to be convincing. She attacked Constable Flint a couple of nights ago, said Anderson, while Dana was still thinking about her next move. At the same time that we apprehended two men heading towards your East Street premises with a young Afghan woman. She's got a bit of a thing about Lacey. Been hanging round her boat, playing tricks, trying to frighten her. Then the other night, she upturned Constable Flint's canoe and tried to drown her. All this happened in the South Dock Marina, where we found two more bodies. Detective Sergeant, I don't mean to sound flippant, but if young women frolic in the Thames in the small hours, they can expect to find themselves in difficulties. Christakos stifled a yawn. I still don't see what any of this has to do with me. Two young women, whom we can definitely connect to your clinic because your assistant has recognised them, were pulled out of the river this summer, said Anderson. Christakos closed his eyes. Dana decided to throw him a lifeline. I don't believe you intend to harm any of these women. I think in your own way you're doing your best to protect them. But she gets past you somehow. How does she do that? His eyes snapped open again. I look forward to the press conference when you announce to the nation that the killer you're hunting is a mermaid. Weren't you looking for a vampire earlier in the year? They're going to have you working on the X-Files, Detective Inspector. We're not looking for a mermaid. We're looking for a good swimmer. 
Anderson jumped in before Dana could react. We have a man upstairs who's been swimming in the river for 40 years. Constable Flint's been doing it all summer. It's perfectly possible if you stay close to the bank, respect the tides and watch out for traffic. How does your girl do it? Discreet flotation device? One of those big mono fins you see the free divers wearing? Christakos shook his head, as though there were no end to the nonsense he was expected to listen to. He looked tired, a patient man who'd been pushed to the limits of professional courtesy. He'd be convincing in a witness box. I've been speaking to your sister, 